Blackstone Audio presents A Bridge Too Far by Cornelius Ryan. This book is read by Clive Chafer. For Them All On the narrow corridor that would carry the armoured drive, there were five major bridges to take. They had to be seized intact by airborne assault. It was the fifth, the crucial bridge over the Lower Rhine at a place called Arnhem, sixty-four miles behind the German lines, that worried Lieutenant General Frederick Browning, Deputy Commander, First Allied Airborne Army. Pointing to the Arnhem Bridge on the map, he asked, How long will it take the armor to reach us? Field Marshal Montgomery replied briskly, Two days. Still looking at the map, Browning said, We can hold it for four. Then he added, But, sir... I think we might be going a bridge too far. The final conference at Montgomery's headquarters on Operation Market Garden, September the 10th, 1944, as recalled in Major General Roy E. Urquhart's memoirs, Arnhem. Forward. Operation Market Garden, September the 17th through 24th, 1944. Shortly after 10 a.m. on Sunday, September the 17th, 1944, from airfields all over southern England, the greatest armada of troop-carrying aircraft ever assembled for a single operation took to the air. In this, the 263rd week of World War II, the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight David Eisenhower, unleashed Market Garden, one of the most daring and imaginative operations of the war. Surprisingly, Market Garden, a combined airborne and ground offensive, was authored by one of the most cautious of all the Allied commanders, Field Marshal Bernard Law Montgomery. Market, the airborne phase of the operation, was monumental. It involved almost 5,000 fighters, bombers, transports, and more than 2,500 gliders. That Sunday afternoon at exactly 1.30 p.m. in an unprecedented daylight assault, an entire Allied airborne army, complete with vehicles and equipment, began dropping behind the German lines. The target for this bold and historic invasion from the sky, Nazi-occupied Holland. On the ground, poised along the Dutch-Belgian border, were the garden forces, massed tank columns of the British Second Army. At 2.35 p.m., preceded by artillery and led by swarms of rocket-firing fighters, the tanks began a dash up the backbone of Holland along a strategic route the paratroopers were already fighting to capture and hold open. Montgomery's ambitious plan was designed to sprint the troops and tanks through Holland, springboard across the Rhine and into Germany itself. Operation Market Garden, Montgomery reasoned, was the lightning stroke needed to topple the Third Reich and effect the end of the war in 1944. Part 1. The Retreat 1. In the thousand-year-old Dutch village of Driel, people listened intently. Even before dawn, restless sleepers woke and lights came on behind shuttered windows. Initially, there was only a sense of something unaccountable taking place somewhere beyond the immediate physical surroundings. Gradually, vague impressions took form. In the far distance came a muted, continuous mutter. Barely audible but persistent, the sound reached the village in waves. Unable to identify the subtle noise, many listened instinctively for some change in the flow of the nearby Lower Rhine. In Holland, half of which lies below sea level, water is the constant enemy, dikes the major weapon in a never-ending battle that has gone on since before the eleventh century. Driel, sitting in a great bend of the Lower Rhine southwest of Arnhem, capital of Gelderland, has an ever-present reminder of the struggle. A few hundred yards to the north, protecting the village and the region from the restless 400-yard-wide river, a massive dike, topped by a road, rises at places more than twenty feet high. But this morning the river gave no cause for alarm. The Nader Rhine swept peacefully towards the North Sea at its customary speed of two miles per hour. The sounds reverberating off the stone face of the protective dike came from another, far more ruthless enemy. 
As the sky lightened and the sun began to burn off the mist, the commotion grew louder. From roads due east of Driel, the villagers could clearly hear the sound of traffic, traffic that seemed to grow heavier by the minute. Now their uneasiness turned to alarm, for there was no doubt about the identity of the movement. In this fifth year of World War II, and after fifty-one months of Nazi occupation, everyone recognized the rumble of German convoys. Even more alarming was the size of the procession. Some people later recalled that only once before had they heard such a flow of traffic, in May 1940, when the Germans had invaded the Netherlands. At that time, swarming across the Reich frontier ten to fifteen miles from Driel, Hitler's mechanized armies had reached the main highways and spread swiftly throughout the country. Now, over those same roads, convoys seemed once more to be moving endlessly. Strange sounds came from the nearest main road, a two-lane highway connecting Arnhem on the north bank of the Lower Rhine with the eighth-century city of Nijmegen on the broad river Vaal, eleven miles to the south. Against the low background throb of engines, people could plainly identify individual noises which seemed curiously out of place in a military convoy, the scrape of wagon wheels, the whir of countless bicycles, and the slow, unpaced shuffling of feet. What kind of convoy could this be? And more important, where was it heading? At this moment in the war, Holland's future could well depend on the answer to that question. Most people believed the convoys carried heavy reinforcements, either pouring into the country to bolster the German garrison or rushing south to halt the Allied advance. Allied troops had liberated northern France with spectacular speed. Now they were fighting in Belgium, and were said to be close to the capital, Brussels, less than one hundred miles away. Rumors persisted that powerful Allied armored units were driving for the Dutch border, but no one in Driel could tell for sure exactly the direction the convoys were taking. Distance and the diffusion of sound made that impossible, and because of the nightly curfew the villagers were unable to leave their houses to investigate. Plagued by uncertainty, they could only wait. They could not know that shortly before dawn the three young soldiers who constituted Little Driel's entire German garrison had left the village on stolen bicycles and pedalled off into the mist. There was no longer any military authority in the village to enforce the curfew regulations. Unaware, people kept to their homes, but the more curious among them were too impatient to wait and decided to risk using the telephone. In her home at 12 honing Veltzerstraat, next to her family's jam and preserves factory, young Cora Balthusen called friends in Arnhem. She could scarcely believe their eyewitness report. The convoys were not heading south to the Western Front. On this misty morning, September the 4th, 1944, the Germans and their supporters appeared to be fleeing from Holland, traveling in anything that would move. The fighting that everyone had expected, Cora thought, would now pass them by. She was wrong. For the insignificant village of Driel, untouched until now, the war had only begun. 2. Fifty miles south, in towns and villages close to the Belgian border, the Dutch were jubilant. They watched incredulously as the shattered remnants of Hitler's armies in northern France and Belgium streamed past their windows. The collapse seemed infectious. Besides military units, thousands of German civilians and Dutch Nazis were pulling out, and for these fleeing forces all roads seemed to lead to the German border. Because the withdrawal began so slowly, a trickle of staff cars and vehicles crossing the Belgian frontier, few Dutch could tell exactly when it had started. Some believed the retreat began on September the 2nd, others the 3rd. But by the 4th, the movement of the Germans and their followers had assumed the characteristics of a rout, a frenzied exodus that reached its peak on September the 5th, a day later to be known in Dutch history as Dolle Dinsdag, Mad Tuesday. Panic and disorganization seemed to characterize the German flight. Every kind of conveyance was in use. Thronging the roads from the Belgian border north to Arnhem and beyond were trucks, buses, staff cars, half-track vehicles, armored cars, horse-drawn farm carts, and civilian automobiles running on charcoal or wood. 
Everywhere throughout the disorderly convoys were swarms of tired, dusty soldiers on hastily commandeered bicycles. There were even more bizarre forms of transportation. In the town of Valkenswart, a few miles north of the Belgian frontier, people saw heavily laden German troopers laboriously pushing along on children's scooters. Sixty miles away in Arnhem, crowds standing on the Amsterdam Surveig watched as a massive black and silver hearse pulled by two plodding farm horses passed slowly by. Crowded in the casket space in back were a score of disheveled, exhausted Germans. Trudging in these wretched convoys were German soldiers from many units. There were panzer troops, minus tanks, in their black battle suits, Luftwaffe men, presumably all that remained of German air force units that had been shattered in either France or Belgium, Wehrmacht soldiers from a score of divisions, and Waffen SS troops, their skull and crossbones insignia a macabre identification. Looking at these apparently leaderless, dazed troops moving aimlessly along, young Wilhelmina Kopens in St. Udenrode thought that most of them had no idea where they were or even where they were going. Some soldiers, to the bitter amusement of Dutch bystanders, were so disoriented that they asked for directions to the German frontier. In the industrial town of Eindhoven, home of the giant Philips Electrical Works, the population had heard the low sound of artillery fire from Belgium for days. Now, watching the dregs of the beaten German army thronging the roads, people expected Allied troops to arrive within hours. So did the Germans. It appeared to Franz Kortzi, 24-year-old employee in the town's finance department, that these troops had no intention of making a stand. From the nearby airfield came the roar of explosions as engineers blew up runways, ammunition dumps, gasoline storage tanks and hangars, and through a pall of smoke drifting across the town, Kortzi saw squads of troops rapidly working to dismantle heavy anti-aircraft guns on the roofs of the Philips buildings. All through the area, from Eindhoven north to the city of Nijmegen, German engineers were hard at work. In the Zeit Willemswart Canal running below the town of Wegel, Cornelis de Visser, an elementary school teacher, saw a heavily loaded barge blown skyward, shooting out airplane engine parts like a deadly rain of shrapnel. Not far away in the village of Uden, Johannes de Groot, 45-year-old car bodybuilder, was watching the retreat with his family when Germans set fire to a former Dutch barracks barely 300 yards from his home. Minutes later, heavy bombs stored in the building exploded, killing four of de Groot's children, aged 5 to 18. In places such as Eindhoven, where school buildings were set ablaze, fire brigades were prevented from operating and whole blocks were burned down. Still, the sappers, in contrast to the fleeing columns on the roads, gave evidence of following some definite plan. The most frantic and confused among the escapees were the civilians, German, Dutch, Belgian, and French Nazis. They got no sympathy from the Dutch. To farmer Johannes Hulsen at St. Udenrode, they looked scared stiff. And they had reason to be, he thought with satisfaction, for with the Allies snapping at their heels, these traitors knew it was Baltiestag, hatchet day. The frantic flight of Dutch Nazis and German civilians had been triggered by the Reichskommissar in Holland, the notorious 52-year-old Dr. Arthur Zeisinkwart, and by the ambitious and brutal Dutch Nazi party leader Anton Mussert. Nervously watching the fate of the Germans in France and Belgium, Zeisinkwart on September 1 ordered the evacuation of German civilians to the east of Holland, closer to the Reich border. The 50-year-old Mussert followed suit, alerting members of his Dutch Nazi party. Zeisinkwart and Mussert were themselves among the first to leave. They moved from The Hague east to Appeldoorn, 15 miles from Arnhem. Zeisinkwart was terrified. At Appledorn, he took to his underground headquarters, a massive concrete and brick bunker constructed at a cost of more than $250,000. Complete with conference rooms, communications, and personal suites, it still exists. Scratched on the concrete exterior near the entrance are the figures six and a quarter, the nickname for the hated commissioner. The Netherlanders couldn't resist it. In Dutch, Zeisinkvart and six and a quarter sound almost the same, Zesenenkvart.
Musset rushed his family even closer to the Reich, moving them into the frontier region at Twente in the province of Overijssel. At first most of the German and Dutch civilians moved at a leisurely pace. Then a sequence of events produced Bedlam. On September the 3rd the British captured Brussels. The next day Antwerp fell. Now British tanks and troops were only miles from the Dutch border. On the heels of these stunning victories, the aged Queen of the Netherlands, Wilhelmina, told her people in a radio broadcast from London that liberation was at hand. She announced that her son-in-law, His Royal Highness Prince Bernhard, had been named Commander-in-Chief of the Netherlands forces and would also assume leadership of all underground resistance groups. These factions, comprising three distinct organizations ranging politically from the left to the extreme right, would now be grouped together and officially known as Binnenlandse Streitkrachten, Forces of the Interior. The 33-year-old Prince Bernhard, husband of Princess Juliana, heir to the throne, followed the Queen's announcement with one of his own. He asked the underground to have armlets ready, displaying in distinct letters the word orange, but not to use them without my order. He warned them to refrain in the enthusiasm of the moment from premature and independent actions, for these would compromise yourselves and the military operations underway. Next, a special message was broadcast from General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, confirming that freedom was imminent. The hour of liberation the Netherlands have awaited so long is now very near, he promised. And within a few hours these broadcasts were followed by the most optimistic statement of all from the Prime Minister of the Dutch government in exile, Peter S. Herbrandy. He told his listeners, Now that the Allied armies in their irresistible advance have crossed the Netherlands frontier, I want all of you to bid our allies a hearty welcome to our native soil. The Dutch were hysterical with joy, and the Dutch Nazis fled for their lives. Anton Mussert had long boasted that his party had more than 50,000 Nazis. If so, it seemed to the Dutch that they all took to the roads at the same time. In scores of towns and villages all over Holland, Nazi-appointed mayors and officials suddenly bolted, but often not before demanding back pay. The mayor of Eindhoven and some of his officials insisted on their salaries. The town clerk, Gerardus Legius, thought their posture ridiculous, but he didn't even feel badly about paying them off. Watching them scurry out of town, on everything with wheels, he wondered, how far can they get? Where can they go? There was also a run on the banks. When Nicolas van der Wert, 24-year-old bank clerk, got to work in the town of Wageningen on Monday, September 4th, he saw a queue of Dutch Nazis waiting outside the bank. Once the doors were opened, they hurriedly closed accounts and emptied safety deposit boxes. Railway stations were overrun by terrified civilians. Trains leaving for Germany were crammed to capacity. Stepping off a train on its arrival in Arnhem, young Franz Wiesing was engulfed by a sea of people fighting to get aboard. So great was the rush that after the train left, Wiesing saw a mountain of luggage lying abandoned on the platform. In the village of Zetten, west of Nijmegen, student Paul van Veli watched as Dutch Nazis crowding the railroad station waited all day for a Germany-bound train which never arrived. Women and children were crying, and to van Veli, the waiting room looked like a junk store full of tramps. In every town there were similar incidents. Dutch collaborators fled on anything that would move. Municipal architect Willem Tiemans, from his office window near the great Arnhem Bridge, watched as Dutch Nazis scrambled like mad to get onto a barge heading up the Rhine for the Reich. Hour after hour the traffic mounted, and even during darkness it went on. So desperate were the Germans to reach safety that on the nights of September the 3rd and 4th, in total disregard of Allied air attacks, soldiers set up searchlights at some crossroads and many overloaded vehicles crawled by, headlights blazing. German officers seemed to have lost control. Dr. Anton Latover, a general practitioner in Arnhem, saw soldiers throwing away rifles. Some even tried to sell their weapons to the Dutch. Jörp Musselars, a teenager, watched a lieutenant attempt to stop a virtually empty army vehicle, but the driver, ignoring the command, drove on through. Furious, the officer fired his pistol irrationally into the cobblestones. 
Everywhere soldiers tried to desert. In the village of Erda, Adrianus Marinus, an eighteen-year-old clerk, noticed a soldier jumping off a truck. He ran toward a farm and disappeared. Later Marinus learned that the soldier was a Russian prisoner of war who had been conscripted into the Wehrmacht. Two miles from Nijmegen in the village of Lent on the northern bank of the Waal, Dr. Franz Hauchen, while making his round, saw troops begging for civilian clothing, which the villagers refused. In Nijmegen, deserters were not so abject. In many cases, they demanded clothing at gunpoint. The Reverend Wilhelmus Peterser, forty-year-old Carmelite, saw soldiers hurriedly remove uniforms, change to suits, and then set off on foot for the German border. The Germans were totally fed up with the war, recalls Garrett Mamerlink, Arnhem's chief forestry inspector. They were doing their damnedest to evade the military police. With officers losing control, discipline broke down. Unruly gangs of soldiers stole horses, wagons, cars, and bicycles. Some ordered farmers at gunpoint to haul them in their wagons toward Germany. All through the convoys, the Dutch saw trucks, farm wagons, handcarts, even perambulators pushed by fleeing troops, piled high with loot filched from France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. It ranged from statuary and furniture to lingerie. In Nijmegen, soldiers tried to sell sewing machines, rolls of cloth, paintings, typewriters, and one soldier even offered a parrot in a large cage. Among the retreating Germans, there was no shortage of alcohol. Barely five miles from the German border in the town of Grusbeck, Father Hermann Hook watched horse-drawn carts loaded down with large quantities of wines and liquors. In Arnhem, the Reverend Reinhold Diker spotted boisterous Wehrmacht troops on a truck drinking from a huge vat of wine which they had apparently brought all the way from France. Sixteen-year-old Agatha Schulter, daughter of the chief pharmacist of Arnhem's municipal hospital, was convinced that most of the soldiers she saw were drunk. They were throwing handfuls of French and Belgian coins to the youngsters and trying to sell bottles of wine, champagne, and cognac to the adults. Her mother, Hendrina Schulter, vividly recalls seeing a German truck carrying another kind of booty. It was a large double bed, and in the bed was a woman. Scenes were witnessed which nobody would ever have deemed possible in the German army, writes Walter Görlitz, the German historian, in his History of the German General Staff. Naval troops marched northward without weapons, selling their spare uniforms. They told people that the war was over and they were going home. Lorries loaded with officers, their mistresses, and large quantities of champagne and brandy contrived to get back as far as the Rhineland, and it was necessary to set up special courts martial to deal with such cases. Besides the columns straggling up from the south, heavy German and civilian traffic was coming in from western Holland and the coast. It flooded through Arnhem and headed east for Germany. In the prosperous Arnhem suburb of Oosterbeek, Jan Voskeil, a 38-year-old chemical engineer, was hiding out at the home of his father-in-law. Learning that he was on a list of Dutch hostages to be arrested by the Germans, he had fled from his home in the town of Geldermausen, twenty miles away, bringing his wife, Bertha, and their nine-year-old son. He had arrived in Oosterbeek just in time to see the evacuation. Jan's father-in-law told him not to worry any more about the Germans. You won't have to dive now. Looking down the main street of Osterbeek, Voskyl saw utter confusion. There were dozens of German-filled trucks, nose to tail, all dangerously overloaded. He saw soldiers on bicycles pedaling furiously with suitcases and grips looped over their handlebars. Voskyl was sure that the war would be over in a matter of days. In Arnhem itself, Jan Meinhardt, sexton of the Grote Kerk, the massive 15th-century church of St. Eusebius with a famed 305-foot-high tower, saw the Moffen, a Dutch nickname for the Germans equivalent to the English Jerry, filing through the town four abreast in the direction of Germany. Some looked old and sick. In the nearby village of Ada, an aged German begged young Rudolf van der Aar to notify his family in Germany that they had met. I have a bad heart, he added, and probably won't live much longer. Lucianus Vrumen, a teenager in Arnhem, noticed the Germans were exhausted and had no fighting spirit or pride left. He saw officers trying with little or no success to restore order among the disorganized soldiers. They did not even react to the Dutch, who were yelling, Go home! The British and Americans will be here in a few hours! 
Watching the Germans moving east from Arnhem, Dr. Peter de Graaf, 44-year-old surgeon, was sure he was seeing the end, the apparent collapse of the German army. And Suze van Zweden, high school mathematics teacher, had a special reason to remember this day. Her husband Johann, a respected and well-known sculptor, had been in Dachau concentration camp since 1942 for hiding Dutch Jews. Now he might soon be freed, for obviously the war was nearly over. Sousa was determined to witness this historic moment, the departure of the Germans and the arrival of the Allied liberators. Her son Robert was too young to realize what was happening, but she decided to take her daughter Sonia, aged nine, into town. As she dressed Sonia, Sousa said, This is something you have to see. I want you to try and remember it all your life. Everywhere the Dutch rejoiced. Dutch flags made their appearance. Enterprising merchants sold orange buttons and large stocks of ribbon to the eager crowds. In the village of Renkum there was a run on the local drapery shop, where manager Johannes Snook sold orange ribbon as fast as he could cut it. To his amazement, villagers fashioned bows then and there and proudly pinned them on. Johannes, who was a member of the underground, thought this was going a bit too far. To protect the villagers from their own excesses, he stopped selling the ribbon. His sister Maria, caught up in the excitement, noted happily in her diary that there was a mood in the streets almost as though it was Koniginendach, the Queen's birthday. People sang the Wilhelmus, the Dutch national anthem, and Oranje Boven, orange above all. Cloaks flying, sisters Antonia Stransky and Christina van Dyck from St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Arnhem cycled down to the main square, the Velper Plain, where they joined crowds on the terraces of cafes who were sipping coffee and eating potato pancakes as the Germans and Dutch Nazis streamed by. At St. Canisius Hospital in Nijmegen, Sister M. Docite Simons saw nurses dance with joy in the convent corridors. People brought out long hidden radios, and while watching the retreat flood by their windows, listened openly for the first time in long months to the special Dutch service, Radio Orange, from London's BBC. So excited by the broadcasts was fruit grower Johannes Huchs in St. Udenrode that he failed to spot a group of Germans back of his house stealing the family bicycles. In scores of places, schools closed and work came to a halt. Employees at the cigar factories in Valkenswart promptly left their machines and crowded into the streets. Streetcars stopped running in The Hague, the seat of government. In the capital Amsterdam, the atmosphere was tense and unreal. Offices closed and trading ceased on the stock exchange. Military units suddenly disappeared from the main thoroughfares and the central station was mobbed by Germans and Dutch Nazis. On the outskirts of Amsterdam, Rotterdam and The Hague, crowds carrying flags and flowers stood along main roads leading into the cities, hoping to be the first to see British tanks coming from the south. Rumours grew with every hour. Many in Amsterdam believed the British troops had already freed The Hague, near the coast about thirty miles to the southwest. In The Hague, people thought the great port of Rotterdam, fifteen miles away, had been liberated. Rail travellers got a different story every time their trains stopped. One of them, Henry Peinenburg, a 25-year-old resistance leader travelling from The Hague to his home in Nijmegen, a distance of less than 80 miles, heard at the beginning of his journey that the British had entered the ancient border city of Maastricht. In Utrecht he was told they had reached Roermond. Then in Arnhem he was assured that the British had taken Venlo, a few miles from the German border. When I finally got home, he recalls, I expected to see the Allies in the streets, but all I saw were the retreating Germans. Peinenburg felt confused and uneasy. Others shared his concern, especially the underground high command meeting secretly in The Hague. To them, tensely watching the situation, Holland seemed on the threshold of freedom. Allied tanks could easily slice through the country all the way from the Belgian border to the Zuiderzee. The underground was certain that the gateway, through Holland across the Rhine and into Germany, was wide open. The resistance leaders knew the Germans had virtually no fighting forces capable of stopping a determined Allied drive. They were almost scornful of the one weak and undermanned division composed of old men guarding coastal defences. They had been sitting in concrete bunkers since 1940 without firing a shot. 
and of a number of other low-grade troops whose combat capabilities were extremely doubtful, among them Dutch SS, scratch garrison troops, convalescents and the medically unfit, these last grouped into units aptly known as stomach and ear battalions because most of the men suffered from ulcers or were hard of hearing. To the Dutch the Allied move seemed obvious, invasion imminent, but its success depended on the speed of British forces driving from the south, and about this the underground high command was puzzled. They were unable to determine the precise extent of the Allied advance. Checking on the validity of Prime Minister Herbrandy's statement that Allied troops had already crossed the frontier was no simple matter. Holland was small, only about two-thirds the size of Ireland, but it had a dense population of more than nine million, and as a result the Germans had difficulty controlling subversive activity. There were underground cells in every town and village. Still, transmitting information was hazardous. The principal and most dangerous method was the telephone. In an emergency, using complicated circuitry, secret lines, and coded information, resistance leaders could call all over the country. Thus, on this occasion, underground officials knew within minutes that Herr Brandy's announcement was premature. British troops had not crossed the border. Other Radio Orange broadcasts further compounded the confusion. Twice in a little more than twelve hours, at 11.45 p.m. on September the 4th and again on the morning of September 5th, the Dutch service of the BBC announced that the fortress city of Breda, seven miles from the Dutch-Belgian border, had been liberated. The news spread rapidly. Illegal, secretly printed newspapers promptly prepared liberation editions featuring the Fall of Breda. But the Arnhem Regional Resistance Chief, 38-year-old Peter Kreif, whose group was one of the nation's most highly skilled and disciplined, seriously doubted the Radio Orange Bulletin. He had his communications expert Johannes Steinfort, a young telephone company instrument maker, check the report. Quickly tying into a secret circuit connecting him with the underground in Breda, Steinfort became one of the first to learn the bitter truth. The city was still in German hands. No one had seen Allied troops, either American or British. Because of the spate of rumors, many resistance groups hurriedly met to discuss what should be done. Although Prince Bernhard and Schaeff, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, had cautioned against a general uprising, some underground members had run out of patience. The time had come, they believed, to directly confront the enemy and thus aid the advancing Allies. It was obvious that the Germans feared a general revolt. In the retreating columns, the underground noted sentries were now sitting on the fenders of vehicles with rifles and submachine guns at the ready. Undeterred, many resistance men were eager to fight. In the village of Ada, a few miles northwest of Osterbeek, 25-year-old Menno Tony de Noy tried to persuade the leader of his group, Bill Wilderboer, to attack. It had long been planned, Tony argued, that the group should take over Ada in the event of an Allied invasion. The barracks at Ada, which had been used to train German marines, were now practically empty. De Nui wanted to occupy the buildings. The older Wilderboer, a former sergeant major in the Dutch army, disagreed. I don't trust this situation, he told them. The time is not yet ripe. We must wait. Not all resistance movements were held in check. In Rotterdam, underground members occupied the offices of the water supply company. Just over the Dutch-Belgian border in the village of Axel, the town hall with its ancient ramparts was seized and hundreds of German soldiers surrendered to the civilian fighters. In many towns, Dutch Nazi officials were captured as they tried to bolt. West of Arnhem, in the village of Wolfhäuser, noted principally for its hospital for the mentally ill, the district police commissioner was seized in his car. He was locked up temporarily in the nearest available quarters, the asylum, for delivery to the British when they arrived. These were the exceptions. In general, underground units remained calm. Yet everywhere they took advantage of the confusion to prepare for the arrival of Allied forces. In Arnhem, Charles Laboucher, 42, descendant of an old French family and active in an intelligence unit, was much too busy to bother about rumors. He sat hour after hour by the windows of an office in the neighborhood of the Arnhem Bridge, and with a number of assistants watched German units heading east and northeast along the Zevenaar and Zutphen roads toward Germany. It was Laboucher's job to estimate the number of troops, and where possible to identify the units. 
The vital information he noted down was sent to Amsterdam by courier, and from there via a secret network to London. In suburban Oosterbeek, young Jan Eichelhoff, threading his way unobtrusively through the crowds, cycled all over the area, delivering forged food ration cards to Dutchmen hiding out from the Germans. And the leader of one group in Arnhem, 57-year-old Johannes Pensale, called The Old One, reacted in the kind of wily manner that had made him a legend among his men. He decided the moment had come to move his arsenal of weapons. Openly, with German troops all about, he and a few hand-picked assistants calmly drove up in a baker's van to the municipal hospital where the weapons were hidden. Quickly wrapping the arms in brown paper, they transported the entire cash to Pensale's home, whose basement windows conveniently overlooked the main square. Pensale and his co-leader, Tone van Dahlen, thought it was a perfect position from which to open fire on the Germans when the time came. They were determined to live up to the name of their militant subdivision, Landelike Knockpluchen, Strong Arm Boys. Everywhere, men and women of the vast underground army poised for battle, and in southern towns and villages, people who believed that parts of Holland were already free ran out of their homes to welcome the liberators. There was a kind of madness in the air, thought Carmelite father Tiburtius Nordemer, as he observed the joyful crowds in the village of Os, southeast of Nijmegen. He saw people slapping one another on the back in a congratulatory mood. Comparing the demoralized Germans on the roads with the jubilant Dutch spectators, he noted, Wild fear on the one hand, and crazy unlimited joy on the other. Nobody, the stolid Dutch priest recalled, acted normally. Many grew more anxious as time passed. In the drugstore on the main street of Oosterbeek, Carol de Witt was worried. He told his wife and chief pharmacist Johanna that he couldn't understand why Allied planes had not attacked the German traffic. Franz Schulter, a retired Dutch major, thought the general enthusiasm was premature. Although his brother and sister-in-law were overjoyed at what appeared to be a German debacle, Schulter was not convinced. Things may get worse, he warned. The Germans are far from beaten. If the Allies try to cross the Rhine, believe me, we may see a major battle. 3. Hitler's crucial measures were already underway. On September the 4th at the Führer's headquarters deep in the forest of Görlitz, Rustenburg, East Prussia, 69-year-old Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt prepared to leave for the Western Front. He had not expected a new command. Called abruptly out of enforced retirement, von Rundstedt had been ordered to Rastenburg four days before. On July 2nd, two months earlier, Hitler had fired him as Commander-in-Chief West, or as it was known in German military terms, OB West, Oberbefehlshaber West, while von Rundstedt, who had never lost a battle, was trying to cope with the aftermath of Germany's greatest crisis of the war, the Allied invasion of Normandy. The Führer and Germany's most distinguished soldier had never agreed on how best to meet that threat. Before the invasion, appealing for reinforcements, von Rundstedt had bluntly informed Hitler's headquarters, OKW, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, Armed Forces High Command, that the Western Allies, superior in men, equipment, and planes, could land anywhere they want to. Not so, Hitler declared. The Atlantic Wall, the partly completed coastal fortifications which Hitler boasted ran almost 3,000 miles from Kirkenes on the Norwegian-Finnish frontier to the Pyrenees on the Franco-Spanish border, would make this front impregnable against any enemy. Von Rundstedt knew only too well that the fortifications were more propaganda than fact. He summed up the Atlantic Wall in one word, humbug. The legendary Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, renowned for his victories in the North African deserts in the first years of the war, and sent by Hitler to command Army Group B under von Rundstedt, was equally appalled by the Führer's confidence. To Rommel the coastal defences were a figment of Hitler's Vulcan Kuckucksheim, Cloud Cuckoo Land. The aristocratic, tradition-bound von Rundstedt and the younger, ambitious Rommel found themselves probably for the first time in agreement. On another point, however, they clashed. With the crushing defeat of his Africa Corps by Britain's Montgomery at El Alamein in 1942 always in his mind, and well aware of what the Allied invasion would be like, Rommel believed that the invaders must be stopped on the beaches. 
Von Rundstedt icily disagreed with his junior, whom he sarcastically referred to as the Marshal Booby, Marshal Laddie. Allied troops should be wiped out after they landed, he contended. Hitler backed Rommel. On D-Day, despite Rommel's brilliant improvisations, Allied troops breached the impregnable wall within hours. In the terrible days that followed, overwhelmed by the Allies who enjoyed almost total air supremacy over the Normandy battlefield, and shackled by Hitler's no-withdrawal orders, every man shall fight and fall where he stands, von Rundstedt's straining lines cracked everywhere. Desperately he plugged the gaps, but hard as his men fought and counterattacked, the outcome was never seriously in doubt. Von Rundstedt could neither drive the invaders into the sea, nor annihilate them. The words were Hitler's. On the night of July the 1st, at the height of the Normandy battle, Hitler's chief of staff, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, called von Rundstedt and plaintively asked, What shall we do? Characteristically blunt, von Rundstedt snapped, End the war, you fools! What else can you do? Hitler's comment on hearing the remark was mild. The old man has lost his nerve and can't master the situation any longer. He'll have to go. Twenty-four hours later, in a polite handwritten note, Hitler informed von Rundstedt that, in consideration of your health and of the increased exertions to be expected in the near future, he was relieved of command. Von Rundstedt, the senior and most dependable field marshal in the Wehrmacht, was incredulous. For the five years of war his military genius had served the Third Reich well. In 1939, when Hitler cold-bloodedly attacked Poland, thereby igniting the conflict that eventually engulfed the world, von Rundstedt had clearly demonstrated the German formula for conquest, blitzkrieg, lightning war, when his panzer spearheads reached the outskirts of Warsaw in less than a week. One year later, when Hitler turned west and with devastating speed overwhelmed most of Western Europe, von Rundstedt was in charge of an entire panzer army. And in 1941 he was in the forefront again when Hitler attacked Russia. Now, outraged at the jeopardy to his career and reputation, von Rundstedt told his chief of staff, Major General Gunther Blumentritt, that he had been dismissed in disgrace by an amateur strategist. That bohemian corporal, he fumed, had used my age and ill health as an excuse to relieve me in order to have a scapegoat. Given a free hand, von Rundstedt had planned a slow withdrawal to the German frontier, during which, as he outlined his plans to Blumentritt, he would have exacted a terrible price for every foot of ground given up. But, as he had said to his staff many times, because of the constant tutelage from above— about the only authority he had as O.B. West was to change the guard in front of the gate. Von Rundstedt was hurt by the implication in Hitler's letter that he had requested relief, the late General Blumentritt told me in an interview. Some of us at headquarters actually thought he had, but this was not so. Von Rundstedt denied that he had ever asked to be relieved, or that he had ever thought of doing so. He was extremely angry— so angry, in fact, that he swore he would never again take a command under Hitler. I knew he did not mean it, for to von Rundstedt, military obedience was unconditional and absolute. From the moment of his recall and his arrival at the end of August at the Rastenburg Wolfschanze, Wolf's Lair, as it was named by Hitler, von Rundstedt, at the Führer's invitation, attended the daily briefing conference. Hitler, according to the Deputy Chief of Operations, General Walter Wallemont, greeted his senior field marshal warmly, treating him with unwanted diffidence and respect. Wallemont also noted that throughout the long sessions von Rundstedt simply sat motionless and monosyllabic. The precise practical field marshal had nothing to say. He was appalled by the situation. The briefings clearly showed that in the east the Red Army now held a front more than 1,400 miles long, from Finland in the north to the Vistula in Poland, and from there to the Carpathian Mountains in Romania and Yugoslavia. In fact, Russian armor had reached the borders of East Prussia barely a hundred miles from the Führer's headquarters. In the west, von Rundstedt saw that his worst fears had been realized. Division after division was now destroyed, the entire German line thrown helplessly back. 
Rearguard units, although surrounded and cut off, still clung to vital ports such as Dunkirk, Calais, Boulogne, Le Havre, Brest, Lorient, and Saint-Nazaire, forcing the Allies to continue bringing supplies in from the distant invasion beaches. But now, with the sudden stunning capture of Antwerp, one of Europe's greatest deep seaports, the Allies might well have solved their supply problem. Von Rundstedt noted, too, that the tactic of Blitzkrieg, perfected by himself and others, was being borrowed with devastating effect by Eisenhower's armies. And Field Marshal Walter Model, the 54-year-old new commander-in-chief West, he took over on August 17th, was clearly unable to bring order out of the chaos. His front had been ripped apart, slashed in the north by tanks of the British Second Army and the U.S. First Army driving through Belgium toward Holland, and south of the Ardennes, armoured columns of the U.S. Third Army under General George S. Patton were heading for Metz and the Saar. To von Rundstedt the situation was no longer merely ominous, it was cataclysmic. He had time to dwell on the inevitability of the end. Almost four days elapsed before Hitler allowed von Rundstedt a private audience. During his wait, the field marshal stayed in the former country inn reserved for senior officers in the center of the vast headquarters, a barbed wire enclosed enclave of wooden huts and concrete bunkers built over a catacomb of underground installations. Von Rundstedt vented his impatience at the delay on Keitel, the chief of staff. Why have I been sent for? he demanded. What sort of game is going on? Keitel was unable to tell him. Hitler had given Keitel no particular reason, short of an innocuous mention of the field marshal's health. Hitler seemed to have convinced himself of his own manufactured version for von Rundstedt's dismissal on health grounds back in July. To Keitel, Hitler had merely said, I want to see if the old man's health has improved. Twice Keitel reminded the Führer that the field marshal was waiting. Finally, on the afternoon of September the 4th, von Rundstedt was summoned to Hitler's presence, and, uncharacteristically, the Führer came to the point immediately. I would like to entrust you once more with the Western Front. Stiffly erect, both hands on his gold baton, von Rundstedt merely nodded. Despite his knowledge and experience, his distaste for Hitler and the Nazis, von Rundstedt, in whom the Prussian military tradition of devotion to service was ingrained, did not decline the appointment. As he was later to recall, it would have been useless to protest anyway. According to Walter Gerlitz, editor of the Memoirs of Field Marshal Keitel, chapter 10, page 347, von Rundstedt said to Hitler, My Führer, whatever you may command, I will do my duty to my last breath. My version of von Rundstedt's reaction is based on the recollections of his former chief of staff, Major General Blumentritt. I said nothing, von Rundstedt told him. If I'd opened my mouth, Hitler would have talked at me for three hours. Almost cursorily, Hitler outlined von Rundstedt's task. Once more, Hitler was improvising. Before D-Day, he had insisted that the Atlantic Wall was invulnerable. Now, to von Rundstedt's dismay, the Führer stressed the impregnability of the Westwall, the long-neglected, unmanned, but still formidable frontier fortifications better known to the Allies as the Siegfried Line. Von Rundstedt, Hitler ordered, was not only to stop the Allies as far west as possible, but to counter-attack, for, as the Führer saw it, the most dangerous Allied threats were no more than armoured spearheads. Clearly, however, Hitler was shaken by the capture of Antwerp. Its vital port was to be denied the Allies at all costs. Thus, since the other ports were still in German hands, Hitler said, he fully expected the Allied drive to come to a halt because of overextended supply lines. He was confident that the Western Front could be stabilized, and with the coming of winter, the initiative regained. Hitler assured von Rundstedt that he was not unduly worried about the situation in the West. It was a variation of a monologue von Rundstedt had heard many times in the past. The Westwall to Hitler had now become an idee fixe, and von Rundstedt once again was being ordered not to give an inch and to hold under all conditions. By ordering von Rundstedt to replace Field Marshal Model, Hitler was making his third change of command of OB West within two months, from von Rundstedt to Field Marshal Gunther von Kluger to Model, and now once again to von Rundstedt. Model, in the job just 18 days, would now command only Army Group B under von Rundstedt, Hitler said. 
Von Rundstedt had long regarded Modell with less than enthusiasm. Modell, he felt, had not earned his promotion the hard way. He had been elevated to the rank of field marshal too quickly by Hitler. Von Rundstedt thought him better suited to the job of a good regimental sergeant major. Still, the field marshal felt that Modell's position made little difference now. The situation was all but hopeless, defeat inevitable. On the afternoon of September the 4th, as he set out for his headquarters near Koblenz, von Rundstedt saw nothing to stop the Allies from invading Germany, crossing the Rhine and ending the war in a matter of weeks. On this same day in Wannsee, Berlin, Colonel General Kurt Student, 54-year-old founder of Germany's airborne forces, emerged from the backwater to which he had been relegated for three long years. For him the war had begun with great promise. His paratroops, Student felt, had been chiefly responsible for the capture of Holland in 1940, when some 4,000 of them dropped on the bridges of Rotterdam, Dordrecht, and Moordijk, holding the vital spans open for the main German invasion force. Student's losses had been incredibly low, only 180 men, but the situation was different in the 1941 airborne assault of Crete. There losses were so high, more than a third of the 22,000-man force, that Hitler forbade all future airborne operations. The day of parachute troops is over, the Führer said, and the future had dimmed for Student. Ever since, the ambitious officer had been tied to a desk job as commander of an airborne training establishment, while his elite troopers were used strictly as infantry. With shattering abruptness, at precisely 3 p.m. on this critical September 4th, Student emerged into the mainstream once again. In a brief telephone call, Colonel General Alfred Jodl, Hitler's operations chief, ordered him to immediately organize an army, which the Führer had designated as the First Parachute Army. As the astounded student listened, it occurred to him that it was a rather high-sounding title for a force that didn't exist. Student's troopers were scattered all over Germany, and apart from a few seasoned, fully equipped units, they were green recruits armed only with training weapons. His force of about 10,000 had almost no transportation, armor, or artillery. Student didn't even have a chief of staff. Nevertheless, Student's men, Jodl explained, were urgently needed in the West. They were to close a gigantic hole between Antwerp and the area of Liège-Maastricht by holding a line along the Albert Canal. With all possible speed, Student was ordered to rush his forces to Holland and Belgium. Weapons and equipment would be issued at the railheads of destination. Besides his paratroopers, two divisions had been earmarked for his new army. One of them, the 719th, students soon learned, was made up of old men stationed along the Dutch coast who had not as yet fired a single shot. His second division, the 176th, was even worse. It consisted of semi-invalids and convalescents, who for convenience had been grouped together in separate battalions according to their various ailments. They even had special diet kitchens for those suffering from stomach trouble. Besides these units, he would get a grab bag of other forces scattered in Holland and Belgium, Luftwaffe troops, sailors, and anti-aircraft crews, and twenty-five tanks. To Student, the expert in paratroop warfare and super-trained airborne shock troops, his makeshift army was a grotesque improvisation on a grand scale. Still, he was back in the war again. All through the afternoon, by telephone and teletype, Student mustered and moved his men out. It would take at least four days for his entire force to reach the front, he estimated, but his toughest and best troops, rushed in special trains to Holland in what Student called a blitz move, would be in position on the Albert Canal as part of Modell's Army Group B within twenty-four hours. Jodl's call and the information he himself had since gathered alarmed Student. It seemed apparent that his most seasoned group, the 6th Parachute Regiment plus one other battalion, together totaling about 3,000 men, probably constituted the only combat-ready reserve in the whole of Germany. He found the situation ominous. Frantically, Field Marshal Walter Model, Commander-in-Chief West, tried to plug the yawning gap east of Antwerp and halt the disorderly retreat from Belgium into Holland. 
As yet, no news of von Rundstedt's appointment as his successor had reached him. His forces were so entangled, so disorganized, that Model had all but lost control. He no longer had contact with the second half of his command, Army Group G in the south. Had General Johannes Blaskowitz, its commander, successfully withdrawn from France? Model wasn't sure. To the harassed field marshal, the predicament of Army Group G was secondary. The crisis was clearly in the north. With dispatch and ferocity, Army Group B had been split in two by armoured columns of the British and Americans. Of the two armies composing Army Group B, the 15th was bottled up, its back to the North Sea, roughly between Calais and a point northwest of Antwerp. The 7th Army had been almost destroyed and thrown back towards Maastricht and Aachen. Between the two armies lay a 75-mile gap, and the British had driven through it straight to Antwerp. Plunging along the same route were Modal's own demoralized retreating forces. In a desperate effort to halt their flight, Modal issued an emotional plea to his troops. With the enemy's advance and the withdrawal of our front, several hundred thousand soldiers are falling back, army, air force, and armored units, troops which must reform as planned and hold in new strong points or lines. In this stream are the remnants of broken units, which, for the moment, have no set objectives, and are not even in a position to receive clear orders. Whenever orderly columns turn off the road to reorganize, streams of disorganized elements push on. With their wagons move whispers, rumors, haste, endless disorder, and vicious self-interest. This atmosphere is being brought back to the rear areas, infecting units still intact, and in this moment of extreme tension must be prevented by the strongest means. I appeal to your honor as soldiers. We have lost a battle, but I assure you of this, we will win this war. I cannot tell you more at the present, although I know that questions are burning on your lips. Whatever has happened, never lose your faith in the future of Germany. At the same time you must be aware of the gravity of the situation. This moment will and should separate men from weaklings. Now every soldier has the same responsibility. When his commander falls, he must be ready to step into his shoes and carry on. There followed a long series of instructions in which Modal categorically demanded that retreating troops should immediately report to the nearest command point, instill in others confidence, self-reliance, self-control, and optimism, and repudiate stupid gossip, rumors, and irresponsible reports. The enemy, he said, was not everywhere at once, and indeed, if all the tanks reported by rumor-mongers were counted, there would have to be a hundred thousand of them. He begged his men not to give up important positions or demolish equipment, weapons, or installations before it is necessary. The astonishing document wound up by stressing that everything depended on gaining time which the Führer needs to put new weapons and new troops into operation. Virtually without communications, depending for the most part on radio, Modal could only hope that his order of the day reached all his troops. In the confusion he was not even sure of the latest position of his disorganized and shattered units, nor did he know precisely how far Allied tanks and troops had advanced, and where was the Schwerpunkt, main thrust of the Allied drive, with the British and Americans in the north heading for the Siegfried Line and thence across the Rhine and into the Ruhr. Was it with Patton's massive U.S. Third Army driving for the Saar, the Siegfried Line, and over the Rhine into Frankfurt? Modell's dilemma was the outgrowth of a situation that had occurred nearly two months earlier, at the time of von Rundstedt's dismissal and Hitler's swift appointment of von Kluger as the old field marshal's successor. On sick leave for months from his command in Russia, von Kluger happened to be making a courtesy call on the Führer at the precise moment when Hitler decided to dismiss von Rundstedt. With no preamble, and possibly because von Kluger happened to be the only senior officer in sight, Hitler had named the astonished von Kluger Commander-in-Chief West. Von Kluger, a veteran front commander, took over on July 4th. He was to last 44 days. Exactly as predicted by von Rundstedt, the Allied breakout occurred. The whole Western Front has been ripped open, von Kluger informed Hitler. Overwhelmed by the Allied tide pouring across France, von Kluger, like von Rundstedt before him, found his hands tied by Hitler's insistent no-withdrawal orders. 
the German armies in France were encircled and all but destroyed. It was during this period that another convulsion racked the Third Reich, an abortive assassination attempt on Hitler's life. During one of the endless conferences at the Führer's headquarters, a time bomb in a briefcase, placed by Colonel Klaus Graf von Stauffenberg beneath a table close to Hitler, exploded, killing and wounding many in the room. The Führer escaped with minor injuries. Although only a small elite group of officers were involved in the plot, Hitler's revenge was barbaric. Anyone connected with the plotters or with their families was arrested, and many individuals, innocent or not, were summarily executed. Hitler took advantage of his most senior officer von Rundstedt once again by making him president of the court of honor that passed judgment on the officers suspected. Von Rundstedt quietly acceded to the Führer's request. If I had not, he later explained, I too might have been considered a traitor. Von Rundstedt's explanation has never satisfied many of his brother generals, who privately denounced him for bending to Hitler's request. Some five thousand people lost their lives. Von Kluger had been indirectly implicated, and Hitler also suspected him of trying to negotiate a surrender with the enemy. Von Kluger was replaced by Model and ordered to report immediately to the Führer. Before leaving his headquarters, the despairing von Kluger wrote a letter to Hitler. Then, en route to Germany, he took poison. "'When you receive these lines, I shall be no more,' he wrote to the Führer. "'I did everything within my power to be equal to the situation. Both Rommel and I, and probably all the other commanders here in the West, with experience of battle against the Anglo-Americans, with their preponderance of material, foresaw the present developments. We were not listened to.' Our appreciations were not dictated by pessimism, but from sober knowledge of the facts. I do not know whether Field Marshal Modell, who has been proved in every sphere, will master the situation. From my heart, I hope so. Should it not be so, however, and your new weapons not succeed, then, my Führer, make up your mind to end the war. It is time to put an end to this frightfulness. I have always admired your greatness and your iron will. Show yourself now also great enough to put an end to this hopeless struggle. Hitler had no intention of conceding victory to the Allies, even though the Third Reich that he had boasted would last a millennium was undermined and tottering. On every front he was attempting to stave off defeat, yet each move the Führer made seemed more desperate than the last. Modell's appointment as O.B. West had not helped. Unlike von Rundstedt or briefly von Kluger, Modell did not have the combat genius of Rommel as support. After Rommel was badly wounded by a strafing Allied plane on July 17th, no one had been sent to replace him. Rommel, who was also suspected by Hitler of being involved in the assassination attempt, died three months later. While convalescing at his home, Hitler gave him a choice— stand trial for treason or commit suicide. On October 14th, Rommel swallowed cyanide, and Hitler announced that the Reich's most popular field marshal had died of wounds sustained on the battlefield. Model did not at first appear to feel the need. Confident that he could right the situation, he took on Rommel's old command as well, becoming not only O.B. West but also commander of Army Group B. Despite Modell's expertise, the situation was too grave for any one commander. At this time, Army Group B was battling for survival along a line roughly between the Belgian coast and the Franco-Luxembourg border. From there, south to Switzerland, the remainder of Modell's army, Army Group G under General Blaskowitz, had already been written off. Following the second Allied invasion on August 15th by French and American forces in the Marseille area, Blaskowitz's group had hurriedly departed southern France. Under continuous pressure, they were now falling back in disarray to the German border. Along Modell's disintegrating northern front, where Allied armor had torn the 75-mile-wide gap in the line, the route from Belgium into Holland and from there across Germany's vulnerable northwest frontier lay open and undefended. Allied forces driving into Holland could outflank the Siegfried Line where the massive belt of fortifications extending along Germany's frontiers from Switzerland terminated at Klever on the Dutch-German border. By turning this northern tip of Hitler's Westwall and crossing the Rhine, the Allies could swing into the Ruhr, the industrial heart of the Reich. 
That maneuver might well bring about the total collapse of Germany. Twice in seventy-two hours, Model appealed desperately to Hitler for reinforcements. The situation of his forces in the undefended gap was chaotic. Order had to be restored and the breach closed. Model's latest report, which he had sent to Hitler in the early hours of September 4th, warned that the crisis was approaching, and unless he received a minimum of twenty-five fresh divisions and an armored reserve of five or six panzer divisions, the entire front might collapse, thereby opening the gateway into northwest Germany. Model's greatest concern was the British entry into Antwerp. He did not know whether the huge port, the second largest in Europe, was captured intact or destroyed by the German garrison. The city of Antwerp itself, lying far inland, was not the crux. To use the port, the Allies needed to control its seaward approach, an inlet fifty-four miles long and three miles wide at its mouth, running into Holland from the North Sea past Valcheren Island, and looping alongside the South Beveland Peninsula. So long as German guns commanded the Skelder estuary, the port of Antwerp could be denied the Allies. Unfortunately for Model, apart from anti-aircraft batteries and heavy coastal guns on Valcheren Island, he had almost no forces along the northern bank. But on the other side of the Skelder, and almost isolated in the Pas de Calais, was General Gustav von Zangen's 15th Army, a force of more than 80,000 men. Though pocketed, the sea lay behind them to the north and west, and Canadians and British were pressing in from the south and east, they nevertheless controlled most of the southern bank of the estuary. By now, Modell believed, British tanks exploiting the situation would surely be moving along the northern bank and sweeping it clear. Before long, the entire South Beveland Peninsula could be in their hands and sealed off from the Dutch mainland at its narrow base north of the Belgian border, barely eighteen miles from Antwerp. Next, to open the port, the British would turn on the trapped 15th Army and clear the southern bank. Von Zangen's forces had to be extricated. Late in the afternoon of September 4th at Army Group B's headquarters southeast of Liège in the village of La Chaude-Fontaine, Model issued a series of orders. By radio he commanded von Sangen to hold the southern bank of the Skelder and reinforce the lesser ports of Dunkirk, Boulogne and Calais, which Hitler had earlier decreed were to be held with fanatical determination as fortresses. With the remainder of his troops, the hapless von Sangen was to attack northeast into the avalanche of British armor. It was a desperate measure, yet Modell saw no other course. If von Sangen's attack was successful, it might isolate the British in Antwerp and cut off Montgomery's armored spearheads driving north. Even if the attack failed, von Sangen's effort might buy time, slowing up the Allied drive long enough for reserves to arrive and hold a new front along the Albert Canal. Exactly what reinforcements were on the way, Model did not know. As darkness fell, he finally received Hitler's answer to his pleas for new divisions to stabilize the front. It was the terse news of his replacement as Commander-in-Chief West by Field Marshal von Rundstedt. Von Kluger had lasted forty-four days as O.B. West, Model barely eighteen. Normally temperamental and ambitious, Model reacted calmly on this occasion. He was more aware of his shortcomings as an administrator than his critics believed. Twice, Model informed Hitler of his inability to command both O.B. West and Army Group B. We rarely saw him, O.B. West's chief of staff Blumentritt recalled. Model hated paperwork and spent most of his time in the field. Lieutenant General Bodo Zimmerman, O.B. West's operations chief, wrote after the war that though Model was a thoroughly capable soldier, he often demanded too much and that too quickly, hence losing sight of what was practically possible. He had a tendency to dissipate his forces, added Zimmerman, and staff work suffered under his too frequent absences and erratic, inconsistent demands. Now he could concentrate on the job he knew best, being a frontline commander, solely in charge of Army Group B. But among the flurry of frantic orders Modal issued on this last day as O.B. West, one would prove momentous. It concerned the relocation of his two SS Panzer Corps. 
The commander of the corps, fifty-year-old Obergruppenführer, Lieutenant General Wilhelm Bittrich, had been out of touch with Modal for more than seventy-two hours. His forces, fighting almost continuously since Normandy, had been badly mauled. Bittrich's tank losses were staggering, his men short on ammunition and fuel. In addition, because of the breakdown of communications, the few orders he had received by radio were already out of date when Bittrich got them. Uncertain of the enemy's movements and badly in need of direction, Bittrich set out on foot to find Modal. He finally located the field marshal at Army Group B headquarters near Liège. I had not seen him since the Russian front in 1941, Bittrich later recalled. Monocle in his eye, wearing his usual short leather coat, Modal was standing looking at a map and snapping out commands one after the other. There was little time for conversation. Pending official orders which would follow, I was told to move my corps headquarters north into Holland. With all possible speed, Bittrich was directed to supervise the refitting and rehabilitation of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions. The battered units, Modal told him, were to slowly disengage from the battle and immediately head north. Understandably, perhaps, German records of this period are vague and often inexplicable. Commands were issued, never received, resent, countermanded, or changed. Considerable confusion exists about Modal's order. According to Army Group B's war diary, movement orders for the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions were sent on the night of September the 3rd. If so, they were never received. Also, it is recorded that Bittrich received his instructions 48 hours later to supervise the regrouping and rehabilitation of not only the 9th, but the 2nd and 116th Panzer units. Curiously, the 10th is not mentioned. I can find no evidence that either the 2nd or 116th ever reached the Arnhem area. It appears they continued fighting at the front. According to Bittrich's own papers and logs, he received Modal's orders orally on September 4th, and duly directed only the 9th and 10th to proceed north. Both units, according to their commanders, began slowly withdrawing on September the 5th through 6th. The almost unknown Bittrich could hardly foresee the critical role his 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions would play within the next two weeks. The site Modal chose for Bittrich was in a quiet zone, at this point some 75 miles behind the front. By a historic fluke, the area included the city of Arnhem. 4. The headlong retreat of the Germans out of Holland was slowing, although few of the jubilant Dutch realized it as yet. From the Belgian border north to Arnhem, roads were still choked, but there was a difference in the movement. From his post in the provincial building above the Arnhem Bridge, Charles Labouchere saw no let-up in the flood of vehicles, troops, and Nazi sympathizers streaming across the bridge. But a few blocks north of Labouchere's location, Herardus Hispers, a seller of antique books, saw a change taking place. German troops entering Arnhem from the west were not moving on. The compound of the Willems Barracks next to Hispers' home and the streets in the immediate vicinity were filling with horse-drawn vehicles and disheveled soldiers. Hispers noted Luftwaffe battalions, anti-aircraft personnel, Dutch SS and elderly men of the 719th Coastal Division. It was clear to Arnhem's resistance chief, Peter Kreif, that this was no temporary halt. These troops were not heading back into Germany. They were slowly regrouping. Some horse-drawn units of the 719th were starting to move south. Kreif's chief of intelligence for the Arnhem region, 33-year-old Henri Knapp, unobtrusively cycling through the area, spotted the subtle change, too. He was puzzled. He wondered if the optimistic broadcasts from London were false. If so, they were cruel deceptions. Everywhere he saw the Dutch rejoicing. Everyone knew that Montgomery's troops had taken Antwerp. Surely Holland would be liberated within hours. Knapp could see the Germans were reorganizing. While they still had little strength, he knew that if the British did not come soon, that strength would grow. In Nijmegen, eleven miles to the south, German military police were closing off roads leading to the German frontier. Elias Bruckkamp, a wine importer, saw some troops moving north toward Arnhem, but the majority were being funneled back and traffic was being broken up, processed and fanned out. 
as in Arnhem the casual spectator seemed unaware of the difference. Broekkamp observed Dutch civilians laughing and jeering at what they believed to be the Germans' bewildering predicament. In fact, the predicament was growing much less. Nijmegen was turning into a troop staging area, once more in the firm control of German military. Farther south in Eindhoven, barely ten miles from the Belgian border, the retreat had all but stopped. In the straggling convoys moving north, there were now more Nazi civilians than troops. Franz Kortzi, who had seen the Germans dismantling anti-aircraft guns on the roofs of the Philips factories, noted a new development. In a railway siding near the station, he watched a train pulling flat cars into position. On the cars were heavy anti-aircraft guns. Kortzi experienced a feeling of dread. Far more disheartening for observant Dutch was the discovery that reinforcements were coming in from Germany. In Tilburg, Eindhoven, Helmont, and Wert, people saw contingents of fresh troops arrive by train. Unloaded quickly and formed up, they set out for the Dutch-Belgian border. They were not regular Wehrmacht soldiers. They were seasoned, well-equipped, and disciplined, and their distinctive helmets and camouflaged smocks instantly identified them as veteran German paratroopers. 5. By late afternoon of September 5th, Colonel General Kurt Student's first paratroop formations were digging in at points along the north side of Belgium's Albert Canal. Their haste was almost frantic. Student, on his arrival at noon, had discovered that Model's new German line was strictly the 80-foot-wide water barrier itself. Defense positions had not been prepared. There were no strong points, trenches, or fortifications, and to make matters worse for the defenders, Student noted, almost everywhere the southern bank dominated the northern side. Even the bridges over the canal were still standing. Only now were engineers placing demolition charges. In all the confusion, no one apparently had ordered the crossings destroyed. Nevertheless, Student's timetable was well planned. The blitz move of his airborne forces was a spectacular success. Considering that these paratroopers were rushed in from all over Germany, from Güstrow in Mecklenburg to Bitsch in Lothringen, he later recalled, and arms and equipment brought in from still other parts of Germany were waiting for them at the railheads, the speed of the move was remarkable. Student could only admire the astonishing precision of the general staff and the entire German organization. Lieutenant General Karl Zeever's 719th Coastal Division had made good time, too. Student was heartened to see their columns heading for positions north of Antwerp, clattering down the roads to the front, their transports and artillery pulled by heavy draft horses. Despite the confusion, horse-lover Student took the time to note in his diary that these huge animals were Clydesdale, Percheron, Danish, and Frisian types. Contrary to general belief, Hitler's armies, unlike the Allies, were never totally motorized. Even at the pinnacle of German strength, more than 50% of their transport was horse-drawn. Hour by hour, his hastily formed first parachute army was arriving. Also, by extraordinary good fortune, help had come from a most unexpected source. The headlong retreat from Belgium into Holland had been slowed and then virtually stopped by the doggedness and ingenuity of one man, Lieutenant General Kurt Hill. Because his 85th Infantry Division was almost totally destroyed, Hill had been ordered to save whatever remained and move back into Germany. But the strong-willed general, watching the near panic on the roads and prompted by Modell's order of the day, decided to disregard orders. Hill concluded that the only way to avert catastrophe was to organize a line along the Albert Canal. He welded what remained of his 85th Division with the remnants of two others and quickly dispersed these men to strategic points on the northern bank of the canal. Next, he turned his attention to the bridges and set up reception centers at their northern exits. In 24 hours, Hill had succeeded in netting thousands of servicemen from nearly every branch of the German armed forces. It was a crazy quilt mob, including Luftwaffe mechanics, military government personnel, naval coastal units, and soldiers from a dozen different divisions but these stragglers, armed at best with rifles, were already on the canal when Student arrived. Student called Hill's virtuoso performance in halting the near route miraculous. 
With remarkable speed, he had established a defense line of sorts, helping to buy a little time for all of Student's forces to arrive. This would still take several days. Even with the boost from Hill, Student's patchwork first parachute army might total at best 18,000 to 20,000 men, plus some artillery, anti-aircraft guns, and 25 tanks, hardly the equivalent of an American division. And racing toward this scanty force, so thin that Student could not even man the 75-mile Antwerp-Maastricht gap, let alone close it, were the awesome armored forces of the British Second Army and part of the U.S. First Army. Student was outgunned and outnumbered. About all that stood between him and disaster was the Albert Canal itself. At what point along it would the enemy attack? Student's line was vulnerable everywhere, but some areas were more critical than others. He was particularly concerned about the sector north of Antwerp, where the weak 719th Coastal Division was only now taking up position. Was there still time to take advantage of the 80-foot-wide water barrier and turn it into a major defense line that would delay the Allies long enough for additional reinforcements to reach the canal? This was Student's greatest hope. He expected to be attacked at any moment, yet there were still no reports of Allied armor. Student was particularly surprised that there was almost no enemy contact north of Antwerp. He had by now expected that British tanks, after capturing the city, would strike north, cut off the Beverland Peninsula, and smash into Holland. It seemed to Student that the British had slowed down. But why? Four times in eighteen days the vast complex of the German Supreme Headquarters in the West had been forced to move. Bombed, shelled, almost overrun by Allied tanks, OB West had finally come to a halt behind the borders of the Reich. And shortly after 2 p.m. on September 5th, the new commander-in-chief found his headquarters in the little town of Aremberg near Koblenz. Tired and irritable after his long journey, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt dispensed with the usual military courtesies and fanfare that often accompanied a German change of command. Immediately he plunged into a series of staff conferences that were to last long into the evening. Officers not personally acquainted with the field marshal were startled by the speed of his takeover. To older hands it was as though he had never been away. For everyone, the very presence of von Rundstedt brought feelings of relief and renewed confidence. Von Rundstedt's task was formidable, his problems were massive. He must produce as quickly as possible a strategic blueprint for the 400-mile western front running from the North Sea all the way to the Swiss border, a plan which Field Marshal Model had candidly found beyond his capability. With the battered forces at von Rundstedt's disposal, Army Group B in the north and G in the south, he was expected to hold everywhere, and even to counterattack, as Hitler had directed. Simultaneously, to stave off invasion of the Reich, he was to make a reality of Hitler's impregnable Siegfried Line, the long obsolete unfinished concrete fortifications which had lain neglected, unmanned, and stripped of guns since 1940. There was more, but on this afternoon von Rundstedt gave first priority to the immediate problems. They were far worse than even he had anticipated. The picture was bleak. Before his dismissal by Hitler in July, von Rundstedt had command of 62 divisions. Now his operations chief, Lieutenant General Bodo Zimmermann, produced an ominous balance sheet. In the two army groups, he told the field marshal, there were 48 paper divisions, 15 panzer divisions, and four brigades with almost no tanks. So weak in men, equipment, and artillery were these 48 divisions, Zimmerman said, that in his view they constituted a combat power equivalent to only 27 divisions. This force was less than half the strength of the Allies. Von Rundstedt learned that his staff believed Eisenhower had at least 60 divisions, completely motorized and at full strength. This estimate was wrong. Eisenhower had at this moment 49 divisions on the continent. As for German panzer forces, they were virtually non-existent. Along the entire front, against the Allies' estimated strength of more than 2,000 tanks, there were only 100 panzers left. The Luftwaffe had been virtually destroyed. Above the battlefield, the Allies had complete aerial supremacy. 
von Rundstedt's own grim summation was that in troops, most of whom were exhausted and demoralized, he was outnumbered more than two to one, in artillery by two and a half guns to one, in tanks twenty to one, and in planes twenty-five to one. German losses in men and materiel had been staggering. In the ninety-two days since the invasion of Normandy, three hundred thousand German troops had been killed or wounded or were missing. Another two hundred thousand were surrounded, holding last-ditch fortresses such as ports or in the Channel Islands. Some fifty-three German divisions had been destroyed, and strewn across France and Belgium were vast quantities of materiel, including at least seventeen hundred tanks, three thousand five hundred guns, thousands of armored vehicles and horse-drawn or motorized transports, and mountains of equipment and supplies, ranging from small arms to vast ammunition dumps. The casualties included two field marshals and more than twenty generals. Besides, there were grave shortages in gasoline, transportation, and ammunition. Von Rundstedt's new chief of staff, General Siegfried Westphal, was later to recall, "The situation was desperate. A major defeat anywhere along the front, which was so full of gaps that it did not deserve the name, would lead to catastrophe if the enemy were to fully exploit the opportunities." Lieutenant General Blumentritt, fully agreeing with Westphal's view, was even more specific. In his opinion, if the Allies mounted a major thrust resulting in a breakthrough anywhere, collapse would follow. To von Rundstedt's annoyance, General Blumentritt, who had long been his chief of staff and most trusted confidant, was replaced by General Westphal on September the fifth and ordered back to Germany. Von Rundstedt protested the change to no avail. Blumentritt did, however, attend the early conferences in Aremberg and did not leave the headquarters until September eighth. The only capable troops von Rundstedt had were those facing General George S. Patton's U.S. Third Army, driving toward Metz and heading for the industrial region of the Saar. These forces might delay Patton, but they were not strong enough to stop him. Rather than waste precious time, it seemed to Blumentritt that the Allies would strike where the Germans were weakest by attempting a powerful thrust in the north to cross the Rhine and move into the Ruhr. That drive, he believed, might be given priority by the Americans and the British, because, as he later put it, he who holds northern Germany holds Germany. Von Rundstedt had already reached the same conclusion. Seizing the Ruhr was undoubtedly the major Allied objective. The British and Americans in the north were driving in that direction toward the frontier at Aachen. There was little to stop them from penetrating the unmanned, outdated Siegfried Line, crossing Germany's last natural barrier, the vital Rhine, and striking into the Reich's industrial heart. Von Rundstedt's analytical mind had seized on one more fact: Eisenhower's skilled and highly trained airborne forces, used so successfully in the Normandy invasion, had disappeared off German situation maps. They were not being used as infantry. Obviously, these forces had been withdrawn preparatory to another airborne operation. But where and when? It was logical that an airborne drop would coincide with a drive on the Ruhr. In von Rundstedt's view, such an attack might come at either of two key areas: behind the Westphal fortifications or east of the Rhine to seize bridgeheads. In fact, Field Marshal Model several days earlier had expressed the same fear in a message to Hitler, stressing the possibility as an acute threat. Equally, von Rundstedt could not discount the possibility of the entire Allied front moving forward simultaneously toward the Ruhr and the Saar, with airborne troops committed at the same time. The Field Marshal could see no solution to any of these impending threats. Allied opportunities were too many and too varied. His only option was to try to bring order out of chaos and to buy time by outguessing Allied intentions, if he could. Von Rundstedt did not underestimate Eisenhower's intelligence of the German predicament, but he pondered: Was the Allied command really aware how desperate the situation was? The truth was that he was fighting, as he put it to Blumentritt, with run-down old men. And the pillboxes of the Westphal would be absolutely useless against an Allied onslaught. It was madness, he said, to defend these mouse holes for reasons of prestige. Nevertheless, the ghostly Siegfried line must be given substance, its fortifications readied and manned. 
tersely, von Rundstedt told his staff, we must somehow hold for at least six weeks. Studying each aspect of the situation confronting him, diagramming possible Allied moves and weighing each alternative, he noted that the most vigorous attacks were still being made by Patton heading for the Saar. In the north, British and American pressure was noticeably less. Von Rundstedt thought he detected an absence of movement, almost a pause in that area. Turning his attention to Montgomery's front, as Blumentritt was later to remember, von Rundstedt concentrated on the situation at Antwerp. He was intrigued by reports that, for more than thirty-six hours now, the British had mounted no drive north from the city, nor had they cut the South Beverland Peninsula. Obviously, Antwerp's great harbour facilities would solve Allied supply problems, but they could not use the port if both sides of the fifty-four-mile-long estuary leading to it remained in German hands. To the field marshal it seemed clear that the let-up he had noted was real. A definite Allied slowdown had occurred, particularly in Montgomery's area. Throughout his career von Rundstedt had closely studied British military tactics. He had also, to his own misfortune, been able to observe American warfare at first hand. He had found the Americans more imaginative and daring in the use of armour, the British superb with infantry. In each case, however, commanders made the difference. Thus, von Rundstedt considered Patton a far more dangerous opponent than Montgomery. According to Blumentritt, von Rundstedt viewed Field Marshal Montgomery as overly cautious, habit-ridden, and systematic. Now the Field Marshal weighed the significance of Montgomery's tardiness. With the other channel ports still in German hands, von Rundstedt saw Antwerp as essential to Eisenhower's advance. So why had Montgomery not moved for thirty-six hours, and apparently failed to secure the second largest port in Europe? There could be only one reason. Montgomery was not ready to continue the attack. Von Rundstedt was certain that he would not depart from habit. The British would never attack until the meticulous, detail-minded Montgomery was fully prepared and supplied. The answer, therefore, von Rundstedt reasoned, was that the British had overextended themselves. This was not a pause, von Rundstedt told his staff. Montgomery's pursuit, he was convinced, had ground to a halt. Quickly, von Rundstedt turned his attention to Modell's orders of the previous twenty-four hours, because now, if his theory was right, von Rundstedt saw a chance not only to deny the port of Antwerp to the Allies, but equally important to save General von Zangen's trapped 15th Army, a force of more than 80,000 men, men that von Rundstedt desperately needed. From Modell's orders he saw that while von Zangen had been told to hold the southern bank of the Skelder and reinforce the Channel ports, he had also been ordered to attack with the remainder of his troops northeast into the flank of the British Drive, an attack scheduled to take place on the morning of the 6th. Without hesitation, von Rundstedt cancelled that attack. Under the circumstances, he saw no merit to it. Besides, he had a bolder, more imaginative plan. The first part of Modell's orders could stand, because now holding the Channel ports was more important than ever. But instead of attacking northeast, von Sangen was ordered to evacuate his remaining troops by sea, across the waters of the Skelder to the island of Valcheren. Once on the northern bank of the estuary, von Sangen's troops could march eastward along the one road running from Valcheren Island across the South Beverland Peninsula until they reached the Dutch mainland north of Antwerp. Because of Allied air power, ferrying operations across the three-mile mouth of the Skelder between the ports of Breskens and Flushing would have to take place at night. Nevertheless, with luck, a good portion of the 15th Army might be safely withdrawn within two weeks. Von Rundstedt knew that the plan was hazardous, but he saw no other course, for if successful he would have almost an entire German army, battered though it might be, at his disposal. More than that, he would still unbelievably control the vital port of Antwerp, but the success of the operation would depend entirely on von Rundstedt's hunch that Montgomery's drive had indeed come to a halt. Von Rundstedt was sure of it. Further, he was banking on it that Montgomery's slowdown held a far deeper significance. Because of overextended communications and supply lines, he was convinced the Allied breakneck pursuit had reached its limit. At the close of the conference, as Blumentritt was later to recall, von Rundstedt looked at us and suggested the incredible possibility that, for once, Hitler might be right. 
Hitler's and von Rundstedt's estimates of the situation, although only partly correct, were far more accurate than either realized. The precious time von Rundstedt needed to stabilize his front was being provided by the Allies themselves. The truth was that the Germans were losing faster than the Allies could win. 6. Even as von Rundstedt gambled desperately to save the trapped 15th Army, Major General George Philip Roberts, commander of the British 11th Armoured Division, 150 miles away in Antwerp, was jubilantly informing his superiors of a startling development. His men had captured not only the city, but the huge port as well. Together with the Guards' Armoured Division, Roberts' tanks had made an extraordinary dash of more than 250 miles in just five days. The spearhead of Lieutenant General Miles C. Dempsey's Great British Second Army had been ordered by Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, 30 Corps commander, to keep going like mad. Leaving the guards to capture Brussels, Roberts's division bypassed the city, and in the early hours of September 4th, with the courageous help of the Belgian underground, entered Antwerp. Now, some thirty-six hours later, after clearing the deep-sea complex of a stunned and panic-stricken enemy, Roberts reported that his men had captured Antwerp's huge thousand-acre harbour area intact. Warehouses, cranes, bridges, three and a half miles of wharves, quays, locks, dry docks, rolling stock, and, unbelievably, even the all-important electrically controlled sluice gates in full working order had been seized. German plans to demolish the port had failed, explosives had been placed on major bridges and other key installations, but overwhelmed by the spectacular speed of the British and resistance groups, among them Belgian engineers who knew exactly where the demolitions were planted, the disorganized German garrison never had a chance to destroy the vast harbor facilities. The thirty-seven-year-old Roberts had brilliantly executed his orders, Unfortunately, in one of the greatest miscalculations of the European war, no one had directed him to take advantage of the situation, that is, strike north, grab bridgeheads over the Albert Canal in the northern suburbs, and then make a dash for the base of the South Beverland Peninsula only eighteen miles away. By holding its two-mile-wide neck, Roberts could have bottled up German forces on the isthmus, preparatory to clearing the vital northern bank. It was a momentous oversight. The late B. H. Little Hart, the celebrated British historian, in his History of the Second World War, wrote, It was a multiple lapse by four commanders from Montgomery downwards. Charles B. MacDonald, the American historian in The Mighty Endeavor, agrees with Little Hart. He called the failure one of the greatest tactical mistakes of the war. The best and most detailed account on the cost of Antwerp is undoubtedly R. W. Thompson, the 85 days, and I agree with him that one of the main reasons for the missed opportunity was weariness. Men of the 11th Armoured, he wrote, slept where they sat, stood or lay, drained of emotion and in utter exhaustion. If we accept his theory, it is doubtful that Roberts's 11th could have continued its drive with the same vigour. Nevertheless, Antwerp and its vital approaches, argues Thompson, might have been taken with ease, had there been a commander following the battle hour by hour, day by day, and with the flexibility of command to see the prospect. The port of Antwerp, one of the war's major prizes, was secured, but its approaches, still held by the Germans, were not. This great facility, which could have shortened and fed Allied supply lines all along the front, was useless. Yet nobody in the heady atmosphere of the moment saw this oversight as more than a temporary condition. Indeed, there seemed no need to hurry. With the Germans reeling, the mop-up could take place at any time. The 11th Armoured, its assignment completed, held its positions awaiting new orders. The magnificent drive of Dempsey's armoured forces in the north, equaling that of Patton's south of the Ardennes, had run its course, though at this moment few realised it. Roberts's men were exhausted, short on gasoline and supplies. The same was true of the remainder of General Brian Horrocks's 30 Corps. Thus, on this same afternoon, the relentless pressure that had thrown the Germans back in the north shattered and demoralized suddenly relaxed. The blunder at Antwerp was compounded as the British came to a halt to refit, refuel, and rest.
General Horrocks, the Thirty Corps' capable and dynamic commander, was not even thinking about Antwerp. Like Field Marshal Montgomery, commander of the British 21st Army Group, his attention was focused on another target, the crossing of the Rhine and a swift end to the war. Only a few hours earlier, elated at the verve and dash of his armies, Montgomery had cabled the Supreme Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, We have now reached a stage where a really powerful and full-blooded thrust towards Berlin is likely to get there and thus end the war. Horrocks, in his memoirs, gives a very frank explanation. My excuse is that my eyes were fixed entirely on the Rhine, and everything else seemed of subsidiary importance. It never entered my head that the Skelder would be mined, and that we would not be able to use Antwerp until the Channel had been swept and the Germans cleared from the coastlines on either side. Napoleon would no doubt have realized these things, but Horrocks didn't. He also readily admits there was little opposition ahead of him, and we still had a hundred miles of petrol per vehicle and one further day's supply within reach. There would have been considerable risk, but I believe that if we had taken the chance and carried straight on with our advance instead of halting in Brussels, the whole course of the war in Europe might have been changed. In London, His Royal Highness the Prince of the Netherlands conferred with Queen Wilhelmina and then telephoned his wife, the Princess Juliana, in Canada. He urged her to fly immediately to England, ready to return to the Netherlands the moment the country was freed. Their long exile was about to end. The liberation, when it came, would be swift. They must be ready. Yet Bernhardt was uneasy. Over the past seventy-two hours, messages reaching him from the resistance had again and again underscored the German panic in Holland, and repeated the news that the retreat, begun on September 2nd, was still in progress. Now, on the 5th, underground leaders reported that although the Germans were still disorganized, the exodus appeared to be slowing down. Bernhardt had also heard from the Dutch Prime Minister in exile— Prime Minister Gerbrandi was somewhat embarrassed. Obviously, his September 3rd broadcast was premature. Allied troops had most certainly not crossed the Dutch border as yet. The Prince and the Prime Minister pondered the reason. Why had the British not moved? Surely, from the underground messages they received, the situation in Holland was clear. Bernhardt had little military training and was dependent on his own advisers, yet he was puzzled. If the Germans were still disorganized and, as his resistance leaders believed, a thrust by a few tanks could liberate the country in a matter of hours, why then didn't the British proceed? The young prince, although named commander-in-chief of the Netherlands forces by the Queen, was quite frank in interviews with the author regarding his military background. I had no tactical experience, he told me, except for a course at the war college before the war. I followed this up with courses in England, but most of my military knowledge was learned in a practical way by reading and by discussions with my officers. However, I never considered myself experienced enough to make a tactical decision. I depended on my staff, who were very well qualified. Nevertheless, Bernhard took his job very seriously. In his meticulously kept personal diary for 1944, which he kindly placed at my disposal, he recorded in minuscule handwriting each movement, almost minute by minute, from telephone calls and military conferences to official functions. During this period, based on his own notations, I would estimate that his average working day was about 16 hours. Perhaps Montgomery disbelieved the reports of the Dutch resistance because he considered them amateurish or unreliable. Bernhardt could find no other explanation. Why else would the British hesitate instead of instantly crossing the border? Although he was in constant touch with his ministers, the United States Ambassador-at-Large Anthony Biddle and Eisenhower's Chief of Staff Bedell Smith, and as a result was well aware that at this moment the advance was so fluid that the situation was changing almost hour by hour, nevertheless Bernhardt thought he would like first-hand information. He made a decision. He would request permission of Schaeff to fly to Belgium and see Field Marshal Montgomery himself as soon as possible. He had every faith in the Allied High Command, and in particular Montgomery. Still, if something was wrong, Bernhard had to know. At his Spartan tented headquarters in the Royal Palace Gardens at Laken, a few miles from the centre of Brussels, Field Marshal Bernard Law Montgomery impatiently waited for an answer to his coded, personal-for-Eisenhower-eyes-only message. 
Its urgent demand for a powerful and full-blooded thrust to Berlin was sent in the late hours of September 4th. Now, by midday on September 5th, the brusque, wiry, 58-year-old hero of El Alamein waited for a reply and impatiently fretted about the future course of the war. Two months before the invasion of Normandy, he had said, If we do our stuff properly and no mistakes are made, then I believe that Germany will be out of the war this year. In Montgomery's unalterable opinion, a momentous strategic mistake had been made just before the Allies captured Paris and crossed the Seine. Eisenhower's broad front policy, moving his armies steadily forward to the borders of the Reich, then up to the Rhine, may have been valid when planned before the invasion, but with the sudden disorderly collapse of the Germans, the Britisher believed it was now obsolete. As Montgomery put it, that strategy had become unstitched, and all his military training told him we could not get away with it and would be faced with a long winter campaign with all that that entailed for the British people. On August 17th, he had proposed to General Omar N. Bradley, the U.S. 12th Army Group commander, a single thrust plan. Both his own and Bradley's army group should stay together as a solid mass of 40 divisions, which would be so strong that it need fear nothing. This force should advance northeastward. Montgomery's 21st Army Group would clear the Channel coast and secure Antwerp and southern Holland. Bradley's U.S. 12th Army Group, its right flank on the Ardennes, would head for Aachen and Cologne. The basic objective of Montgomery's proposed drive was to secure bridgeheads over the Rhine before the winter began and to seize the Ruhr quickly. In all probability, he theorized, it would also end the war. Montgomery's plan called for three of Eisenhower's four armies, the British Second, the U.S. First, and the Canadian First. The fourth, Patton's U.S. Third Army, at this moment making headlines around the world for its spectacular advances, Montgomery dismissed. He calmly suggested it should be brought to a halt. Some forty-eight hours later, Montgomery learned that Bradley, who he had believed was responsive to his own idea, actually favored an American thrust, a Patton drive toward the Rhine and Frankfurt. Eisenhower rejected both plans. He was not prepared to change his strategic concept. The Supreme Commander wanted to remain flexible enough to thrust both to the Ruhr and the Saar, as the occasion permitted. To Montgomery, this was no longer the broad front policy, but a double thrust plan. Everybody now, he felt, was going his own way, especially Patton, who seemed to be allowed enormous latitude. Eisenhower's determination to persist in his original concept revealed quite clearly, in Montgomery's opinion, that the Supreme Commander was, in fact, completely out of touch with the land battle. Montgomery's view was based on a recent development which angered him, and he felt demeaned his own role. He was no longer the overall coordinator of the land battle. On September 1st, Eisenhower had personally taken over command. Because the Supreme Commander believed Montgomery a master of the set battlepiece, he had given the British general operational control of the D-Day assault and the initial period of fighting thereafter. Thus, General Omar N. Bradley's 12th Army Group was under Montgomery. Press stories appearing in the United States at the end of August revealing that Bradley's army group still operated under Montgomery created such a public furor that Eisenhower was promptly ordered by General George C. Marshall, U.S. Chief of Staff, to immediately assume direct command of all ground forces. American armies reverted back to their own command. The move caught Montgomery off base. As his Chief of Staff, General Francis de Gangon, later put it, Montgomery never, I believe, thought that the day would come so soon. Possibly he hoped that the initial command setup was there to stay for a long time. He was, I think, apt to give insufficient weight to the dictates of prestige and national feelings, or to the increasing contribution of America in both men and arms. It was obvious, however, to most of us that it would have been an impossible situation for a British general and a British headquarters to retain command of these more numerous American formations indefinitely. It may have been obvious to his staff, but not to Montgomery. He felt publicly humiliated. Montgomery and the British public, as outraged as he, were somewhat mollified when George VI, at Churchill's strong urging, made Montgomery a field marshal on September 1st. It was hardly a secret that Monty and his superior, Sir Alan Brooke, chief of the Imperial General Staff, were highly critical of Eisenhower. 
both men considered him ambivalent and indecisive. In a letter to Montgomery on July 28th, Brooke commented that Eisenhower had only the very vaguest conception of war. On another occasion, he summarized the Supreme Commander as a most attractive personality, but with a very, very limited brain from a strategic point of view. Montgomery, never a man to mince words, saw right from the beginning that Ike had simply no experience for the job, and while history he felt would record Eisenhower as a very good supreme commander, as a field commander he was very bad, very bad. Angrily, Montgomery began promoting the idea of an overall land forces commander, a post sandwiched between the army groups and Eisenhower. He knew just the man for the job, himself. Eisenhower was well aware of the underground campaign. He remained calm. The Supreme Commander was, in his way, as obstinate as Montgomery. His orders from General Marshall were clear, and he had no intention of entertaining the idea of any overall ground commander other than himself. Montgomery had no opportunity to discuss his single-thrust plan or his thoughts about a land forces commander directly with Eisenhower until August 23rd, when the Supreme Commander came to lunch at 21st Army Group Headquarters. Then the fractious Montgomery, with extraordinary tactlessness, insisted on a private conversation with the Supreme Commander. He demanded that Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, General Bedell Smith, be excluded from the conference. Smith left the tent, and for an hour Eisenhower, grimly keeping his temper, was lectured by his subordinate on the need for a firm and sound plan. Montgomery demanded that Eisenhower decide where the main effort would be, so that we could be certain of decisive results quickly. Again and again he pressed for the single thrust, warning that if the Supreme Commander continued the broad front strategy, with the whole line advancing and everyone fighting all the time, the advance would inevitably peter out. If that happened, Montgomery warned, the Germans would gain time to recover, and the war would go on all through the winter and well into 1945. If we split the maintenance, Montgomery said, and advance on a broad front, we shall be so weak everywhere we'll have no chance of success. To his mind there was only one policy, to halt the right and strike with the left, or halt the left and strike with the right. There could only be one thrust, and everything should support it. Eisenhower saw Montgomery's proposal as a gigantic gamble. It might produce speedy and decisive victory. It might instead result in disaster. He was not prepared to accept the risks involved. Nevertheless, he found himself caught between Montgomery on one side and Bradley and Patton on the other, each advocating the main thrust, each wanting to be entrusted with it. Up to this point, Montgomery, notorious for his slow-moving, if successful, tactics, had yet to prove that he could exploit a situation with the speed of Patton, and at this moment Patton's army, far ahead of everyone else, had crossed the Seine and was racing toward Germany. Diplomatically, Eisenhower explained to Montgomery that whatever the merits of a single thrust, he could hardly hold back Patton and stop the U.S. Third Army in its tracks. The American people, said the Supreme Commander, would never stand for it, and public opinion wins wars. Montgomery heatedly disagreed. Victories win wars, he announced. Give people victory and they won't care who won it. Eisenhower was not impressed. Although he did not say so at the time, he thought Montgomery's view was much too narrow, and that the field marshal did not understand the overall situation. Eisenhower explained to Montgomery that he wanted Patton to continue eastward so that a link-up might be effected with the American and French forces advancing from the south. In short, he made it quite clear that his broad front policy would continue. Montgomery turned for the moment to the subject of a land commander. Someone must run the land battle for you. Eisenhower, Montgomery declared, should sit on a very lofty perch in order to be able to take a detached view of the whole intricate problem which involves land, sea, air, etc. He retreated from arrogance to humility. If the matter of public opinion in America was involved, Montgomery declared, he would gladly let Bradley control the battle and serve under him. Eisenhower quickly dismissed the suggestion. Placing Bradley over Montgomery would be as unacceptable to the British people as the reverse would be to the Americans. As for his own role, he could not, he explained, deviate from the plan to take personal control of the battle. 
but in seeking a solution to some of the immediate problems he was ready to make some concessions to Montgomery. He needed the channel ports and Antwerp. They were vital to the entire Allied supply problem. Thus, for the moment, Eisenhower said, priority would be given to the 21st Army Group's northern thrust. Montgomery could use the Allied 1st Airborne Army in England, at the time Schaeff's only reserve. Additionally, he could have the support of the U.S. 1st Army moving on his right. Montgomery had, in the words of General Bradley, won the initial skirmish, but the Britisher was far from satisfied. It was his firm conviction that Eisenhower had missed the great opportunity. Patton shared that view for different reasons when the news reached him. Not only had Eisenhower given supply priority to Montgomery at the expense of the U.S. Third Army, but he had also rejected Patton's proposed drive to the Saar. To Patton it was the most momentous error of the war. In the two weeks since this clash of personalities and conflicting military philosophies had taken place, much had happened. Montgomery's 21st Army Group now rivaled Patton's in speed. By September 5th, with his advance units already in Antwerp, Montgomery was more convinced than ever that his single-thrust concept was right. He was determined to reverse the Supreme Commander's decision. A crucial turning point in the conflict had been reached. The Germans, Montgomery was convinced, were teetering on the verge of collapse. He was not alone in this view. On nearly every level of command, intelligence officers were forecasting the imminent end of the war. The most optimistic estimate came from the Combined Allied Intelligence Committee in London. The German situation had deteriorated to such an extent that the group believed the enemy incapable of recovery. There was every indication, their estimates said, that organized resistance under the control of the German high command is unlikely to continue beyond December 1, 1944, and may end even sooner. Supreme Headquarters shared this optimism. At the end of August, Schaeff's intelligence summary declared that the August battles have done it, and the enemy in the West has had it. Two and one-half months of bitter fighting have brought the end of the war in Europe in sight, almost within reach. Now, one week later, they considered the German army no longer a cohesive force, but a number of fugitive battle groups, disorganized and even demoralized, short of equipment and arms. Even the conservative director of military operations at the British War Office, Major General John Kennedy, noted on September 6 that, if we go at the same pace as of late, we should be in Berlin by the 28th. In this chorus of optimistic predictions, there seemed only one dissenting voice. The U.S. Third Army's intelligence chief, Colonel Oscar W. Koch, believed the enemy still capable of waging a last-ditch struggle, and warned that, barring internal upheaval in the homeland and the remote possibility of insurrection within the Wehrmacht, the German armies will continue to fight until destroyed or captured. But his own intelligence officer's cautious appraisal meant little to the Third Army's ebullient commander, Lieutenant General George S. Patton. Like Montgomery in the north, Patton in the south was now only 100 miles from the Rhine. He too believed the time had come, as Montgomery had put it, to stick our neck out in a single deep thrust into enemy territory and finish off the war. The only difference lay in their views of who was to stick out his neck. Both commanders, flushed with victory and bidding for glory, now vied for that opportunity. In his zeal, Montgomery had narrowed his rivalry down to Patton alone. A British field marshal in charge of an entire army group was trying to outrace an American lieutenant general in charge of a single army. But all along the front, the fever of success gripped battle commanders. After the spectacular sweep across France and Belgium, and with evidence of German defeat all around, men now confidently believed that nothing could stop the victorious surge from continuing through the Siegfried Line and beyond into the heart of Germany. Yet keeping the enemy off balance and disorganized demanded constant, unremitting Allied pressure. Supporting that pressure had now produced a crisis that few seemed aware of. The heady optimism bordered on self-deception, for at this moment Eisenhower's great armies, after a hectic dash of more than 200 miles from the Seine, were caught up in a gigantic maintenance and supply problem. After six weeks of almost non-stop advance against little opposition, few noted the sudden loss of momentum. But as the first tanks approached Germany's threshold and at places began probing the Westphal itself, the advance began to slow. The Allied pursuit was over, strangled by its own success. 
The chief problem crippling the advance was the lack of ports. There was no shortage of supplies, but these were stockpiled in Normandy, still being brought in across the beaches or through the one workable port, Cherbourg, some 450 miles behind the forward elements. Supplying four great armies in full pursuit from that far back was a nightmarish task. A lack of transportation added to the creeping paralysis. Rail networks, bombed in pre-invasion days or destroyed by the French underground, could not be repaired fast enough. Gasoline pipelines were only now being laid and extended. As a result, everything from rations to gasoline was being hauled by road, and there was a frustrating shortage of trucks. To keep abreast of the pursuit, which day by day pushed farther east, every kind of vehicle was being pressed into service. Artillery, anti-aircraft guns, and spare tanks had been unloaded from their conveyors and left behind so that the conveyors could be used to carry supplies. Divisions had been stripped of their transport companies. The British had left one entire corps west of the Seine so that its transport could serve the rest of the speeding army. Montgomery's difficulties mounted with the discovery that 1,400 British three-ton trucks were useless because of faulty pistons. Now, in Herculean efforts to keep the pursuit going without pause, a ceaseless belt of trucks, the Red Ball Express, hammered east, delivered their supplies, and then swung back to the west for more, some convoys often making a grueling round trip of between six and eight hundred miles. Even with all available transport moving around the clock, and with commanders in the field applying the most stringent economies, the supply demands of the armies could not be met. Taxed beyond its capabilities, the makeshift supply structure had almost reached the breaking point. Besides the acute transportation problem, men were tired, equipment worn out after the catapult-like advance from Normandy. Tanks, half-tracks, and vehicles of every description had been driven so long without proper maintenance that they were breaking down. Overshadowing everything was a critical shortage of gasoline. Eisenhower's armies, needing one million gallons per day, were receiving only a fraction of that amount. The effect was critical. In Belgium, as the enemy fled before it, an entire corps of the U.S. First Army was halted for four days, its tanks dry. Patton's U.S. Third Army, more than a hundred miles ahead of everyone else and meeting little opposition, was forced to halt for five days on the Meurs because armoured columns were out of gas. Patton was furious when he discovered that of the 400,000 gallons of gasoline ordered, he had received only 32,000 due to priority cutbacks. He promptly ordered his leading corps commander, Get off your fanny as fast as you can and move on until your engines run dry, then get out and walk, goddammit. To his headquarters staff, Patton raged that he was up against two enemies, the Germans and our own high command. I can take care of the Germans, but I'm not sure I can win against Montgomery and Eisenhower. He tried. Convinced that he could bludgeon his way into Germany in a matter of days, Patton furiously appealed to Bradley and Eisenhower. My men can eat their belts, he stormed, but my tanks have got to have gas. The crushing defeat of the Germans in Normandy and the systematic and speedy annihilation of their forces following the breakout had caused the logistic crisis. On the assumption that the enemy would hold and fight on the various historic river lines, invasion planners had anticipated a more conservative advance. A pause for regrouping and massing of supplies, it was assumed, would take place after the Normandy beachhead had been secured and channel ports captured. The lodgment area was expected to lie west of the River Seine, which, according to the projected timetable, would not be reached until September 4th, D plus 90 days. The sudden disintegration of the enemy's forces and their headlong flight eastward had made the Allied timetable meaningless. Who could have foreseen that by September 4th Allied tanks would be 200 miles east of the Seine and in Antwerp? Eisenhower's staff had estimated that it would take approximately 11 months to reach the German frontier at Aachen. Now, as tank columns approached the Reich, the Allies were almost seven months ahead of their advance schedule. That the supply and transportation system, designed for a much slower rate of progress, had stood up to the strain of the hectic pursuit at all was close to miraculous. Yet in spite of the critical logistic situation, no one was ready to admit that the armies must soon halt, or that the pursuit was over. Every commander from division upwards, Eisenhower later wrote, was obsessed with the idea that with only a few more tons of supply he could rush right on and win the war. 
Each commander, therefore, begged and demanded priority over all others, and it was quite undeniable that in front of each were opportunities for quick exploitation that made the demands completely logical. Still, the optimism had infected even the supreme commander. It was obvious that he believed the impetus of the advance could be maintained long enough for the Allied armies to overrun the Siegfried Line before the Germans had a chance to defend it, for he saw signs of collapse on the entire front. On September 4th he directed that Bradley's 12th Army Group will capture the Saar and the Frankfurt area. Montgomery's 21st Army Group will capture the Ruhr and Antwerp. Even Patton seemed appeased by the announcement. Now he was sure that, given adequate supplies, his powerful U.S. Third Army could by itself reach the industrial Saar and then dash on all the way to the Rhine. Patton's weekly press conferences were always newsworthy, but especially memorable for the general's off-the-record remarks, which, because of his colorful vocabulary, could never have been printed anyway. That first week of September, as a war correspondent for the London Daily Telegraph, I was present when, in typical fashion, he expounded on his plans for the Germans. In his high-pitched voice and pounding the map, Patton declared that, Maybe there are five thousand, maybe ten thousand Nazi bastards in their concrete foxholes before the Third Army. Now, if Ike stops holding Monty's hand and gives me the supplies, I'll go through the Siegfried line like shit through a goose. And in the unparalleled atmosphere of victory that prevailed, Montgomery, with his coded message of September 4th, once again doggedly pressed his case. This time he went far beyond his proposal of August 17th and his conversation with Eisenhower on August 23rd. Convinced that the Germans were broken, the commander of the British 21st Army Group believed that he could not only reach the Ruhr, but race all the way to Berlin itself. In his nine-paragraph message to Eisenhower, Montgomery spelled out again the reasons that convinced him that the moment had come for a really powerful and full-blooded thrust. There were two strategic opportunities open to the Allies, one via the Ruhr and the other via Metz and the Saar. But he argued, because we have not enough resources, two such drives could not be maintained. There was a chance for only one, his. That thrust, the northern one, via the Ruhr, was, in Montgomery's opinion, likely to give the best and quickest results. To guarantee its success, Monty's single thrust would need all the maintenance resources without qualification. He was now clearly impatient of any other considerations. He was going on record both as to the worth of his own plan and his skill and belief in himself as the one man to carry it off. Other operations would have to get along with whatever logistic support remained. There could be no compromise, he warned the Supreme Commander. He dismissed the possibility of two drives because it would split our maintenance resources so that neither thrust is full-blooded, and as a result prolong the war. As Montgomery saw the problem, it was very simple and clear-cut, but time was of such vital importance that a decision is required at once. Acrid and autocratic, the most popular British commander since Wellington was obsessed by his own beliefs. Considering the acute logistic situation, he reasoned that his single-thrust theory was now more valid than it had been two weeks before. In his intractable way, and indifferent as to how the tone of his message might be received, Montgomery was not merely suggesting a course of action for the Supreme Commander. The Field Marshal was dictating one. Eisenhower must halt all other armies in their tracks, in particular patterns, so that all resources could be put behind his single drive, and his signal number M160 closed with a typical example of Montgomery's arrogance. If you are coming this way, perhaps you would look in and discuss it, he proposed. If so, delighted to see you lunch tomorrow. Do not feel I can leave this battle just at present. That his closing words bordered on the insolent seemed not to occur to Montgomery in his anxiety that this last chance to finish off the Germans must not be lost. Limpet-like, he clung to his single-thrust plan, for now he was sure that even Eisenhower must realize that the time had come to strike the final blow. In the bedroom of his villa at Granville on the western side of the Cherbourg Peninsula, the Supreme Commander read Montgomery's signal number M160 with angry disbelief. The fifty-five-year-old Eisenhower thought Montgomery's proposal unrealistic and fantastic. Three times Montgomery had nagged him to exasperation about single-thrust schemes. 
Eisenhower thought he had settled the strategy conflict once and for all on August 23rd. Yet now Montgomery was not only advocating his theory once again, but was proposing to rush all the way to Berlin. Usually calm and congenial, Eisenhower now lost his temper. There isn't a single soul who believes this can be done except Montgomery, he exploded to members of his staff. At this moment, to Eisenhower's mind, the most urgent matter was the opening of the Channel ports, especially Antwerp. Why could Montgomery not understand that? The Supreme Commander was only too well aware of the glittering opportunities that existed. But as he told the Deputy Supreme Commander, Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Sir Arthur Tedder, and Schaaf's Assistant Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan, for Montgomery, to talk of marching to Berlin with an army which is still drawing the great bulk of its supplies over the beaches is fantastic. The Field Marshal's message could hardly have come at a worse time. The Supreme Commander was propped up in bed, his right knee in a cast, as a consequence of an injury of which Montgomery at the moment was unaware. Eisenhower had more cause than this, however, to be edgy. Leaving the main body of Schaeff in London, he had come to the continent to take personal control on September 1st, four days earlier. His small advance command headquarters at Joulouville near Grandville was totally inadequate. Because of the phenomenal movement of his armies, Eisenhower was stranded more than 400 miles from the front, and there were as yet no telephone or teletype facilities. Except for radio and a rudimentary courier system, he was unable to communicate immediately with his commanders in the field. The physical injury which added to these tactical discomforts had occurred after one of his routine flying visits to his principal commanders. On September 2nd, returning from a conference at Chartres with senior American generals, Eisenhower's plane, because of high winds and bad visibility, had been unable to land at the headquarters airfield. Instead, it had put down, safely, on the beach near his villa. But then, trying to help the pilot pull the plane away from the water's edge, Eisenhower had badly wrenched his right knee. Thus, at this vital juncture in the war, as the Supreme Commander tried to take control of the land battle, and with events happening so fast that immediate decisions were necessary, Eisenhower was physically immobilized. Although Montgomery, or for that matter Bradley and Patton, might feel that Eisenhower was out of touch with the land battle, only distance made that argument valid. His excellent integrated Anglo-American staff was much more cognizant of the day-to-day -day situation in the field than his generals realized, and while he expected combat commanders to display initiative and boldness, only the supreme commander and his staff could view the overall situation and make decisions accordingly. But it was true that in this transitional period, while Eisenhower was assuming personal control, there appeared to be a lack of clear-cut direction, due in part to the complexity of the Supreme Commander's role. Coalition command was far from easy, yet Eisenhower, maintaining a delicate balance and following to the letter the plans of the combined chiefs of staff, made the system work. In the interest of allied amity, he might modify strategy, but Eisenhower had no intention of throwing caution to the winds and allowing Montgomery, as the Supreme Commander later put it, to make a single knife-like drive toward Berlin. In all fairness to Montgomery, it must be said that he himself never used this phrase. His idea was to throw forty divisions together and drive toward Berlin, certainly no knife-like thrust. But he has been credited with the remark, and in my opinion it hurt his cause at Schaeff during the many strategic meetings that took place. He had been more than tolerant with Montgomery, granting him concession after concession, often incurring the anger of his own American generals. Yet it seemed that Monty always wanted everything, and he never did anything fast in his life. To the author in a taped interview, President Eisenhower almost relived for me his emotions at the time of this bitter argument with Montgomery. When I told him I had interviewed the field marshal, Eisenhower cut me short and said, You don't have to tell me what he told you. He said I knew nothing about war, right? Look, I'm interested only in getting this thing down truthfully and logically, because any historian has to make deductions. Personally, I don't believe I would put too much weight on what generals remember, including me, because memory is a fallible thing. God damn it, I don't know what you heard in Britain, but the British have never understood the American system of command. 
when the whole damned thing, World War II, was done, I never heard from the British any goddamn peons of praise, and you're not going to hear it now, particularly from people like Montgomery. His associates, they've said things about him that I would never dream of repeating. I don't care if he goes down as the greatest soldier in the world. He isn't, but if he goes down that way, it's all right with me. He got so damn personal to make sure that the Americans, and me in particular, had no credit, had nothing to do with the war, that I eventually just stopped communicating with him. I was just not interested in keeping up communications with a man that just can't tell the truth. The reader is urged to remember that never during the war did the Supreme Commander publicly discuss the Field Marshal, and his views expressed here are revealed for the first time. Eisenhower said he understood Montgomery's peculiarities better than the British are realized. Look, people have told me about his boyhood, Eisenhower recalled, and when you have a contest between Eaton and Harrow on one side and some of the lesser schools on the other, some of these juniors coming into the army felt sort of inferior. The man all his life has been trying to prove that he was somebody. Clearly, however, the field marshal's views reflected his British superior's beliefs on how the Allies should proceed. Understandable as this might be, Montgomery's arrogance in presenting such views invariably set American commanders' teeth on edge. As Supreme Commander, armed by the combined chiefs of staff with sweeping powers, Eisenhower had one prime concern, to hold the Allies together and win the war swiftly. Although some of Schaeff's staff, including many Britishers, considered Montgomery insufferable and said so, Eisenhower never commented on him except in private to his chief of staff, Bedell Smith. But in fact the Supreme Commander's exasperation with Montgomery went far deeper than anyone knew. Eisenhower felt that the field marshal was a psychopath, such an egocentric, that everything he had ever done was perfect. He never made a mistake in his life. Eisenhower was not going to let him make one now. Robbing the American Peter who is fed from Cherbourg, he told Tedder, will certainly not get the British Paul to Berlin. Nevertheless, Eisenhower was deeply disturbed at the widening rift between him and Britain's favorite general. Within the next few days, the Supreme Commander decided he would meet with Montgomery in an effort to clarify what he considered to be a misunderstanding. Once more he would attempt to spell out his strategy and hope for agreement, however grudgingly it might come. In the interim, before the meeting, he made one thing clear. He firmly rejected Montgomery's single thrust plan and his bid for Berlin. On the evening of September 5th, in a coded message to the field marshal, he said, While agreeing with your conception of a powerful and full-blooded thrust toward Berlin, I do not agree that it should be initiated at this moment to the exclusion of all other maneuvers. As the Supreme Commander saw it, the bulk of the German army in the West has now been destroyed, and that success should be exploited by promptly breaching the Siegfried Line, crossing the Rhine on a wide front, and seizing the Saar and the Ruhr. This I intend to do with all possible speed. These moves, Eisenhower believed, would place a stranglehold on Germany's main industrial areas and largely destroy her capacity to wage war. Opening the ports of Le Havre and Antwerp was essential, Eisenhower went on, before any powerful thrust into Germany could be launched. But at the moment, Eisenhower emphasized, no relocation of our present resources would be adequate to sustain a thrust to Berlin. Eisenhower's decision took 36 hours to reach Montgomery, and then only the last half of the message arrived. The concluding two paragraphs were received by Montgomery at 9 a.m. on the morning of September 7th. The opening section did not arrive until September 9th, another 48 hours later. As Montgomery saw it, Eisenhower's communication was one more confirmation that the Supreme Commander was too far removed from the battle. From the first fragment of the message that Montgomery received, it was abundantly clear that Eisenhower had rejected his plan— for it contained the sentence, No relocation of our present resources would be adequate to sustain a thrust to Berlin. Montgomery immediately sent off a message disagreeing heatedly. With the slackening of the pursuit, Montgomery's worst fears were being realized. German opposition was stiffening. In his message, focusing in particular on the shortage of supplies, Montgomery claimed that he was getting only half his requirements, and, I cannot go on for long like this. He refused to be diverted from his plan to drive to Berlin. 
The obvious necessity of immediately opening up the vital port of Antwerp was not even mentioned in his dispatch, yet he stressed that, as soon as I have a Pas de Calais port working, I would then require about 2,500 additional three-ton lorries, plus an assured airlift averaging about 1,000 tons a day, to enable me to get to the Ruhr and finally Berlin. Because it was all very difficult to explain, the field marshal wondered if it was possible for Eisenhower to come and see him. Unshaken in his conviction that the Supreme Commander's decision was a grave error, and confident that his own plan would work, Montgomery refused to accept Eisenhower's rejection as final. Yet he had no intention of flying to Julouville in an attempt to change Eisenhower's mind. Such diplomacy was not part of his make-up, although he was fully aware that the only hope of selling his proposal was via a face-to-face -face meeting with the Supreme Commander. Outraged and seething, Montgomery awaited a reply from Eisenhower. The British Field Marshal was in near seclusion, impatient and irritable, at the moment when Prince Bernhardt arrived at the headquarters to pay his respects. Bernhardt had arrived in France on the evening of the 6th, with a small staff, three jeeps, his Celium Terrier Martin, and a bulging briefcase containing Dutch underground reports, he and his party flew to the continent guarded by two fighter planes, in three Dakotas, with Bernhardt at the controls of one. From the airfield at Amiens they drove to Douai, fifty miles north, and early on the 7th set out for Belgium and Brussels. At the Lacken headquarters the prince was met by General Horrocks, introduced to Montgomery's staff, and ushered into the presence of the field marshal. He was in a bad humor and obviously not happy to see me, Bernhardt recalled. He had a lot on his mind, and the presence of royalty in his area was understandably a responsibility that he could easily do without. The field marshal's renown as the greatest British soldier of the war had made him, in Bernhardt's words, the idol of millions of Britishers, and the thirty-three-year-old prince was in awe of Montgomery. Unlike Eisenhower's relaxed, almost casual manner, Montgomery's demeanor made it difficult for Bernhardt to converse easily with him. Sharp and blunt from the outset, Montgomery made it clear that Bernhardt's presence in his area worried him. With justification untempered by tact or explanation, Montgomery told the prince that it would be unwise for Bernhardt to visit the headquarters of the Dutch unit, the Princess Irene Brigade, attached to the British Second Army, quartered in the area around Deest, barely ten miles from the front line. Bernhardt, who, as commander-in-chief of the Netherlands forces, had every intention of visiting Deest, for the moment did not respond. Instead, he began to discuss the Dutch resistance reports. Montgomery overrode him. Returning to the matter, he told the prince, "'You must not live in Deest. I cannot allow it.' Irked, Bernhardt felt compelled to point out that he was serving directly under Eisenhower and did not come under the field marshal's command. Thus, from the start, as Bernhardt remembers the meeting, rightly or wrongly, we got off on the wrong foot. Later, in fact, Eisenhower backed Montgomery regarding Deist, but he did say that Bernhardt could stay in Brussels, close to 21st Army Group headquarters, where your presence may be needed. Bernhardt went on to review the situation in Holland as reflected in the underground reports. Montgomery was told of the retreat and disorganization of the Germans which had been going on since September the 2nd, and of the make-up of the resistance groups. To the best of his knowledge, Bernhardt said, the reports were accurate. Montgomery, according to the prince, retorted, I don't think your resistance people can be of much use to us. Therefore I believe all this is quite unnecessary. Startled by the field marshal's bluntness, Bernhardt began to realize that Montgomery apparently did not believe any of the messages coming from my agents in Holland. In a way, I could hardly blame him. I gathered he was a bit fed up with misleading information that he had received from the French and Belgian resistance during his advance. But in this instance I knew the Dutch groups involved, the people who were running them, and I knew the information was indeed correct. He persisted. Showing the field marshal the message file and quoting from report after report, Bernhardt posed a question. In view of this, why can't you attack right away? We can't depend on these reports, Montgomery told him. Just because the Dutch resistance claim the Germans have been retreating from September the 2nd doesn't necessarily mean they are still retreating. Bernhardt had to admit the retreat was slowing down, and there were signs of reorganization. Still, in his opinion, there was valid reason for an immediate attack. Montgomery remained adamant. 
Anyway, he said, much as I would like to attack and liberate Holland, I can't do it because of supplies. We are short of ammunition. We are short of petrol for the tanks, and if we did attack, in all probability they would become stranded. Bernhardt was astounded. The information he received in England from both Schaeff and his own advisers had convinced him that the liberation of Holland would be accomplished in a matter of days. Naturally, I automatically assumed that Montgomery, commander on the spot, knew the situation better than anyone else, Bernhardt later said. Yet we had absolutely every detail on the Germans, troop strength, the number of tanks and armoured vehicles, the position of anti-aircraft guns, and I knew, apart from immediate front-line opposition, that there was little strength behind it. I was sick at heart because I knew that German strength would grow with each passing day. I was unable to persuade Montgomery. In fact, nothing I said seemed to matter. Then Montgomery made an extraordinary disclosure. I am just as eager to liberate the Netherlands as you are, he said, but we intend to do it in another, even better way. He paused, thought a moment, and then, almost reluctantly, said, I am planning an airborne operation ahead of my troops. Bernhardt was startled. Instantly a number of questions came to his mind. In what area were the drops planned? When would the operation take place? How was it being developed? Yet he refrained from asking. Montgomery's manner indicated he would say no more. The operation was obviously still in the planning stage, and the prince's impression was that only the field marshal and a few of his staff officers knew of the plan. Although he was given no more details, Bernhardt was now hopeful that the liberation of Holland, despite Montgomery's earlier talk of lack of supplies, was imminent. He must be patient and wait. The field marshal's reputation was awesome. Bernhardt believed in it and in the man himself. The prince felt a renewal of hope, for anything Montgomery did, he would do well. Eisenhower, acceding to Montgomery's request, set Sunday, September 10th as the date for a meeting. He was not particularly looking forward to his meeting with Montgomery and the usual temperamental arguments he had come to expect from the field marshal. He was, however, interested in learning what progress had been made in one aspect of the Montgomery operation. Although the Supreme Commander must approve all airborne plans, he had given Montgomery tactical use of the First Allied Airborne Army and permission to work out a possible plan involving that force. He knew that Montgomery, at least since the 4th, had been quietly exploring the possibility of an airborne operation to seize a bridgehead across the Rhine. Ever since the formation of the 1st Allied Airborne Army under its American commander, Lt. Gen. Lewis Hyde Brereton, six weeks earlier, Eisenhower had been searching for both a target and a suitable opportunity to employ the force. To that end, he had been pressing Brereton and the various army commanders to develop bold and imaginative airborne plans calling for large-scale mass attacks deep behind the enemy's lines. Various missions had been proposed and accepted, but all had been cancelled. In nearly every case, the speeding land armies had already arrived at the objectives planned for the paratroops. Montgomery's original proposal had called for units of Brereton's airborne force to grab a crossing west of the town of Wesel, just over the Dutch-German border. However, heavy anti-aircraft defences in that area had forced the field marshal to make a change. The site he then chose was farther west in Holland, the Lower Rhine Bridge at Arnhem, at this juncture more than 75 miles behind the German front lines. By September 7th, Operation Comet, as the plan was called, was in readiness. Then bad weather, coupled with Montgomery's concern about the ever-increasing German opposition his troops were encountering, forced a postponement. What might have succeeded on the 6th or 7th seemed risky by the 10th. Eisenhower, too, was concerned. For one thing, he felt that the launching of an airborne attack at this juncture would mean a delay in opening the port of Antwerp. Yet the Supreme Commander remained fascinated by the possibilities of an airborne attack. The abortive operations, some of them cancelled almost at the last minute, had created a major problem for Eisenhower. Each time a mission reached the jump-off stage, troop carrier planes hauling gasoline to the front had to be grounded and made ready. This loss of precious air supply tonnage brought cries of protest from Bradley and Patton. At this moment of relentless pursuit, the airlift of gasoline, they declared, was far more vital than airborne missions. Eisenhower, anxious to use the paratroopers and urged by Washington to do so, 
Both General Marshall and General Henry H. Arnold, commander of the U.S. Army Air Forces, wanted to see what Broughton's new Allied Airborne Army could accomplish, was not prepared to ground his highly trained airborne divisions. On the contrary, he was insisting that they be used at the earliest opportunity. In fact, it might be a way to catapult his troops across the Rhine at the very moment when the pursuit was slowing down. But on this morning of September 10th, as he flew to Brussels, all other considerations were secondary in his mind to the opening of the vital port of Antwerp. Not so Montgomery. Anxious and determined, he was waiting at Brussels airport as Eisenhower's plane touched down. With characteristic preciseness, he had honed and refined his arguments preparatory to the meeting. He had talked with General Miles C. Dempsey of the British Second Army and Lieutenant General Frederick Browning, commander of the British I Airborne Corps, who was also Deputy Chief of the First Allied Airborne Army. Browning was waiting in the wings for the outcome of the conference. Dempsey, concerned at the ever-stiffening enemy resistance before him, and aware from the intelligence reports that new units were moving in, asked Montgomery to abandon the plan for an airborne attack on the bridge at Arnhem. Instead, he suggested concentrating on seizing the Rhine crossing at Wesel. Even in conjunction with an airborne mission, Dempsey contended the British Second Army probably was not strong enough to drive due north to Arnhem by itself. It would be better, he believed, to advance in conjunction with the U.S. First Army northeast towards Wesel. A drive into Holland was in any case now imperative. The British War Office had informed Montgomery that V-2s, the first German rockets, had landed in London on September 8th. Their launch sites were believed to be somewhere in western Holland. Whether before or after receiving this information, Montgomery altered his plans. Operation Comet, as originally devised, called for only a division and a half, the British 1st Airborne and the Polish 1st Parachute Brigade. That force was too weak to be effective, he believed. As a result, he cancelled Comet. In its place, Montgomery came up with an even more ambitious airborne proposal. As yet, only a few of the field marshal's upper echelon officers knew about it, and apprehensive of General Bradley's influence with Eisenhower, they had taken great pains to see that no hint of the plan reached American liaison officers at the British headquarters. Like Eisenhower, Lieutenant General Browning and the headquarters of the 1st Allied Airborne Army in England were at this moment unaware of Montgomery's new airborne scheme. Because of his injured knee, Eisenhower was unable to leave his plane, and the conference was held on board. Montgomery, as he had done on August 23rd, determined who should be present at the meeting. The Supreme Commander had brought his deputy, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, and an assistant chief of staff, Lieutenant General Sir Humphrey Gale, in charge of administration. Curtly, Montgomery asked that Eisenhower exclude Gale from the conference while insisting that his own administrative and supply chief, Lieutenant General Miles Graham, remain. Another less acquiescent superior might well have taken issue with Montgomery's attitude. Eisenhower patiently granted the field marshal's demand. General Gale left. Almost immediately, Montgomery denounced the Supreme Commander's broad front policy. Constantly referring to a sheaf of Eisenhower's communications that had arrived during the previous week, he called attention to the Supreme Commander's inconsistencies in not clearly defining what was meant by priority. He argued that his 21st Army Group was not getting the priority in supplies promised by Eisenhower, that Patton's drive to the Saar was being allowed to proceed at the expense of Montgomery's forces. Calmly, Eisenhower answered that he had never meant to give Montgomery absolute priority to the exclusion of everyone else. Eisenhower's strategy, Montgomery reiterated, was wrong and would have dire consequences. So long as these two jerky and disjointed thrusts were continued, with supplies split between himself and Patton, neither could succeed. It was essential, Montgomery said, that Eisenhower decide between him and Patton. So fierce and unrestrained was Montgomery's language that Eisenhower suddenly reached out, patted Montgomery's knee, and told him, Steady, Monty, you can't speak to me like that. I'm your boss. Montgomery's anger vanished. I'm sorry, Ike, he said quietly. In his memoirs, Montgomery, in discussing the meeting, says that we had a good talk, but he does state that during these days of strategy arguments, 
Possibly I went a bit far in urging on him my own plan, and did not give sufficient weight to the heavy political burden he bore. Looking back on it all, I often wonder if I paid sufficient heed to Eisenhower's notions before refuting them. I think I did. Anyhow, I never ceased to marvel at his patience and forbearance. The uncharacteristic but seemingly genuine apology was not the end of the matter. Doggedly, though with less acrimony, Montgomery continued to argue for his single thrust. Eisenhower listened intently and with sympathy to the arguments, but his own view remained unchanged. His broad-front advance would continue. He told Montgomery clearly why. As Eisenhower was later to recall, he said, What you're proposing is this. If I give you all of the supplies you want, you could go straight to Berlin, right? Straight to Berlin? Monty, you're nuts. You can't do it. What the hell? If you try a long column like that in a single thrust, you'd have to throw off division after division to protect your flanks from attack. Now suppose you did get a bridge across the Rhine. You can't depend for long on that one bridge to supply your drive. Monty, you can't do it. Montgomery, according to Eisenhower, replied, I'll supply them all right. Just give me what I need, and I'll reach Berlin and end the war. Eisenhower's rejection was firm. Antwerp, he stressed, must be opened before any major drive into Germany could even be contemplated. Montgomery then played his trump card. The most recent development, the rocket attack on London from sites in the Netherlands, necessitated an immediate advance into Holland. He knew exactly how such a drive should begin. To strike into Germany, Montgomery proposed to use almost the entire 1st Allied Airborne Army in a stunning mass attack. His plan was an expanded, grandiose version of Operation Comet. Montgomery now wanted to use three and a half divisions, the U.S. 82nd and 101st, the British 1st Airborne, and the Polish 1st Parachute Brigade. The airborne forces were to seize a succession of river crossings in Holland ahead of his troops, with the major objective being the lower Rhine bridge at Arnhem. Anticipating that the Germans would expect him to take the shortest route and drive northeast for the Rhine and the Ruhr, Montgomery had deliberately chosen a northern back-door route to the Reich. The surprise airborne attack would open a corridor for the tanks of his British Second Army, which would race across the captured bridges to Arnhem, over the Rhine, and beyond. Once all this was accomplished, Montgomery could wheel east, outflank the Siegfried Line, and dash into the Ruhr. Eisenhower was intrigued and impressed. It was a bold, brilliantly imaginative plan, exactly the kind of mass attack he had been seeking for his long, idle airborne divisions. But now the Supreme Commander was caught between the hammer and the anvil. If he agreed to the attack, the opening of Antwerp would temporarily have to be delayed, and supplies diverted from Patton. Yet Montgomery's proposal could revitalize the dying advance and perhaps propel the pursuit across the Rhine and into the Ruhr. Eisenhower, fascinated by the audaciousness of the plan, not only gave his approval, but insisted that the operation take place at the earliest possible moment. Eisenhower told Stephen E. Ambrose, according to his book The Supreme Commander, I not only approved, I insisted upon it. What we needed was a bridgehead over the Rhine. If that could be accomplished, I was quite willing to wait on all other operations. Yet the Supreme Commander stressed that the attack was a limited one, and he emphasized to Montgomery that he considered the combined airborne ground operation merely an extension of the northern advance to the Rhine and the Ruhr. As Eisenhower remembered the conversation, he said to Montgomery, I'll tell you what I'll do, Monty. I'll give you whatever you ask to get you over the Rhine, because I want a bridgehead. But let's get over the Rhine first before we discuss anything else. Montgomery continued to argue, but Eisenhower would not budge. Frustrated, the field marshal had to accept what he called a half-measure, and on this note the conference ended. After Eisenhower's departure, Montgomery outlined the proposed operation on a map for Lieutenant General Browning. The elegant Browning, one of Britain's pioneer airborne advocates, saw that the paratroopers and glider-borne forces were being called upon to secure a series of crossings, five of them major bridges, including the wide rivers of the Maas, the Waal, and the Lower Rhine, over a stretch approximately sixty-four miles long between the Dutch border and Arnhem. Additionally, they were charged with holding open the corridor, in most places a single highway running north, over which British armour would drive. 
All of the bridges had to be seized intact if the armored dash was to succeed. The dangers were obvious, but this was precisely the kind of surprise assault for which the airborne forces had been trained. Still, Browning was uneasy. Pointing to the most northern bridge over the lower Rhine at Arnhem, he asked, "'How long will it take the armor to reach us?' Montgomery replied briskly, Two days.' Still intent on the map, Browning said, "'We can hold it for four. Then he added, "'But, sir, I think we might be going a bridge too far.' The embryo concept, which thereafter would bear the codename Operation Market Garden, market covering the airborne drop and garden for the armored drive, was to be developed with the utmost speed, Montgomery ordered. He insisted that the attack had to be launched in a few days, otherwise, he told Browning, it would be too late. Montgomery asked, How soon can you get ready? Browning at this moment could only hazard a guess. The earliest scheduling of the operation would be the 15th or 16th, he told the field marshal. Carrying Montgomery's skeleton plan and weighed with the urgency of preparing for such a massive mission in only a few days, Browning flew back to England immediately. On landing at his Moor Park golf course base near Rickmansworth on the outskirts of London, he telephoned the 1st Allied Airborne Headquarters 20 miles away and notified the commander, Lieutenant General Brereton, and his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Floyd L. Parks. The time was 2.30 p.m., and Parks noted that Browning's message contained the first mention of market at this headquarters. The airborne commanders were not the only officers caught unaware— Montgomery's daring plan so impressed and surprised the field marshal's greatest critic, General Omar N. Bradley, that he later recalled, Had the pious teetotaling Montgomery wobbled into shape with a hangover, I could not have been more astonished. Although I never reconciled myself to the venture, I nevertheless freely concede that it was one of the most imaginative of the war. It was, but Montgomery remained unhappy. He now prodded the Supreme Commander even further, reverting to the cautious perfectionist thinking that was characteristic of his military career. Unless the 21st Army Group received additional supplies and transport for the selected thrust, Montgomery warned Eisenhower Market Garden could not be launched before September 23rd at the earliest, and might even be delayed until September 26th. Browning had estimated that Market could be ready by the 15th or 16th, but Montgomery was concerned about Garden, the land operation. Once again he was demanding what he had always wanted, absolute priority, which to his mind would guarantee success. Eisenhower noted in his desk diary for September 12th, Monty's suggestion is simple, give him everything. Fearing that any delay might jeopardize Market Garden, Eisenhower complied. He promptly sent his chief of staff, General Bedell Smith, to see Montgomery, Smith assured the field marshal of a thousand tons of supplies per day, plus transport. Additionally, Montgomery was promised that Patton's drive to the Saar would be checked. Elated at the electric response, as the field marshal called it, Montgomery believed he had finally won the supreme commander over to his point of view. Although opposition before Montgomery's troops had stiffened, he believed that the Germans in Holland, behind the hard crust of their front lines, had little strength. Allied intelligence confirmed his estimate. Eisenhower's headquarters reported few infantry reserves in the Netherlands, and even these were considered to be troops of low category. The enemy, it was thought, was still disorganized after his long and hasty retreat, and though there might be numerous small bodies of Germans in the area, they were hardly capable of any great organized resistance. Montgomery now believed he could quickly crack the German defenses. Then, once he was over the Rhine and headed for the Ruhr, he did not see how Eisenhower could halt his drive. The Supreme Commander would have little choice, he reasoned, but to let him continue toward Berlin, thus ending the war, as Montgomery put it, reasonably quickly. Confidently, Montgomery set Sunday, September 17th as D-Day for Operation Market Garden. The brilliant scheme he had devised was to become the greatest airborne operation of the entire war. Not everyone shared Montgomery's certainty about Market Garden. At least one of his senior officers had reason to be worried. General Miles Dempsey, commander of the British Second Army, unlike the field marshal, did not dispute the authenticity of Dutch resistance reports. From these, Dempsey's intelligence staff had put together a picture indicating rapidly increasing German strength between Eindhoven and Arnhem, 
in the very area of the planned airborne drop. There was even a Dutch report that battered panzer formations have been sent to Holland to refit, and these too were said to be in the market garden area. Dempsey sent along this news to Browning's British One Airborne Corps, but the information lacked any backup endorsement by Montgomery or his staff. The ominous note was not even included in intelligence summaries. In fact, in the mood of optimism prevailing at 21st Army Group headquarters, the report was completely discounted. 7. Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt's high-risk gamble to rescue the remains of General von Zangen's encircled 15th Army in the Pas de Calais was paying off. Under cover of darkness, ever since September 6th, a hastily assembled fleet consisting of two ancient Dutch freighters, several Rhine barges and some small boats and rafts, had been plying back and forth across the three-mile mouth of the Skelda estuary, ferrying men, artillery, vehicles, and even horses. Although powerful coastal guns on Valcheren Island protected against attack from the sea, the Germans were surprised that Allied naval forces made no effort to interfere. Major General Walter Popper expected the convoy carrying his splintered 59th Infantry Division to be blown out of the water. To him, the one-hour trip between Breskens and Flushing, in completely darkened ships, exposed and defenseless, was a most unpleasant experience. The Allies, the Germans suspected, completely underestimated the size of the evacuation. Certainly they knew about it, because both von Rundstedt and Army Group B's commander, Field Marshal Walter Model, desperately in need of reinforcements, were demanding speed, some daylight trips had been made. Immediately fighters pounced on the small convoys. Darkness, however unpleasant, was much safer. The most hazardous part of the journey was on the Skelder's northern bank. There, under the constant threat of Allied air attack, von Zangen's forces had to follow a single main road, running east from Valcheren Island across the Beverland Peninsula and into Holland. Part of the escape route at the narrow neck joining the mainland was only a few miles from Antwerp and British lines on the Albert Canal. Inexplicably, the British even now made no serious effort to attack north, spring the trap, and cut the base of the isthmus. The escape route remained open. Although hammered by incessant Allied air attacks, von Zangen's 15th Army would eventually reach Holland, at a most crucial moment for Montgomery's market garden operation. While the 15th Army had been extricated more by calculated design than by luck, now the opposite occurred. Fate, the unexpected and unpredictable, took a hand. Some eighty miles away, the battered armoured units of Lieutenant General Wilhelm Bittrich's elite, veteran II SS Panzer Corps, reached bivouac areas in the vicinity of Arnhem. As directed by Field Marshal Model on September 4th, Bittrich had slowly disengaged the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions for refitting and rehabilitation. Model had chosen the Arnhem area. The two reduced but still tough divisions were fanned out to the north, east, and south of the town. Bittrich assigned the 9th SS to a huge rectangular sector north and northeast of Arnhem, where most of the division's men and vehicles were on high ground and conveniently hidden in a densely wooded national park. The 10th was encamped in a semicircle to the northeast, east, and southeast. Thus, camouflaged and hidden in nearby woods, villages, and towns, Bakebergen, Appledorn, Zutphen, Ruolo, and Duticum, both divisions were within striking distance of Arnhem. Some units were within a mile or two of the suburbs. As Bittrich was later to recall, there was no particular significance in Modal choosing the Arnhem vicinity, except that it was a peaceful sector where nothing was happening. The possibility that this remote backwater might have any strategic value to the Allies was obviously discounted. On the morning of September 11th, a small group of modal staff officers was dispatched in search of a new site for Army Group B's headquarters, in Arnhem. One of Modal's aides, his General Headquarters Administration and Transportation Officer, 35-year-old Lieutenant Gustav Zedelhauser, later remembered that, We visited the 9th and 10th SS Division headquarters at Bakebergen and Rurlo, and General Bittrich's command post at Duticum. Then we inspected Arnhem itself. It had everything we wanted, a fine road net and excellent accommodations. But it was not until we drove west to the outlying district of Osterbeek that we found what we were looking for. 
In the wealthy residential village just two and a half miles from the centre of Arnhem was a group of hotels, among them the gracious white Hartenstein, with its broad expanse of crescent-shaped lawn, stretching back into park-like surroundings where deer roamed undisturbed, and the smaller two-storey tree-shaded Tafelberg, with its glassed-in veranda and panelled rooms. Impressed by the facilities and, as Zadelhauser recalled, especially the accommodations, the group promptly recommended Osterbeek to the Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Hans Krebs, as perfect for Army Group B's headquarters. Model approved the decision. Part of the staff, he decided, would live at the Hartenstein, while he would occupy the more secluded, less ostentatious Tafelberg. Lieutenant Zadelhauser was delighted. Since his tenure, the headquarters had never remained anywhere for more than a few days, and now Zadelhauser was looking forward to some peace and a chance to get my laundry done. By September 15th, Modal directed, Army Group B's headquarters was to be fully operational in Osterbeek, approximately three miles from the broad expanse of heaths and pastureland where the British 1st Airborne Division was due to land on September 17th. Part 2. The Plan 1. In the early evening of September 10th, within hours of General Browning's meeting with Field Marshal Montgomery, Lieutenant General Lewis H. Broughton held the first basic planning conference on Operation Market. At his Sunning Hill Park headquarters near the fashionable Ascot Racecourse, 35 miles from London, 27 senior officers crowded into Brereton's large map-lined office. After General Browning briefed the group on Montgomery's plan, Brereton told them that, because there was so little time, major decisions arrived at now must stand, and these have to be made immediately. The task was monumental and there were few guidelines. Never before had there been an attempt to send a mammoth airborne force, complete with vehicles, artillery and equipment, capable of fighting on its own, deep behind enemy front lines. In comparison with market, previous airborne attacks had been small, yet months had gone into their planning. Now to prepare for the greatest paratroop and glider-borne infantry operation ever conceived, Brereton and his planners had barely seven days. Broughton's greatest concern was not the deadline, but the possibility that this operation, like its predecessors, might be cancelled. His long idle airborne troops were impatient for action, and a serious morale problem had developed as a consequence. For weeks, his elite, highly trained divisions had stood down while ground forces on the continent swept victoriously across France and Belgium. There was a widespread feeling that victory was so near that the war might end before the first Allied airborne army got into battle. The general harboured no doubts about the ability of his staff to meet the tight one-week market schedule. There had been so many dry runs in developing previous airborne schemes that his headquarters and division staffs had reached a stage of high-speed efficiency. Additionally, much of the planning that had gone into Comet and other cancelled operations could be readily adapted to market. In preparing for the aborted Comet mission, for example, the British 1st Airborne and the Polish Brigade charged with that operation had made a thorough study of the Arnhem area. Still, most of the market concept meant vastly expanded planning, and all of it was time-consuming. General Broughton was outwardly confident and calm, but members of his staff noted that he smoked one cigarette after another. On his desk was a framed quotation which the general often pointed out to his staff. It read, Where is the prince who can afford so to cover his country with troops for its defense, as that ten thousand men descending from the clouds might not in many places do an infinite deal of mischief before a force could be brought together to repel them? It had been written in 1784 by Benjamin Franklin. Broughton was fascinated by the vision of the 18th century statesman and scientist. Even after 160 years, he had told his staff, the idea remains the same. But Franklin would have been bewildered by the complexities and size of Operation Market. To invade Holland from the sky, Broughton planned to land almost 35,000 men, nearly twice the number of paratroops and glider-borne infantry used in the invasion of Normandy. To grab the bridges with thunderclap surprise, as Brereton put it, 
and hold open the narrow one-highway advance corridor for the British Garden ground forces from their attack line near the Dutch-Belgian border to Arnhem, 64 miles north, three and one-half airborne divisions were to be used. Two would be American. Almost directly ahead of General Horrocks's 30 Corps tanks, Major General Maxwell D. Taylor's 101st Airborne Division was to capture canal and river crossings over a 15-mile stretch between Eindhoven and Vagel. North of them, Brigadier General James M. Gavin's veteran 82nd Division was charged with the area between Hrava and the city of Nijmegen, approximately a 10-mile stretch. They were to seize crossings over the great Maas and Vaal rivers, in particular the huge multi-span bridge at Nijmegen, which with its approaches was almost a half-mile long. The single most important objective of Operation Market Garden was Arnhem and its vital crossing over the 400-yard-wide Lower Rhine. The great concrete and steel three-span highway bridge, together with its concrete ramps, was almost 2,000 feet long. Its capture was assigned to the British and Poles, Major General Robert Roy E. Urquhart's 1st Airborne Division, and under his command Major General Stanisław Sosobowski's Polish 1st Parachute Brigade. Arnhem, lying farthest away from the Garden forces, was the prize. Without the Rhine crossing, Montgomery's bold stroke to liberate Holland, outflank the Siegfried Line, and springboard into Germany's industrial Ruhr would fail. To carry the huge force to targets 300 miles away, an intricate air plan had to be designed. Three distinct operations were required, transportation, protection, and resupply. No fewer than 24 different airfields would be needed for takeoff. Broughton planned to use every operable glider in his command, an immense fleet of more than 2,500. Besides hauling heavy equipment such as jeeps and artillery, the gliders were to ferry more than a third of the 35,000-man force. The rest would drop by parachute. All the craft had to be checked out, loading space allotted, heavy equipment and cargo stowed, and troop complements prepared. Gliders posed only a single problem in the air planning. Transports to carry paratroops and tow planes to pull the gliders must be diverted from their normal task of supplying the advancing armies and grounded in order to be readied for market. The crews of bomber squadrons had to be alerted and briefed for missions in the market garden area prior to and during the attack. Swarms of fighter squadrons from all over England, more than 1,500 planes, would be needed to escort the airborne force. Intricate aerial traffic patterns were of prime importance. Routes between England and Holland had to be laid out to avoid heavy enemy anti-aircraft fire and the equally dangerous possibility of air collision. Air-sea rescue operations, resupply missions, even a dummy parachute drop in another area of Holland to deceive the enemy were also planned. In all, it was estimated that almost 5,000 aircraft of all types would be involved in market. To develop plans and ready this vast air armada would take a minimum of 72 hours. The most pressing question of the conference, in Broughton's opinion, was whether the operation should be undertaken by day or by night. Previous major airborne operations had taken place in moonlight, but semi-darkness had led to confusion in finding landing zones, lack of troop concentration, and unnecessary casualties. The general decreed that the huge airborne assault would take place in broad daylight. It was an unprecedented decision. In the history of airborne operations, a daylight drop of such proportions had never before been made. Broughton had other reasons than the desire to avoid confusion. The week scheduled for Operation Market was a no-moon period, and night landings on a large scale were therefore impossible. Apart from that, Broughton chose a daylight attack because for the first time in the war it was feasible. Allied fighters held such overwhelming superiority over the battlefields that now interference from the Luftwaffe was practically non-existent. But the Germans did have night fighters. In a night drop against columns of slow-moving troop-carrying planes and gliders, they might prove devastatingly effective. German anti-aircraft strength was another consideration— Flak maps of the approaches to the market drop areas were dotted with anti-aircraft positions. 
The charts, based on photo reconnaissance flights and the experience of bomber crews flying over Holland en route to Germany, looked formidable, particularly so because gliders were without protective armor, except in the cockpits, and C-47 troop carriers and tow planes had no self-sealing gas tanks. Nevertheless, Broughton believed that enemy anti-aircraft positions could be neutralized by concentrated bomber and fighter attacks preceding and during the assault. In any event, most anti-aircraft was radar-directed, and therefore was as effective after dark as it was during the day. Either way, losses were to be expected. Still, unless bad weather and high winds intervened, the airborne force by attacking in daylight could be dropped with almost pinpoint accuracy on the landing zones, thus guaranteeing a quick concentration of troops in the corridor. The advantages, Broughton told his commanders, far outweigh the risks. Broughton made his final announcement. To command the giant operation, he appointed his deputy, the fastidious 47-year-old Lieutenant General Frederick Boy Browning, head of the British One Airborne Corps. It was an excellent choice, though disappointing to Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway, commander of the other corps in the Airborne Army, the 18th Airborne Corps. Still, Browning had been slated to command the aborted Operation Comet, which, though smaller and utilizing only British and Polish airborne troops, was similar in concept to Market Garden. Now, under the enlarged and innovative plan Montgomery had devised, American paratroops would serve under a British airborne commander for the first time. To the assembled airborne commanders, Browning delivered an optimistic summation— he ended his talk with the kind of picturesque confidence that had always made him a heroic figure to his men. As his chief of staff, Brigadier Gordon Walsh, remembers, General Browning was in high spirits, delighted that at last we were going. The object, he told us, is to lay a carpet of airborne troops down over which our ground forces can pass. He believed this single operation held the key to the duration of the war. Browning's enthusiasm was catching. As the large meeting broke up to be replaced by smaller staff conferences which would last throughout the night, few officers were aware that an underlying friction existed between Broughton and Browning. Originally, when the first Allied Airborne Army was formed, British hopes ran high that Browning, Britain's senior airborne authority and one of the pioneers in the use of paratroops, would be named commander. Because of the preponderance of American troops and equipment within the newly organized army, the coveted post went to an American, General Brereton. In rank, Browning was six months Brereton's senior, and although the American was a distinguished tactical Air Force officer, he had never before commanded airborne forces. Additionally, there were wide personality differences between the two men. Brereton had been a World War I flyer and had served brilliantly in World War II, first in the Far and Middle East, and later as commanding general of the U.S. Ninth Air Force in England. He was tenacious and single-minded, but his zeal to achieve was cloaked by a quiet, stolid demeanor. Now Brereton proceeded on the awesome assignment he had been handed with the determination and bulldozing tactics that characterized many of his fellow American career officers. Browning, a Grenadier Guards officer, was also a perfectionist, equally determined to prove the worth of paratroops, but he had never commanded an airborne corps before. In contrast to Broughton, Boy Browning was a somewhat glamorous figure, elegant and impeccably groomed, with an air of easy assurance, often misunderstood for arrogance, not only by Americans, but by some of his own commanders. Though he was temperamental and sometimes overly impatient, his reputation as an airborne theorist was legendary among his admirers. Still, he lacked the battle experience of some other officers, such as General Richard Gale of the British 6th Airborne Division and the veteran American commanders Generals Gavin and Taylor. And Browning had yet to prove that he possessed the administrative genius of the most experienced of all airborne commanders, General Ridgway. Only days before, an incident had occurred that pointed up the differences between Broughton and Browning. On September 3rd, Browning had protested to Broughton the dangers of trying to launch an airborne assault on just 36 hours' notice. Since D-Day on June 6th, 17 airborne operations had been prepared and cancelled. In the 33 days of Broughton's command, in his eagerness to get into action, plans had been processed at the rate of almost one a week. None reached the launching stage. 
Browning, watching the mass production of airborne schemes, was deeply concerned about the haste and the risks being run. When Operation Linnet 1, a drop before the British Army in Belgium, was cancelled on September 2nd, Broughton quickly found new objectives ahead of the speeding armies and proposed Operation Linnet 2 as a substitute attack to take place on the morning of September 4th. As Broughton later recalled the incident, Browning was quite agitated about Operation Linnet 2, in which there was a serious shortage of information, photographs, and in particular maps. As a result, Boy claimed his troops could not be briefed properly. Airborne operations, Browning contended, should not be attempted on such short notice. In principle, Breton had agreed, but he had told his deputy that the disorganization of the enemy demands that chances be taken. The disagreement between the two men had ended with Browning stiffly stating that he intended to submit his protest in writing. A few hours later, his letter had arrived. Because of our sharp differences of opinion, Browning wrote, he could no longer continue as deputy commander of the 1st Allied Airborne Army. Brereton, unintimidated, had begun at once to consider the problem of Browning's replacement. He had alerted General Ridgway to stand by to take over. The delicate problem was solved when Operation Linnet II was cancelled. The following day, Brereton had persuaded Browning to withdraw his letter of resignation. Now, their differences set aside, both men faced the huge, complex task of preparing market. Whatever reservations Browning entertained were now secondary to the job ahead. There was one decision Broughton could not make at the initial meeting, exactly how the airborne troops comprising the carpet were to be carried to the targets. The airborne commanders could not make detailed plans until this greatest of all problems was solved. The fact was that the airborne army was only as mobile as the planes that would carry it. Apart from gliders, Broughton had no transports of his own. To achieve complete surprise, the ideal plan called for the three and one-half divisions in market to be delivered to landing zones on the same day at the same hour. But the immense size of the operation ruled out this possibility. There was an acute shortage of both aircraft and gliders. The planes would have to make more than one trip. Other factors also forced a different approach. Each division had separate combat requirements. For example, it was essential that the transport for General Taylor's 101st Airborne carry more men than equipment when the attack began, so that the division could carry out its assigned task of achieving a link-up with the Garden forces within the first few hours. Also, Taylor's men had to join quickly with the 82nd Airborne on the corridor north of them. There, General Gavin's troops not only had to secure the formidable bridges across the Maas and the Val, but also hold the Grusbeck Ridge to the southeast, terrain which had to be denied the Germans because it dominated the countryside. Gavin's special assignment also imposed special requirements. Because the 82nd Airborne would have to fight longer than the 101st before the link-up occurred, Gavin needed not only troops, but artillery. Farther north, the problems of the British 1st Airborne under General Urquhart were different still. The British 1st was to hold the Arnhem Bridge until relieved. With luck, German reaction would be sluggish enough so that ground forces could reach the lightly armed British troopers before any real enemy strength developed. But until Horrocks's tanks arrived, Urquhart's men would have to hang on. Urquhart could not dissipate his strength by sending units south to link up with Gavin. Lying at the farthest end of the airborne carpet, the British 1st Airborne would have to hold longer than anyone else. For this reason, Urquhart's force was the largest, his division bolstered by the addition of Polish paratroops, plus the 52nd Lowland Division, which was to be flown in as soon as airstrips could be located and prepared in the Arnhem area. On the morning of the 11th, after a hectic night of assessing and analyzing aircraft availability for the attack, Major General Paul L. Williams, commander of the U.S. 9th Troop Carrier Command and in charge of all market air operations, gave his estimate to Brereton. There was such a shortage of gliders and planes, he reported, that even with an all-out effort, at best only half the troop strength of Browning's total force could be flown in on D-Day. Essential items such as artillery, jeeps, and other heavy cargo scheduled for the gliders could be included only on a strict priority basis. Broughton urged his air commander to explore the possibility of two D-Day airlifts, but the suggestion was found impractical. 
Owing to the reduced hours of daylight and the distances involved, it would not be possible to consider more than one lift per day, General Williams said. It was too risky. There would be no time for maintenance or battle damage repair, he pointed out, and almost certainly casualties would result from pilot and crew fatigue. Hamstrung by the shortage of aircraft and the time limit, Broughton made some general assessments. A full day would be required to take aerial reconnaissance photographs of the Dutch bridges and terrain. Two days must go into the preparation and distribution of maps of the areas. Intelligence had to be gathered and analyzed. Detailed battle plans must be prepared. The most crucial decision of all, Broughton was forced to tailor the market plan to suit the existing airlift capability. He must transport his force in installments, flying the three and one-half divisions to their targets over a period of three days. The risks were great. German reinforcements might reach the market garden area faster than anyone anticipated. Anti-aircraft fire could intensify, and there was always the possibility of bad weather. Fog, high winds, a sudden storm, all likely at this time of the year, could cause disaster. Worse, once on the ground, the paratroopers and glider-borne infantry arriving without heavy artillery or tanks would be highly vulnerable. General Horrocks's 30 core tank columns using one narrow highway could not make the 64-mile dash to Arnhem and beyond unless Broughton's men seized the bridges and held open the advance route. Conversely, the airborne army had to be relieved at top speed. Cut off far behind enemy lines and dependent on supplies by air, the airborne forces could expect German reinforcements to increase with each passing day. At best, the beleaguered troopers might hold out in their airheads for only a few days. If the British armoured drive was held up or failed to move fast enough, the airborne troops would inevitably be overrun and destroyed. More could go wrong. If General Taylor's screaming eagles failed to secure the bridges directly ahead of the British Second Army's tank spearheads, it would make little difference whether or not the men under General Gavin's or General Urquhart's command secured their objectives in Nijmegen and Arnhem. Their forces would be isolated. Certain classic airborne risks had to be accepted. Divisions might be dropped or landed by gliders in the wrong areas. Crossings might be destroyed by the enemy, even as the attack began. Bad weather could make air resupply impossible, and even if all the bridges were seized, the corridor might be cut at any point. These were but a few of the imponderables. The planners were gambling on speed, boldness, accuracy, and surprise, all deriving from a precise, synchronized land and airborne plan that in its turn gambled on German disorganization and inadequate strength. Each link in Market Garden was interlocked with the next. If one gave way, disaster might result for all. In Brereton's opinion, such risks had to be accepted. The opportunity might never arise again. Additionally, on the basis of the latest information of enemy strength from Montgomery's 21st Army Group, Allied Airborne Headquarters still felt that Brereton's forces would meet an ill-organized enemy of varying standards. It was not expected that any mobile force larger than a brigade group, about 3,000 men, with very few tanks and guns could be concentrated against the airborne troops before relief by the ground forces. It was expected that the flight and landings would be hazardous, that the capture intact of the bridge objectives was more a matter of surprise and confusion than hard fighting. There was nothing here that the planners had not already taken under consideration. The last words of the intelligence summation seemed almost superfluous. The advance of the ground forces would be very swift if the airborne operations were successful. Major Brian Urquhart was deeply disturbed by the optimism permeating General Browning's British One Airborne Corps headquarters. The 25-year-old intelligence chief felt that he was probably the only one on the staff with any doubts about Market Garden. Urquhart, no relation to the British 1st Airborne Division Commander Major General Robert Urquhart, did not believe the optimistic estimates on enemy strength which arrived almost daily from Montgomery's 21st Army Command. By the morning of Tuesday, September 12th, with D-Day only five days away, his doubts about Market Garden amounted to near panic. His feeling had been triggered by a cautious message from General Dempsey's British 2nd Army headquarters. Quoting a Dutch report, Dempsey's intelligence staff warned of an increase in German strength in the Market Garden area, and spoke of the presence of 
battered panzer formations believed to be in Holland to refit. Admittedly, the information was vague, lacking any kind of confirmation Dempsey's report was not included in the latest intelligence summaries of either Montgomery's or Eisenhower's headquarters. Urquhart could not understand why. He had been receiving similar disquieting news from Dutch liaison officers at Corps headquarters itself, and like General Dempsey's staff, he believed them. Adding his own information to that received from Dempsey's command, Major Urquhart felt reasonably certain that elements of at least two panzer divisions were somewhere in the Arnhem area. The evidence was thin, the units were unidentified with strength unknown, and he could not tell whether they were actually being refitted or merely passing through Arnhem. Nevertheless, Urquhart, as he later recalled, was really very shook up. Ever since the inception of Operation Comet and its evolution into Market Garden, Major Urquhart's fears had been growing. Repeatedly, he had voiced his objections to the operation to anybody who would listen on the staff. He was, quite frankly, horrified by Market Garden, because its weakness seemed to be the assumption that the Germans would put up no effective resistance. Urquhart himself was convinced that the Germans were rapidly recovering, and might well have more men and equipment in Holland than anyone realized. Yet the whole essence of the scheme, as he saw it, depended on the unbelievable notion that once the bridges were captured, thirty corps' tanks could drive up this abominably narrow corridor, which was little more than a causeway, allowing no maneuverability, and then walk into Germany like a bride into a church. I simply did not believe that the Germans were going to roll over and surrender. At planning conferences, Major Urquhart became increasingly alarmed at what he saw as the desperate desire on everybody's part to get the airborne into action. There were constant comparisons between the current situation and the collapse of the Germans in 1918. Urquhart remembers that General Browning, perhaps reflecting Montgomery's views and those of several other British commanders, was thinking about another great breakthrough— it seemed to the worried intelligence officer that everyone around him thought the war would be over by winter, and the Arnhem attack might be the airborne's last chance of getting into action. Urquhart was appalled at the light-hearted metaphor. It was described as a party, used in reference to Market Garden, and in particular he was upset by General Browning's statement that the object of the airborne attack was to lay a carpet of airborne troops down over which our ground forces can pass. He believed that the single cliché had the psychological effect of lulling many commanders into a passive and absolutely unimaginative state of mind, in which no reaction to German resistance apart from dogged gallantry was envisaged. He considered the atmosphere at headquarters so unrealistic that at one of the planning conferences he asked whether the carpet was to consist of live airborne troops or dead ones. It was absolutely impossible, he said later, to get them to face the realities of the situation. Their personal longing to get into the campaign before it ended completely blinded them. But young Urquhart was convinced that General Dempsey's warning was accurate. He believed there was German armor in the vicinity of Arnhem, but he needed to substantiate the report by getting more evidence. A Spitfire fighter squadron equipped with special cameras for taking oblique pictures was stationed, Urquhart knew, at nearby Benson in Oxfordshire. The squadron was currently searching out rocket sites along the Dutch coast. On the afternoon of September 12th, Major Urquhart requested low-level RAF reconnaissance sweeps of the Arnhem area. To avoid detection, enemy tanks would be hidden in forests or beneath camouflaged netting and might well escape high-altitude photographic flights. Urquhart's request was acknowledged, low-level missions would be flown over the Arnhem area, and he would get the results as fast as possible. Photographs of the tanks, if they were there, might prove to all concerned that Major Urquhart's fears were justified. There was too little time now for airborne division commanders to check out intelligence reports firsthand. They were dependent on Corps or First Allied Airborne Headquarters for the latest estimates. From experience, each commander knew that even this information would be several days old by the time he received it. Still, in the general view, there was little reason to anticipate any powerful enemy resistance. The risks involved in Market Garden were, as a result, considered acceptable. Once Generals Brereton and Browning had outlined the plan, determined the objectives, and decided on airlift capability, each commander developed his own combat plans. The choice of drop zones and landing sites had priority. 
From previous operations, veteran airborne commanders knew that the best chance of success depended on how close to their objectives assaulting troops could be dropped. Ideally, they should be landed almost on their targets or within quick marching distance, especially if they were expected to seize a bridge. With the meager ground transport available, the pinpointing of these sites was vital. Major General Maxwell D. Taylor was all too aware that his sites must be chosen for maximum effect. While Taylor would have the majority of his Screaming Eagle paratroops on D-Day, his engineering units, artillery, and most of the 101st transport would not arrive until D plus 1 and 2. Studying the southernmost part of the corridor where the 101st Airborne Division was to hold between Eindhoven and Weigel, Taylor quickly noted that over the 15-mile stretch of highway, his troops must capture two major canal crossings and no less than nine highway and railroad bridges. At Weigel, over the River R and the Willems Canal, there were four bridges, one a major canal crossing. Five miles south in St. Udenrode, a bridge over the Lower Dommel had to be seized. Four miles from there was the second major canal crossing over the Wilhelmina Canal near the village of Somme, and to the west a bridge near the hamlet of Best. Five miles farther south in Eindhoven, four bridges over the Upper Dommel had to be taken. After studying the flat terrain between Eindhoven and Weigel, with its veining waterways, dikes, ditches, and tree-line roads, Taylor decided to pinpoint his major landing site almost in the center of his assault area, by the edge of a forest barely one and one-half miles from Son, and roughly equidistant between Eindhoven and Weigel. He would land two of his regiments, the 502nd and the 506th, on this zone. The 502nd was charged with objectives in St. Udenrode and Best, the 506th with those in Son and Eindhoven. The 3rd Regiment, the 501st, was to land in two areas north and west of Weigel, within a few hundred yards of the vital four bridges. It was a formidable assignment for his men to accomplish on D-Day without their backup auxiliary units, but Taylor believed that, with luck, we can make it. The task of the 82nd Airborne was more intricate. Its ten-mile sector was wider than that of the 101st. In this central segment of the corridor, the huge, nine-span, 1,500-foot-long bridge over the Maas River at Hrava, and at least one of four smaller railroad and highway crossings over the maas Val Canal must be seized. The great bridge over the Val River at Nijmegen, almost in the center of this city of 90,000, was also a prime objective. None of these could be called secured unless the Grusbeek Heights dominating the area two miles southwest of Nijmegen were held. Also to the east was the great belt of forest along the German border, the Reichswald, where the Germans might assemble for attack. When General Gavin explained to his headquarters officers what was expected of them, his chief of staff, Colonel Robert H. Weinecke, protested, We'll need two divisions to do all that. Gavin was terse. There it is, and we're going to do it with one. Remembering the 82nd Airborne's attacks in Sicily and Italy, when his troops were scattered sometimes as far as 35 miles from their drop zone, the standard division joke was that we always use blind pilots. Gavin was determined to land his men this time almost on their targets. In order of priority, he decided that his objectives were first the Grusbeek Heights, second the bridge at Hrava, third the crossings on the maas Val Canal, and fourth the Val Bridge at Nijmegen. Because of probable quick enemy reaction, Gavin later recalled, I decided to drop the largest part of my paratroops between the Grusbeek Heights and the Reichswald. He chose two landing zones in the Grusbeek vicinity less than a mile and a half from the ridge itself, and three to four miles southwest of Nijmegen. There, his 508th and 505th regiments plus the headquarters staff would land. The 3rd Regiment, the 504th, was to drop on the western side of the Grusbeek Heights in the triangle between the Maas River and the Maas Val Canal, a mile from the eastern end of the Hrava Bridge and two miles west of the Maas Val Canal Bridges. To ensure the capture of the vital Hrava Bridge, which might be prepared for demolition, an additional phase of his plan was developed in which a company of the 504th was to be dropped a half mile from the western end of the bridge. Before the enemy could retaliate, the 504th would rush the bridge from both ends. 
Obviously, the great Nijmegen Bridge was the most important of all his objectives and crucial to the entire market garden operation, yet Gavin was well aware that without holding the other objectives, the Vaal River crossing by itself would be useless. General Browning agreed with him. If the first bridges were not taken or if the enemy held the Grusbeck Heights, the corridor for the garden forces would never be opened. Therefore, Browning specifically directed, Gavin was not to attempt an attack on the Nijmegen Bridge until the primary objectives were secured. Although he was concerned about the wide dispersal of his troops, Gavin was satisfied with the plan. One aspect bothered him, as it had bothered Taylor. His entire division would not be organically complete until supporting units arrived on D plus one and two, and he wondered how his men, who knew nothing about Market Garden as yet, would react. Still, in the experienced 82nd, morale was high as always. Many of his men had made three combat jumps already. Jumping Jim Gavin, at 37 the youngest brigadier general in the U.S. Army, had no doubts that his fugitives from the law of averages, as they called themselves, would do their job. The most difficult and dangerous assignment by far had been given to a modest, reticent career officer, Major General Robert Roy Urquhart, 42-year-old commander of the British 1st Airborne Division and the attached Polish Brigade. Unlike General Browning and his American colleagues, Urquhart, a highly professional soldier who had fought with great distinction in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, had no airborne warfare experience. He would be commanding an airborne division in battle for the first time. Browning had chosen him because he was hot from battle, but Urquhart had been surprised at his appointment. He had always considered airborne units tightly knit organizations, closed family affairs, and quite exclusive. Yet Urquhart had confidence in his ability to lead the elite unit. Once the force was on the ground, the basic fighting rules remained the same, and he viewed his airborne division as very highly trained infantry troops. Despite his long combat experience, Urquhart was bothered about one thing. He had never parachuted or been in a glider. I was even prone to air sickness, he was later to remark. On taking command in January 1944, nine months before, Urquhart had suggested to General Browning that perhaps, as the new division commander, he ought to have some parachute training. Browning, who impressed Urquhart as a lithe, immaculately turned-out man who gave the appearance of a restless hawk, answered that Urquhart's job was to get his division ready for an invasion of the continent. Looking over the six-foot, two-hundred-pound Scotsman, Browning added, Leave the parachuting to younger chaps. Not only are you too large, but you're getting on. At their first interview, Urquhart was still wearing his brigadier's badges and tight-fitting tartan trousers, trues, and spats of the Highland Division. As the meeting broke up, Browning, pointing to Urquhart's pants, said, You might also get yourself properly dressed and get rid of those trues. Throughout the long months of training, Urquhart often felt like an outsider, a kind of military landlubber. He was aware of being watched closely, not with hostility, though some airborne officers had reservations and a few did not bother to conceal them. I was on trial. My actions were being judged. It was an unenviable position, but one I accepted. Slowly, Urquhart's confident, assured handling of the division won over his officers— and among the troopers, Urquhart was far more popular than he knew. Private James W. Sims of the 1st Airborne Division's 1st Parachute Brigade remembers the General's supreme confidence and his calmness. Sergeant John Raitt of Division Headquarters had the impression that General Urquhart did whatever job had to be done. He didn't just ask someone else to do it. The General didn't stand on ceremony. Signalman Kenneth John Pierce called him a big, wonderful fellow. He called us son, or used our first names if he knew them. And from Sergeant Roy Ernest Hatch of the Glider Pilot Regiment, Urquhart earned the supreme compliment. He was, Hatch asserted, a bloody general who didn't mind doing the job of a sergeant. To Urquhart's frustration, his division had not been chosen for the Normandy invasion, and the summer passed interminably, planning one operation after another, only to see each cancelled. Now his red devils were hungering for a fight. They had almost given up. We were calling ourselves the Stillborn Division, recalls Major George S. Powell of the 4th Parachute Brigade. We figured we were being kept in reserve for use in the victory parade. 
as Urquhart saw it, there was a dangerous mixture of ennui and cynicism slowly creeping into our lives. We were trained to a fine edge, and I knew that if we didn't get into battle soon we would lose it. We were ready and willing to accept anything with all the ifs. Urquhart's principal target, the prize of Operation Market Garden, was Arnhem's concrete and steel highway bridge over the Lower Rhine. Additionally, Urquhart's men had two secondary objectives, a nearby floating pontoon bridge and a double-track railway crossing upriver two and a half miles west of the town. Urquhart's assignment presented a series of problems. Two were particularly worrisome. Reports of heavy anti-aircraft defences in the area indicated that some enemy units were massing in the vicinity of the Arnhem Bridge itself, and Urquhart was uneasy about the three days it would take to airlift his entire force of British and Polish paratroops to their objectives. Both these problems had a direct bearing on Urquhart's choice of landing sites. Unlike the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, he could not pick zones almost on or even close to the principal target. Ideally, he should land his forces near the Arnhem Bridge on both sides of the river, but Urquhart's terrain was by no means ideal. The north exit of the crossing ran directly into the densely populated built-up centre of Arnhem itself. Near the southern exit, low-level polder land was, according to reports, too marshy for men or gliders. Many of my own commanders, Urquhart remembers, were quite willing to land on the southern side, even though it was marshy. Indeed, some were ready to risk injury by parachuting on the northern side, on the town itself. In the previous week, bomber crews returning from other missions had reported a 30% increase in anti-aircraft fire near the Arnhem Crossing and from Dalen Airfield, seven miles to the north. Consequently, RAF commanders whose pilots were scheduled to tow Urquhart's glider-borne troops raised strong objections to landing zones close to the Arnhem Bridge. If sites were located near the southern exit, tug aircraft wheeling north after releasing gliders would run into heavy flak over the airfield. Turning south was almost as bad. Planes might risk collision with aircraft dropping the 82nd Airborne near Nijmegen, 11 miles away. Urquhart was confronted with a dilemma. He could insist that the RAF place his troops in proximity to the bridge, or he could choose drop zones much farther away, outside Arnhem itself, with all the dangers that choice entailed, delay, loss of surprise, possible German opposition. The risks were multiplied because on D-Day, Urquhart would have only a part of his division. My problem was to get enough men down on the first lift, Urquhart recalled, not only to seize the main bridge in the town itself, but also to guard and defend the drop zones and landing areas for the succeeding lifts. To seize the main bridge on the first day, my strength was reduced to just one parachute brigade. Faced with these restrictions, Urquhart appealed to Browning for extra planes. It seemed to him, he told the corps commander, that the Americans are getting all they need. Browning disagreed. The allocation of aircraft, he assured Urquhart, was entirely due to priorities and not to any high-level American pressure. The entire operation, he explained, had to be planned from south to north, bottom to top. Objectives in the southern and central sections of the corridor must be seized first to get the ground forces through, otherwise the first airborne would be wiped out. In his command caravan on the Moore Park golf course near the clubhouse that General Browning used as headquarters, Urquhart pored over his maps and pondered the situation. Some open sectors existed north of Arnhem in a national park, but these were too small and the terrain was unsuitable. At best, these spots might accommodate a small parachute force, but no gliders. The only alternative was to land in some broad expanses of open heaths and pasture land bordered by pine woods, 250 feet above sea level, lying west and northwest of Arnhem. The heathlands were firm and flat, perfect for gliders and parachutists. They were ideal in every way, except one. The areas lay between six and eight miles from the Arnhem Bridge. Faced with the RAF's continued opposition to a drop in the immediate vicinity of the bridge, Urquhart reluctantly decided on the distant sites. There was nothing else to do, he recalled, but to accept the risks and plan for them. I was left with no choice. Colonel George S. Chatterton, commanding the Glider Pilot Regiment, recalls that he wanted a coup de main, 
A force of five or six gliders to land near the bridge and take it. I saw no reason why we could not do it, but apparently nobody else saw the need for it, and I distinctly remember being called a bloody murderer and assassin for suggesting it. By September 12th, Urquhart had his plan ready. Outlined on the map were five landing and drop zones straddling the Arnhem-Amsterdam Railroad in the vicinity of Wolfhazer, approximately four miles northwest of Arnhem. Three sites lay north of Wolfhazer and two south, the southern zones together making up an irregular box-shaped tract more than a mile square. All were at least six miles away from the bridge at Arnhem. The farthest northwest of Wolfhazer was eight. On D-Day, two brigades would go in, Brigadier Philip Pip Hicks's 1st Air Landing Brigade scheduled to hold the drop zones, and Brigadier Gerald Lathbury's 1st Parachute Brigade, which would make a dash for Arnhem and its highway, railroad, and pontoon bridges. Leading the way would be a motorized reconnaissance squadron of jeeps and motorcycles. Urquhart was counting on Major C.F.H. Freddy Goff's highly specialized force of some 275 men in four troops, the only unit of its kind in the British Army, to reach the highway bridge and hold it until the main body of the brigade arrived. The next day, D. Plus One, Brigadier John Shan Hackett's 4th Parachute Brigade was due to arrive, together with the remainder of the Air Landing Brigade and on the third day Major General Stanisław Sosobowski's Polish 1st Parachute Brigade was to be landed. Urquhart had marked in a sixth drop zone for the Poles, because it was anticipated that by D plus 2 the bridge would be captured and the flak batteries knocked out, the Poles were to drop on the southern bank of the Lower Rhine near the village of Eldon, about one mile south of the Arnhem crossing. Despite the risks he must accept, Urquhart felt confident. He believed he had a reasonable operation and a good plan. Casualties, he thought, might be somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty percent. Considering the intricate nature of the attack, he did not think the cost was too high. In the early evening of September 12th, he briefed his commanders on the operation, and Urquhart remembers, everybody seemed quite content with the plan. One commander, however, had grave misgivings. Major General Stanisław Sosobowski, the trim 52-year-old leader of the Polish 1st Parachute Brigade, was quite sure that we were in for a bitter struggle. The former Polish War Academy professor had already stated his position to Generals Urquhart and Browning when he first heard about Operation Comet. At that time he had demanded that Urquhart give him his orders in writing so that I would not be held responsible for the disaster. With Urquhart, he had visited Browning and told him, This mission cannot possibly succeed. Browning asked why. As Sosobowski remembered, I told him it would be suicide to attempt it with the forces we had. And Browning answered, But, my dear Sosobowski, the Red Devils and the gallant Poles can do anything. Now, one week later, as he listened to Urquhart, Sosobowski thought, the British are not only grossly underestimating German strength in the Arnhem area, but they seem ignorant of the significance Arnhem has for the fatherland. Sosobowski believed that to the Germans Arnhem represented the gateway to Germany, and I did not expect the Germans to leave it open. He did not believe that troops in the area were of very low caliber, with only a few battered tanks sitting around. He was appalled when Urquhart told the assembled brigade commanders that the first airborne was to be dropped at least six miles from the objective. To reach the bridge, the main body of troops would have a five-hour march, so how could surprise be achieved? Any fool of a German would immediately know our plans. There was another part of the plan Sosobowski did not like. Heavy equipment and ammunition for his brigade was to go in by glider on an earlier lift. Thus his stores would be on a northern landing zone when his troops landed on the southern bank. What would happen if the bridge was not taken by the time the Poles landed? As Urquhart spelled out the plan, Sosobowski learned to his astonishment that if the bridge was still in German hands by that time, his Polish troops would be expected to take it. Despite Sosobowski's anxieties, at the September 12th briefing he remained silent. I remember Urquhart asking for questions, and nobody raised any, he recalled. Everyone sat nonchalantly, legs crossed, looking bored. I wanted to say something about this impossible plan, but I just couldn't. I was unpopular as it was, and anyway, who would have listened? 
Later, when the entire airborne operation was reviewed for all commanders at General Browning's headquarters, others had grave misgivings about the British part of the plan, but they too remained silent. Brigadier General James M. Gavin, commander of the American 82nd Airborne, was so astonished when he heard of Urquhart's choice of landing sites that he said to his operations chief, Lieutenant Colonel John Norton, My God, he can't mean it! Norton was equally appalled. He does, he said grimly, but I wouldn't care to try it. In Gavin's view, it was far better to take 10% initial casualties by dropping either on or close to the bridge than to run the risk of landing on distant drop zones. He was surprised that General Browning did not question Urquhart's plan. Still, Gavin said nothing, for I assumed that the British, with their extensive combat experience, knew exactly what they were doing. 2. SS Sturmbannführer Major Zepp Kraft did not intend to move again if he could avoid it. In the past few weeks his understrength SS Panzer Grenadier Training and Reserve Battalion had been ordered back and forth across Holland. Now, after only five days, the unit was being ordered out of the village of Osterbeek, and not by a superior of Kraft's, but by a Wehrmacht Major. Kraft protested vehemently. The main body of his three companies of men was billeted in the village with the rest in Arnhem, and another thousand SS recruits were due to arrive momentarily for training. The Wehrmacht Major was adamant. I don't care about that, he told Kraft bluntly. You've got to get out. Kraft fought back. The ambitious thirty-seven-year-old officer took orders only from his SS superiors. I refuse, he said. The Wehrmacht officer was not intimidated. Let me make things clear to you, he said. You're moving out of Osterbeek because Modell's headquarters is moving in. Kraft quickly calmed down. He had no wish to run afoul of Field Marshal Walter Modell. Still, the order rankled. Kraft moved, but not very far. He decided to bivouac his troops in the woods and farms northwest of Osterbeek, not far from the village of Wolfhazer. The spot he happened to choose was alongside the Wolfhazer Road, almost between the zones marked on maps in England for the men of the British 1st Airborne Division to land, and blocking the route into Arnhem itself. 3. Henri Knapp, Arnhem's underground intelligence chief, felt safe in his new role. To protect his wife and two daughters from complicity in his activities, he had left home four months earlier and moved a few blocks away. His headquarters were now in the offices of a general practitioner, Dr. Leo C. Braybart. The white-coated knap was now the doctor's assistant, and certain patients were messengers and couriers belonging to his intelligence network, forty men and women, and a few teenagers. Knapp's was a time-consuming and frustrating job. He had to evaluate the information he received and then pass it along by phone. Arnhem's resistance chief, Peter Kreif, had given Knapp three telephone numbers, each with twelve to fifteen digits, and told him to commit them to memory. Knapp never knew where or to whom he was calling. His instructions were to dial each number in turn until contact was made. Knapp has never learned who his contacts were, except that his reports were passed on to a top-secret unit known as the Albrecht Group. He knew the calls he made were long distance. At the time, Dutch telephone numbers consisted of four digits. A brilliant telephone technician named Nicolas Thieling de Bode devised a method for underground members under which, by using certain telephone numbers, they could bypass local switchboards and automatically call all over Holland. Gathering intelligence was even more complicated. Knapp's requests were passed down through the network chain, and he never knew what agent procured the information. If a report seemed dubious, Knapp investigated on his own. At the moment, he was intrigued and puzzled by several reports that had reached him about enemy activity in Oosterbeek. A German officer wearing staff insignia, Major Horst Schmerkel, had visited a number of stores in Renkum, Osterbeek, and Arnhem, and ordered a variety of supplies to be delivered to Osterbeek's Tafelberg Hotel. What Knapp found curious were the requisitions. Among them were hard-to-find foods and other specialty items which the Dutch population rarely saw anymore, 
such as Yeneva Gin. Additionally, German signalmen had been busy laying a welter of telephone cables to a number of hotels in the suburbs, including the Tafelberg. The conclusion Knapp felt was obvious. A high-ranking headquarters was moving into Osterbeek, but which one, who was the general, and had he arrived? It was even more important for Knapp to keep abreast of the enemy's strength in and around the Arnhem region. He knew there were other intelligence men sending back information in each town, and that he was only a small cog in a vast collection system. As a result, there was probably much duplication of effort. Nevertheless, everything was important, for what one cell might miss, we might pick up. Two weeks before, as he later recalled, there was almost no German strength in the Arnhem region. Since then, the military picture had changed dramatically. Now Knapp was alarmed at the German build-up. From his network sources over the previous seven days, Knapp had reported that the remains of several divisions, including panzer units, were in the process of reorganizing in and around Arnhem or were moving into Germany. By now, more specific news had come. His sources reported the presence of tanks north and northeast of Arnhem. Knapp believed that parts of at least one or even two panzer divisions were in the area, but their identity and exact location were so far not known. Knapp wanted details quickly. Urgently he passed the word to his network. He demanded more exact information on the panzer activity, and he wanted to know immediately the identity of the new occupant in the Tafelberg Hotel. Twenty-five-year-old Walter van der Kratz had never heard of Henry Knapp. His contact in the underground was a man he knew only as Janssen, who lived somewhere in Arnhem. Janssen had a new assignment for him, the Tafelberg Hotel. A high-ranking German officer had arrived, he was told, and van der Kratz was to see if any of the staff cars outside carried any identifying pennant or flag. If so, he was to report the colors and symbols on the standard. Van der Kratz had noticed an influx of German activity around the hotel. German military police and sentries had moved into the area. His problem was how to get through the sentries along the road, the Petersbergweg running past the Tafelberg. He decided to bluff his way through. As he made for the hotel, he was immediately stopped by a sentry. But I must get through, van der Kratz told the German. I work at the petrol station up the street. The German let him pass. Three other sentries gave him only a cursory glance. Then, as van der Kratz passed the Tafelberg, he quickly looked at the entrance and the driveway. None of the parked cars had any identifying markings, but near the front door of the hotel stood a checkerboard black, red, and white metal pennant, the insignia of a German army group commander. On the afternoon of Thursday, September 14th, Henry Knapp heard from his network, Several sources reported large formations of panzer troops, tanks, and armored vehicles encamped in a semicircle to the north of Arnhem. There were units at Bakebergen, Epsa, and along the Eisel River. There was even a startling report of twenty to thirty Tiger tanks. Exactly how many units were involved he was unable to ascertain. He was able to clearly identify only one, and that by a fluke. One of his agents noted, strange markings, reverse Fs with a ball at the foot of them, on some tanks. Checking through a special German manual, Knapp was able to identify the unit. He immediately called his telephone contact and reported the presence of the 9th SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen. From the agent's report, Knapp located its position as lying approximately to the north between Arnhem and Appledorn, and from there eastward to Zutphen. Shortly afterward, he received word about the Tafelberg Hotel. He passed this report on, too. The significant black, red, and white checkerboard pennant told its own story. There was only one German army group commander in this part of the Western Front. Although Knapp reported the news as hearsay, it seemed to him the officer had to be Field Marshal Walter Model. 4. Twenty-five miles east of Osterbeek, at his two SS Panzer Corps headquarters in a small castle on the outskirts of Dutikum, General Wilhelm Bittrich held a meeting with his two remaining division commanders. Bittrich was in a bad mood, barely able to contain his temper. 
The outlook for his battered panzer corps was now far worse than it had been a week earlier. Impatiently, Bittrick had awaited replacements in men, armor, and equipment. None had arrived. On the contrary, his force had been whittled down even more. He had been ordered to send two combat groups to the front. One was with the German 7th Army trying to hold the Americans near Aachen. The other was dispatched to bolster General Kurt Student's 1st Parachute Army, after British tanks successfully breached the Albert Canal line, crossed the meurs esco Canal, and grabbed a bridgehead at Nerpelt, almost on the Dutch border. Now, at a time when the British were massing to renew their offensive, an attack that the intelligence chief at Army Group B called imminent, Bittrich had received through Field Marshal Model a crazy directive from the fools in Berlin. One of his shattered divisions was to be cannibalized and pulled back into Germany. A once ardent Nazi, Bittrich denounced the order acridly. He was sick and tired of Berlin's orders and the sycophants around Hitler who were indulging in all kinds of gimmickry. Courageous and able, Bittrich had spent most of his adult life in uniform. In World War I, he had served as a lieutenant in the German Air Force and had been twice wounded. Later, for a few years, he worked in a stockbroker's office. Then, rejoining the armed forces, Bittrich became a member of a secret German Air Force team, and for eight years taught flying to the Russians. When Hitler came to power, Bittrich joined the newly formed Luftwaffe, but in the mid-thirties he switched to the Waffen-SS, where promotion was faster. As a suspected war criminal, Bittrich spent eight years in prison after World War II. On June 22, 1953, he was found innocent and released. Waffen-SS commanders are difficult to locate and interview, but Bittrich and his officers were extremely helpful to me in setting the record straight on many hitherto unknown events in the Arnhem battle. Bittrich wanted me to clarify one minor matter relating to his personal life. In various British accounts, I have been described as a musician who hoped to be a conductor, he told me, but the authors have confused me with my brother, Dr. Gerhard Bittrich, an extremely talented pianist and conductor. In Normandy, Bittrich's faith in Hitler's leadership began to waver. He sided with Field Marshal Rommel against Hitler's insane fight-to-the-last-man philosophy. Once he confided to Rommel that, We are being so badly led from above that I can no longer carry out senseless orders. I have never been a robot and don't intend to become one. After the July 20th plot, when he learned that his former commander, Colonel General Eric Hoopner, as a conspirator, had been condemned to death by hanging, Bittrich raged to his staff that, This is the blackest day for the German army. Bittrich's outspoken criticism of Hitler's military leadership soon reached Berlin. As Bittrich later recalled, My remarks were reported to the chief of the SS, Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, and the name Bittrich was no longer mentioned around Hitler's headquarters. Only the near collapse of the German front in the West, a situation demanding Bittrich's kind of expertise, and the attitude of sympathetic commanders had saved him from being recalled. Even so, Himmler was still eager for me to return to Germany for a little talk. Bittrich had no illusions about Himmler's invitation, nor had Model. He was determined to keep Bittrich in the West, and flatly refused to entertain Himmler's repeated requests to send Bittrich home. Now the outraged Bittrich outlined Berlin's latest plan to the commanders of his divisions. SS Brigadefuhrer, Brigadier General Heinz Harmel of the 10th Frunzberg Division, and SS Obersturmbahnfuhrer, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Harzer of the 9th Hohenstaufen Division. Bittrich told Harzer, who had already learned something about the plan from Model's Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Hans Krebs, that his 9th Hohenstaufen Division was to entrain immediately for Germany, where it would be located near Siegen, northeast of Koblenz. Harmel's 10th Division was to remain in Holland. It would be refitted and brought up to strength in its present location, east and southeast of Arnhem, ready to be committed again. The 38-year-old Harmel, whose bluff heartiness had earned him the affectionate nickname of Der Alter Frunschberg from his men, was not pleased with the decision. It seemed to him that Bittrich was, as usual, showing preference for the Hohenstaufen division, perhaps because it had been his own before he became corps commander, and perhaps, too, because Harzer had been his chief of staff. Although he did not think Bittrich was consciously unfair, it always seemed to work out that the Hohenstaufen got the cushy jobs. 
His younger counterpart, 32-year-old Walter Harzer, was elated at the news, even though he thought the likelihood of getting Berlin leave seemed doubtful. Ideally, after refitting, he expected to have a brand-new Hohenstaufen division. Privately, too, the tough Harzer, his face marked by a saber scar, had high hopes now of achieving his ambition to be promoted to the rank befitting an SS division commander, Brigadier General. Still, as Bittrich outlined the entire plan, one segment was not to Harzer's liking. Although badly depleted, his division was still stronger than Harmel's. Instead of the usual 9,000 men, the Hohenstaufen had barely 6,000, the Frunsberg about 3,500. Harzer had close to 20 Mark V Panther tanks, but not all were serviceable. He did, however, have a considerable number of armored vehicles, self-propelled guns, armored cars, and 40 armored personnel carriers, all with heavy machine guns, some mounted with artillery pieces. Hamel's Frunsberg division had almost no tanks and was desperately short of all kinds of armored vehicles. Both divisions still had formidable artillery, mortar, and anti-aircraft units. To build up the Frunsberg division, which would remain behind, Bittrich said, Harzer was to transfer as much of his transportation and equipment as he could to Harmel. Harzer was skeptical. In my heart, Harzer later recalled, I knew damn well that if I gave over my few tanks or the armored personnel carriers to Harmel, they'd never be replaced. Harzer did not protest the decision, but he had no intention of giving up all his vehicles. Harzer had long ago learned to husband his division's resources. He had more vehicles than even Bittrich realized, including American jeeps he had captured during the long retreat from France. He decided to ignore the order by some paper maneuvering. By removing caterpillar tracks, wheels, or guns from his vehicles, he could make them temporarily unserviceable until he reached Germany. In the meantime, they would be listed on his armored strength returns as disabled. Even with the extra men and vehicles from Harzer's cannibalized division, Bittrich continued, the Frunsberg would still be under strength. There was only one way to stress the urgency of the situation to Berlin, by presenting the facts directly to SS operational headquarters. Maybe then replacements and reinforcements would be forthcoming, but Bittrich had no intention of visiting Berlin. Harmel was made the emissary to his surprise. I don't know why he chose me rather than Harzer, Harmel remembers, but we urgently needed men and armor, and perhaps Bittrich thought a general might carry more weight. The whole matter was to be kept secret from Field Marshal Modal, so as we were not expecting any trouble in the Arnhem area, it was decided that I would leave for Berlin on the evening of September 16th. The exchange of equipment between Harzer and Harmel and the move of the cannibalized Hohenstaufen division to Germany, Bittrich ordered, was to begin immediately. While the operation was in process, he added, Field Marshal Modal wanted small mobile attack groups to be readied as Alarmeinheiten, alarm units, which could be committed in case of emergency. As a result, Harzer privately decided that his best units would be entrained last. Bittrich expected the entire equipment transfer and move completed by September 22nd. Because six trains a day left for Germany, Harzer thought the task could be completed much earlier. He believed his last and best units could leave for the fatherland in just three more days, probably on the afternoon of September 17th. A demoralizing rumor was making the rounds. By September 14th, several senior German officers in Holland were saying that an airborne drop would take place. The talk originated from a conversation between Hitler's operations chief, Colonel General Alfred Jodl, and the commander-in-chief West, Field Marshal von Rundstedt. Jodl was concerned that the Allies might invade Holland from the sea. If Eisenhower followed his usual tactics, Jodl said, airborne troops would be dropped as a prelude to the seaborne attack. Von Rundstedt, though skeptical of the suggestion, he by contrast was convinced that paratroopers would be dropped in conjunction with an attack on the Ruhr, passed the information on to Army Group B's commander, Field Marshal Modal. Modal's view was the same as von Rundstedt's. Nevertheless, he could not ignore Jodl's warning. He ordered the German armed forces commander in Holland, the jittery Luftwaffe General Friedrich Christiansen, 
to dispatch units of his meager grab bag of Army, Navy, Luftwaffe and Dutch Waffen SS personnel to the coast. Since Yodel's call on September 11th, the scare had traveled down the various echelons of command, particularly through Luftwaffe channels. Although the invasion had so far failed to materialize, the fear of an airborne drop was still mounting. Everyone was speculating on possible sites. From their maps, some Luftwaffe commanders saw the large, open areas between the north coast and Arnhem as possible landing zones. Others, nervously awaiting the renewal of the British offensive into Holland from the bridgehead over the Meuse-Esco Canal at Neerpelt, wondered if paratroopers might be used in conjunction with that attack and dropped into the area of Nijmegen. On September 13th, Luftwaffe Colonel General Otto Desloch, commander of the 3rd Air Fleet, heard about Berlin's fears at von Rundstedt's headquarters in Koblenz. Desloch was so concerned that he telephoned Field Marshal Model the following day. Model, he recalls, thought Berlin's invasion scare was nonsense. The field marshal was so unconcerned that he invited me to dinner at his new headquarters in the Tafelberg Hotel in Osterbeek. Desloch refused. I have no intention of being made a prisoner, he told Model. Just before he hung up, Desloch added, If I were you, I would get out of that area. Model, Desloch remembers, merely laughed. At Dalen Airfield north of Arnhem, word of a possible airborne attack reached Luftwaffe fighter commander Major General Walter Grabmann. He drove over to Osterbeek for a conference with Model's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Hans Krebs. When Grabmann expressed the Luftwaffe's fears, Krebs said, For God's sake, don't talk about such things. Anyway, where would they land? Grabmann went to a map and, pointing to areas west of Arnhem, said, Anywhere here, the heath is perfect for paratroopers. Krebs, Grabman later recalled, laughed and warned me that if I continued to talk this way, I'd make myself look ridiculous. Holland's notorious police chief, SS Lieutenant General Hans Albin Rauter, heard the rumor too, possibly from his superior General Christiansen. Rauter was convinced that anything was possible, including an airborne attack. Rauter, chief architect of Nazi terror in the Netherlands, expected the Dutch underground to attack and the population to rise at any moment. He was determined to stamp out any kind of insurrection by the simple expedient of executing three Dutch nationals for each Nazi killed. Rauter had declared an emergency immediately after the German retreat and the stampede of Dutch Nazis to Germany two weeks before. His police had taken bitter revenge against anyone even remotely involved with the Dutch resistance. Men and women were arrested, shot, or sent off into concentration camps. Ordinary citizens fared little better. All travel between provinces was forbidden. More restrictive rules were imposed. Anyone found on the streets during curfew risked being fired on without warning. All over southern Holland, in anticipation of the British offensive, the Dutch were pressed into service as labourers digging trenches for the Wehrmacht. In Nijmegen, Rauter filled his workforce quota by threatening to throw entire families into concentration camps. Gatherings of any kind were forbidden. Where more than five persons are seen together, one of Rauter's posters warned, they will be fired on by the Wehrmacht, SS or police troops. Now, with the British attack from the south imminent and Berlin's warning of a possible air and sea attack in the north, Rauter's world was beginning to come apart. He was terrified. In the safety of his prison cell after the war, Rauter admitted to Dutch interrogators that, at the time, I was very nervous. I had to paralyze the resistance. Rauter was found guilty by a Dutch court on January 12, 1949, of a wide range of offences, including persecution of the Jews, deportation of inhabitants for slave labour, pillage, confiscation of property, illegal arrests, detentions, and the killing of innocent civilians as reprisals for offences against the occupying authorities. He was executed on March 25, 1949. Learning that Model was in Holland, Rauter decided to seek reassurance and set out for the Tafelberg Hotel. On the evening of September 14th, Rauter met with Model and his chief of staff, General Krebs. He was convinced, Rauter told them, that the Allies would now use airborne forces in southern Holland. He felt that it was the right psychological moment. Model and Krebs disagreed. 
Elite airborne formations, Model said, were too precious, their training too costly for indiscriminate use. The field marshal did indeed expect Montgomery to attack into Holland from Neerpelt, but the situation was not critical enough to justify the use of airborne troops. Also, since assault forces would be separated by three broad rivers to the south, he did not think that a British attack toward Arnhem was possible. Both Nijmegen and Arnhem were too far from the British forces. Besides, Modell continued, Montgomery was tactically a very cautious man. He would never use airborne forces in a reckless adventure. By the time the prisoner reached Major Friedrich Kieswetter's headquarters in the village of Driebergen, west of Osterbeek, on September 15th, the deputy chief of Wehrmacht counterintelligence in Holland knew a great deal about him. There was an ample file on slow-witted 28-year-old Christian Antonius Lindemans, better known because of his huge size, six foot three, two 260 pounds, as King Kong. Lindemans had been captured by a patrol near the Dutch-Belgian border in the no-man's land between the British and German lines. At first, because of his British battle dress, Lindemans was taken for a soldier, but at the battalion command post near Valkenswart, to the amazement of his interrogators, he demanded to see Lieutenant Colonel Hermann Gieskes, German spy chief in Holland and Kieswetter's superior. After a series of phone calls, Lindemann's captors were even more astonished to receive orders to drive the prisoner immediately to Driebergen. Lindemann's alone displayed no surprise. Some of his compatriots thought him to be a staunch member of the Dutch underground, but the Germans knew him in another capacity, as a spy. King Kong was a double agent. Lindemans had turned traitor in 1943. At that time he offered to work for Giskus in return for the release of his current mistress and younger brother Henk, arrested by the Gestapo as a member of the underground and said to be awaiting execution. Giskus had readily agreed, and ever since Lindemans had served the Germans well. His perfidy had resulted in the penetration of many underground cells and the arrest and execution of numerous Dutch and Belgian patriots. Although he was crude and boastful, given to wild, drunken excesses and possessed of an insatiable appetite for women, Lindemans had so far miraculously escaped exposure. However, many resistance leaders considered him a dangerous risk, unlike certain Allied officers in Brussels who were so impressed by King Kong that Lindemans now worked for a British intelligence unit under the command of a Canadian captain. In Gieskus's absence, Kieswetter dealt with Lindemans for the first time. He found the towering braggart who introduced himself to everyone in the office as the Great King Kong disgusting. Lindemans told the Major of his latest mission. The Canadian intelligence officer had sent him to warn underground leaders in Eindhoven that downed Allied pilots were no longer to be sent through the escape line into Belgium. Because the British were due to break out from the Neerpelt bridgehead toward Eindhoven, the pilots were to be kept hidden. Lindemans, who had spent five days coming through the lines, was able to give Kieswetter some details on the British build-up. The attack, he said flatly, would take place on September 17th. The imminence of the British move was hardly news. Kieswetter, like everyone else, had been expecting it momentarily. Lindemans also informed Kieswetter of another development— Coincidental with the British attack, he reported, a paratroop drop was planned beyond Eindhoven to help capture the town. After the war, some British newspapers charged that it was because Lindemans pinpointed Arnhem as the main airborne objective that the panzer divisions were waiting. Obviously, this is not so. Bittrich's corps reached its positions before Eisenhower and Montgomery met on September 10th and decided on Market Garden. Neither could Lindemans have known anything about the Arnhem attack or the massive dimensions of the operation. Again, Allied decisions on dates, placement of drop zones, etc., were made long after Lindemans left Brussels to cross the German lines. A second often-repeated story is that Lindemans was taken to Colonel General Kurt Student's headquarters at Wucht for questioning, and it has been suggested that the airborne expert correctly evaluated the report and gave the alert. Student flatly denies this allegation. It is a large, fat lie, he told me. I never met Lindemans. Indeed, I first heard of the whole affair in a prison camp after the war. Student adds, The truth is, nobody in the German command knew anything about the attack until it happened. Shortly after Market Garden, suspicion fell on Lindemans, and he was arrested by the Dutch. King Kong, the great Lothario, lived up to his reputation to the very end. 
In July 1946, 48 hours before his trial, Lindemans in a prison hospital was found unconscious with a prison nurse nearby. Both of them in a bizarre love pact had taken overdoses of sleeping pills. Lindemans died. The girl survived. The revelation made no sense to Kiesvetter. Why use paratroopers when the British Army could easily reach Eindhoven by itself? Perhaps because Lindemann's information seemed unrealistic, or more likely because of his antipathy toward King Kong, Kiesvetter told Lindemann's to continue on with his mission and then return to the British lines. Kiesvetter took no immediate action. He thought so little of Lindemann's information that he did not pass it on directly to Wehrmacht headquarters. He sent it instead through the Sicherheitdienst, SS Security and Intelligence Service. He also dictated a brief memorandum of his conversation with Lindemanns for Giskus, at the moment away on another assignment. Giskus, who had always considered King Kong reliable, would not receive it until the afternoon of September 17th. 5. Operation Market Garden was now less than 48 hours away. In his office, Lieutenant General Walter Bedell Smith, Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, listened to Schaeff's Intelligence Chief, British Major General Kenneth W. Strong, disclose his latest news with growing alarm. Beyond doubt, Strong said there was German armor in the Market Garden area. For days, Strong and his staff had been sifting and assessing every intelligence report in an effort to determine the whereabouts of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions. Since the first week in September, there had been no contact with the units. Both were badly cut up, but it was considered unlikely that they had been completely destroyed. One theory held that the units might have been ordered back into Germany. Now Dutch underground messages told a different story. The lost divisions had been spotted. The 9th and presumably the 10th SS Panzer divisions were in Holland, Strong reported to Smith, in all probability to be refitted with tanks. Exactly what remained of the units or their fighting capability no one could say, but there was no longer any doubt about their location, Strong reported. They were definitely in the vicinity of Arnhem. Deeply concerned about Market Garden, and in his own words, alarmed over the possibility of failure, Smith immediately conferred with the Supreme Commander. The British 1st Airborne Division, due to land at Arnhem, could not hold out against two armoured divisions, Smith told Eisenhower. To be sure, there was a question, a big question, about the strength of the units, but to be on the safe side, Smith thought that Market Garden should be reinforced. He believed two airborne divisions would be required in the Arnhem area. Presumably Smith had in mind as the additional unit the veteran British 6th Airborne Division, commanded by Major General Richard Gale, which had been used successfully during the Normandy invasion, but was not included in Market Garden. Otherwise, Smith told Eisenhower, the plan must be revised. My feeling, he later said, was that if we could not drop the equivalent of another division in the area, then we should shift one of the American airborne divisions, which were to form the carpet further north, to reinforce the British. Eisenhower considered the problem and its risks. On the basis of this intelligence report and almost on the eve of the attack, he was being urged to override Monty's plan, one that Eisenhower himself had approved. It meant challenging Montgomery's generalship and upsetting an already delicate command situation. As Supreme Commander, he had another option open. Market Garden could be cancelled, but the only grounds for such a decision would be this single piece of intelligence. Eisenhower had obviously to assume that Montgomery was the best judge of enemy strength before him and that he would plan accordingly. As Eisenhower explained to Smith, I cannot tell Monty how to dispose of his troops, nor could he call off the operation, since I have already given Monty the green light. If changes were to be made, Montgomery would have to make them. Still, Eisenhower was prepared to let Smith fly to 21st Army Group headquarters and argue it out with Montgomery. But L. Smith set out immediately for Brussels. He found Montgomery confident and enthusiastic. Smith explained his fears about the panzer units in the Arnhem area and strongly suggested that the plan might need revision. Montgomery ridiculed the idea. Monty felt the greatest opposition would come more from terrain difficulties than from the Germans. All would go well, he kept repeating, if we at Schaefe would help him surmount his logistical difficulties. He was not worried about the German armor. 
He thought Market Garden would go all right as set. The conference was fruitless. At least I tried to stop him, Smith said, but I got nowhere. Montgomery simply waved my objections airily aside. Even as Montgomery and Smith conferred, across the channel startling evidence reached British First Airborne Corps headquarters. Earlier in the day, fighters of the RAF's specially equipped photo reconnaissance squadron returning from The Hague had made a low-level sweep over the Arnhem area. Now in his office, Intelligence Officer Major Brian Urquhart took up a magnifying glass and examined five oblique angle pictures, an end-of-the-run strip from one of the fighters. Hundreds of aerial photographs of the Market Garden area had been taken and evaluated in the previous 72 hours, but only these five shots showed what Urquhart had long feared, the unmistakable presence of German armor. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, Urquhart later recalled. There in the photos I could clearly see tanks, if not on the very Arnhem landing and drop zones, then certainly close to them. Major Urquhart rushed to General Browning's office with the photographic confirmation. Browning saw him immediately. Placing the pictures on the desk before Browning, Urquhart said, Take a look at these. The general studied them one by one. Although Urquhart no longer remembers the exact wording, to the best of his recollection, Browning said, I wouldn't trouble myself about these if I were you. Then, referring to the tanks in the photos, he continued, They're probably not serviceable at any rate. Urquhart was stunned. Helplessly, he pointed out that the armor, whether serviceable or not, were still tanks, and they had guns. Looking back, Urquhart feels that, perhaps because of information I knew nothing about, General Browning was not prepared to accept my evaluation of the photos. My feeling remained the same, that everyone was so gung-ho to go that nothing could stop them. Urquhart was unaware that some members of Browning's staff considered the young intelligence officer almost too zealous. The show was about to begin, and most officers were anxious and eager to get on with it. Urquhart's pessimistic warnings irritated them. As one senior staff officer put it, his views were colored by nervous exhaustion. He was inclined to be a bit hysterical, no doubt brought on by overwork. Shortly after his meeting with Browning, Urquhart was visited by the Corps medical officer. I was told, Urquhart recalls, that I was exhausted. Who wasn't? and that perhaps I should take a rest and go on leave. I was out. I had become such a pain around headquarters that on the very eve of the attack I was being removed from the scene. I was told to go home. There was nothing I could say. Although I disagreed with the plan and feared the worst, still this was going to be the big show, and curiously, I did not want to be left behind. 6. By noon on Saturday, September 16th, the German proclamation was plastered on bulletin boards all over Arnhem. By order of the security police, the following is announced. During the night, an attack with explosives was made on the railroad viaduct at Schapsdrift. The population is called upon to cooperate in tracing the culprits of this attack. If they have not been found before 12 o'clock noon on Sunday, September 17th, 1944, a number of hostages will be shot. I appeal to the cooperation of all of you in order that needless victims be spared. The acting burgomaster, Lyra. In a cellar, leading members of the Arnhem Underground met in an emergency meeting. The sabotage of the railroad viaduct had been badly botched. Henry Knapp, the Arnhem intelligence chief, had not been happy about the mission from its inception. He felt that, at best, we were all rank amateurs when it comes to sabotage. In his view, it is far better to concentrate on feeding intelligence to the Allies and to leave demolition jobs to men who know what they are doing. The chief of the Arnhem Underground, 38-year-old Peter Kreif, asked for the others' opinions. Nicolas Tjaling de Bode voted that the members give themselves up. Knapp remembers thinking, this was a very steep price to pay, the lives of the hostages' innocent people for a small hole in a bridge. Heisbert Jan Newman was conscience-stricken. He had been involved along with Harry Montfroy, Albert Deuce, Tone van Dalen, and others in procuring the materials for the explosives and in planning the sabotage, and no one wanted innocent men to suffer. Yet what was to be done? Kreif heard everyone out, then he made his decision. The organization must stay intact, even though innocent people may be shot, he decreed.
Looking around at the assembled leaders, as Nicolas de Bode remembers, Kreif told them, No one will give himself up to the Germans, that's my order. Henry Knapp had a feeling of dread. He knew that if the Germans followed their usual procedure, ten or twelve leading citizens, doctors, lawyers and teachers among them, would be publicly executed in an Arnhem Square at noon on Sunday. 7. All down the Allied line of command, the evaluation of intelligence on the panzers in the Arnhem area was magnificently bungled. Schaeff's Intelligence Summary No. 26, issued on September 16th, the eve of Market Garden, containing the ominous warning that had caused General Bedell Smith's alarm, was disregarded. In part, it read, Ninth SS Panzer Division, and presumably the 10th, has been reported withdrawing to the Arnhem area in Holland. There, they will probably collect new tanks from a depot reported in the area of Cleves. The information, already discredited by Montgomery at his meeting with Smith, was now discounted by General Dempsey's British Second Army headquarters, the same headquarters that had originally noted the presence in Holland of battered panzer formations on September 10th. In the most serious blunder of all, Dempsey's intelligence staff on September 14th described the Germans in the Market Garden area as Weak, demoralized, and likely to collapse entirely if confronted with a large airborne attack. Now, in a complete reversal of their original position, they dismissed the presence of the panzers, because Dempsey's staff officers were unable to spot enemy armor on any reconnaissance photos. At 1st Allied Airborne Army Headquarters, General Brereton's Chief Intelligence Officer, British Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Tasker, was not prepared to accept Schaeff's report either. Reviewing all the information available, he decided there was no direct evidence that the Arnhem area contained much more than the considerable flak defenses already known to exist. Everyone, it seemed, accepted the optimistic outlook of Montgomery's headquarters. As the British 1st Airborne Corps' Chief of Staff, Brigadier Gordon Walsh, remembers, 21st Army Group Headquarters was the principal source of our intelligence, and we took what they gave us to be true. General Urquhart, commander of the British 1st Airborne Division, put it another way. Nothing, he said, was allowed to mar the optimism prevailing across the Channel. Yet, besides Schaeff's report on the missing panzers, there was other evidence of German build-up, again almost cursorily noted. At the front, ahead of General Horrocks's 30 Corps Garden forces, it was plain that an increasing number of German units were moving into the line. Now the strategic error at Antwerp ten days before was beginning to build and threaten the grand design of Operation Market Garden. The German troops filling out General Student's front were none other than the units of the splintered divisions that had escaped across the mouth of the Skelder, the battered men of von Zangen's 15th Army, the army the Allies had practically written off. Intelligence officers did note that, though the Germans had increased in number, the new units in the line were believed to be in no fit state to resist any determined advance. Any British Tommy along the Belgium-Dutch frontier could have told them otherwise. British Major General Hubert Essame, retired, in his excellent book The Battle for Germany, writes, In misappreciation of the actual situation at the end of August and the first half of September, Allied intelligence staffs sank to a level only reached by Brigadier John Charteris, Haig's chief intelligence officer at the time of the Passchendaele battles in 1917. At that time, the wartime Prime Minister David Lloyd George alleged that Charteris selected only those figures and facts which suited his fancy, and then issued hopeful reports accordingly. At various times during the 1917 Flanders campaign, Charteris reported the enemy as cracking, mangled, with few reserves, and even on the run. In the dreadful battles that ensued around Passchendaele between July 31st and November 12th, casualties, according to the official British history, totaled a staggering 244,897. The cobblestone streets of the dingy mining town of Leopoldsburg in northern Belgium, barely ten miles from the front, were choked with jeeps and scout cars. All roads seemed to lead to a cinema opposite the railway station, and never before had the nondescript theatre held such an audience. Officers of Lieutenant General Horrocks's 30 Corps, the garden forces that would drive north through Holland to link up with the paratroopers, 
crowded the street and milled around the entrance as their credentials were inspected by red-capped military police. It was a colorful, exuberant group, and it reminded Brigadier Hubert Essame, commanding officer of the 214th Brigade, 43rd Wessex Infantry Division, of an army assembly at a point-to-point -point race or a demonstration on Salisbury Plain in time of peace. He was fascinated by the colorful dress of the commanders. There was a striking variety of headgear. No one had a steel helmet, but berets of many colors bore the proud badges of famous regiments, among them the Irish, Grenadier, Coldstream, Scotch, Welsh, and Royal Horse Guards, the Royal Army Service Corps, and Royal Artillery. There was a regal casualness about everyone's attire. Essame noticed that most commanders were dressed in snipers' smocks, parachutists' jackets, and jeep coats over brightly colored slacks, corduroys, riding breeches, or even jodhpurs. Instead of ties, many sported ascots or scarves of various colors. The renowned Lieutenant Colonel J. O. E. Joe Vandeleur, the solidly built, ruddy-faced six-foot commander of the Irish Guards Armoured Group, personified the kind of devil-may-care elegance of the Guards officers. The forty-one-year-old Vandeleur was wearing his usual combat garb, black beret, a multicolored camouflaged parachutist jacket, and corduroy trousers above high rubber boots. Additionally, Vandeleur wore, as always, a forty-five Colt automatic strapped to his hip, and tucked into his jacket what had become a symbol for his tankers, a flamboyant emerald green scarf. The fastidious General Boy Browning back in England would have winced. Even Horrocks had once dryly admonished Vandeleur, If the Germans ever get you, Joe, he said, they'll think they've captured a peasant. But on this September 16th, even Horrocks lacked the usual elegance of the impeccably dressed British staff officer. Instead of a shirt, he wore a ribbed polo sweater, and over his battle dress a sleeveless leather jerkin reminiscent of a British yeoman's dress. As the popular Horrocks made his way down the aisle of the crowded theatre, he was greeted on all sides. The meeting he had called had sparked high excitement. Men were eager to get going again. From the Seine to Antwerp, Horrocks's tanks had often averaged fifty miles in a single day, but ever since the disastrous three-day halt on September 4th to refit, refuel, and rest, the going had been rough. With the British momentum gone, the enemy had quickly recovered. In the two vital weeks since, the British advance had been reduced to a crawl. It had taken four days for the Guards' armoured division, led by Joe Vandeleur's Irish Guards group, to advance ten miles and capture the vital bridge over the Meurs-Esco Canal near Nerpelt, from which the attack into Holland would begin the next day. Horrocks had no illusions about the German opposition, but he was confident that his forces could break through the enemy crust. At precisely 11 a.m., Horrocks stepped onto the stage. All those assembled knew that the British offensive was about to be renewed, but so great was the security surrounding Montgomery's plan that only a few general officers present knew the details. With D-Day for Operation Market Garden barely 24 hours away, the field marshal's commanders now learned of the attack for the first time. Attached to the cinema screen was a huge map of Holland— Colored tapes snaked north along a single highway, crossing the great river obstacles and passing through the towns of Valkenswart, Eindhoven, Wegel, Uden, Nijmegen, and thence to Arnhem, a distance of some sixty-four miles. From there the tape continued for another thirty-odd miles to the Zyder Zee. Horrocks took a long pointer and began the briefing. "'This is a tale you will tell your grandchildren,' he told his audience." Then he paused, and much to the delight of the assembled officers, added, And mightily bored they'll be. In the audience, Lieutenant Colonel Curtis D. Renfro, liaison officer from the 101st Airborne Division and one of the few Americans present, was impressed by the Corps commander's enthusiasm and confidence. He talked for an hour, Curtis recorded, with only an occasional reference to notes. Step by step, Horrocks explained the complexities of Market Garden. The airborne army would go in first, he said, its objectives, to capture the bridges in front of Thirty Corps. Horrocks would give the word for the attack to begin. Depending on the weather, zero hour for the ground forces was expected to be 2 p.m. At that moment, 350 guns would open fire and lay down a massive artillery barrage that would last 35 minutes. 
Then at 2.35 p.m., led by waves of rocket-firing typhoons, 30 core tanks would break out of their bridgehead and blast down the main road. The Guards' Armoured Division would have the honour of leading the attack. They would be followed by the 43rd Wessex and 50th Northumberland Divisions, and then by the 8th Armoured Brigade and the Dutch Princess Irene Brigade. There was to be no pause, no stop, Horrocks emphasised. The guards' armoured was to keep going like hell all the way to Arnhem. The breakout from the bridgehead, Horrocks believed, would be almost immediate. He expected the first guards' tanks to be in Eindhoven within two or three hours. If the enemy reacted fast enough to blow all the bridges before the airborne troops could secure them, then the 43rd Wessex Infantry Division engineers coming up behind would rush forward with men and bridging equipment. This massive engineering operation, should it be required, Horrocks explained, could involve 9,000 engineers and some 2,277 vehicles already in the Leopoldsburg area. The entire 30-core armoured column was to be fed up the main road with the vehicles two abreast, 35 vehicles per mile. Traffic would be one way, and Horrocks expected to pass 20,000 vehicles over the highway to Arnhem in 60 hours. General Alan Adair, the 46-year-old commander of the famed Guards Armoured Division, listening to Horrocks, thought Market Garden was a bold plan, but he also believed it might be tricky. He expected the worst moment to be the breakout from the Meurs-Esco Canal bridgehead, once through that, although he fully expected German resistance, he thought the going would not be difficult. Besides, he had every faith in the unit that would lead off the attack, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Vandeleur's Irish Guards Group. Joe Vandeleur, as he learned that his tanks would spearhead the breakout, remembers thinking to himself, Oh Christ, not us again! Vandeleur was proud that his veteran unit had been chosen, yet he knew his troops were tired and his units under strength. Since the breakout from Normandy, he had received very few replacements in either men or tanks. Furthermore, they weren't allowing a hell of a lot of time for planning. But then he thought, how much time do you really need to plan for a straight bash through the German lines? Next to him, his cousin, 33-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandeleur, who commanded the 2nd Battalion under Joe, was struck with horror at the plan to blast through the German resistance on a one-tank front. To him it was not proper armoured warfare, but he recalls swallowing whatever misgivings I had and succumbing to a strange, tense excitement, like being at the pole at the start of a horse race. To three men in the theatre the announcement produced deep personal feelings. The senior officers of the Dutch Princess Irene Brigade had led their men in battle all the way from Normandy. First they had fought alongside the Canadians— then, after the fall of Brussels, they were transferred to the British Second Army. Now they would be coming home. Much as they looked forward to the liberation of Holland, the commander, Colonel Albert Staver de Reiter van Stevenink, his second-in-command, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Paillou de Mortange, and the Chief of Staff, Major Jonkheer Jan Bailerts van Blokland, had grave misgivings about the manner in which it was to be accomplished. Stevenink considered the entire plan risky. Mortange's impression was that the British were more off-hand about what lay ahead than the facts justified. As he put it, it was made to seem quite elementary. First we'll take this bridge, then that one, and hop the river. The terrain ahead with its rivers, marshes, dikes, and lowlands was extremely difficult, as the British well knew from our many presentations. The 33-year-old Chief of Staff, Bailarts van Blockland, could not help thinking of past military history. We seem to be violating Napoleon's maxim about never fighting unless you are at least 75% sure of success. Then the other 25% can be left to chance. The British were reversing the process. We were leaving 75% to chance. We had only 48 hours to get to Arnhem, and if the slightest thing went wrong, a bridge blown, stiffer German resistance than anticipated, we'd be off schedule. Blockland had a private worry, too— his parents lived in the village of Osterbeek, just two and a half miles from the Arnhem Bridge. One of the few officers below the rank of Brigade Major who heard the briefing was 21-year-old Lieutenant John Gorman of the Irish Guards. He was stimulated by the whole affair and thought Horrocks was at his finest. The Corps Commander, Gorman later recalled, called into play all his wit and humour, interspersing the more dramatic or technical points with humorous little asides— 
He really was quite a showman. Gorman was particularly pleased with Operation Garden because the guards were to lead out and obviously their role would be tremendously dramatic. When the meeting had ended and commanders headed out to brief their troops, young Gorman felt his first private doubts about the chances of success. Lingering in front of a map, he remembers thinking that Market Garden was a feasible operation, but only just feasible. There were simply too many bridges, nor was he enthusiastic about the terrain itself. He thought it was poor tank country, and advancing on a one-tank front we would be very vulnerable. But the promise of support from rocket-firing typhoons was reassuring. So was another promise of sorts. Gorman remembered the day months before when he had received the military cross for bravery from Montgomery himself. Gorman won his military cross during the fighting at Caen, Normandy. Leading a trio of Sherman tanks, he was suddenly confronted by four German tanks, one a sixty-ton Tiger. His men dispatched the German armor, and Gorman rammed the huge Tiger tank, destroyed its gun, and killed its crew as they tried to escape. At the investiture, Monty had said, If I were a betting man, I should say it would be an even bet that the war will be over by Christmas. And Horrocks, Gorman recalls, had told us that this attack could end the war. The only alternative Gorman could find to going north seemed to be a long, dreary winter camped on or near the Esco Canal. Monty's plan, he believed, had just the right amount of dash and daring to work. If there was a chance to win the war by Christmas, then I was for pushing on. Now, in the flat, grey Belgian countryside with its coal fields and slag heaps which reminded so many of Wales, the men who would lead the way for General Dempsey's British Second Army heard of the plan and the promise of Arnhem. Along side roads, in bivouac areas, and in encampments, soldiers gathered around their officers to learn the part they would play in Operation Market Garden. When Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandeleur told his officers that the Irish would be leading out, 29-year-old Major Edward G. Tyler remembers that a half-moan went up from the assembled officers. We figured, he recalls, that we deserved a bit of a break after taking the bridge over the Esco Canal, which we named Joe's Bridge after Joe Vandeleur, but our commanding officer told us that it was a great honor for us to be chosen. Despite his desire for a reprieve, Tyler thought so too. We were used to one-tank fronts, he remembers, and in this case we were trusting to speed and support. No one seemed worried. But Lieutenant Barry Quinan, who had just turned twenty-one, was filled with trepidation. He was going into action for the first time with the lead guard's armoured tank squadron under Captain Mick O'Cock. Quinan's infantry would travel on the backs of the tanks, Russian style. To him, the number of rivers ahead seemed ominous. We were not amphibious. Yet Quinan felt proud that his men would be leading the entire British Second Army. Lieutenant Rupert Mahaffey, also twenty-one, vividly remembers being told that if the operation was a success, the wives and children at home would be relieved from the threat of the Germans' V-2 rockets. Mahaffey's mother lived in London, which by that time was under intense bombardment. Although he was excited at the prospect of the attack, the single road leading all the way up to Arnhem was, he thought, an awfully long way to go. Captain Roland S. Langton, 23, just returned from five days in a field hospital after receiving shrapnel wounds, learned that he was no longer adjutant of the 2nd Irish Guards Battalion. Instead, he was assigned as second-in-command of Captain Mick O'Cock's breakout squadron. He was jubilant about the assignment. The breakout seemed to Langton a straightforward thing. Garden could not be anything but a success. It was obvious to all that the Germans were disorganized and shaken, lacking cohesion, and capable only of fighting in small pockets. Not everyone was so confident. As Lieutenant A.G.C. Tony Jones, 21 of the Royal Engineers, listened to the plan, he thought it was clearly going to be very difficult. The bridges were the key to the entire operation, and as one officer remarked, the drive of the Thirty Corps will be like threading seven needles with one piece of cotton, and we only have to miss one to be in trouble. To veteran guardsman Tim Smith, 24, the attack was just another battle. On this day, his greatest concern was the famed St. Ledger race at Newmarket. He had a tip that a horse called Tehran, to be ridden by the famous jockey Gordon Richards, was a sure thing. He placed every penny he had on Tehran with a lance corporal at battalion headquarters. 
If Market Garden was the operation that would win the war, this was just the day to win the St. Ledger. To his amazement, Tehran won. He was quite sure now that Market Garden would succeed. One man was decidedly uncomfortable. Flight Lieutenant Donald Love, 28, an RAF fighter reconnaissance pilot, felt completely out of place among the officers of the guards armored. He was part of the air liaison team which would call in the rocket-firing Typhoon fighters from the ground when the breakout began. His lightly armored vehicle, codenamed Wine Cup, with its canvas roof and its maze of communications equipment, would be up front close to Lieutenant Colonel Joe Vandeleur's command car. Love felt naked and defenseless. The only weapons the RAF team possessed were revolvers. As he listened to Vandeleur talking about a rolling barrage that would move forward at a speed of 200 yards per minute, and heard the burly Irishman describe Love's little scout car as an armored signal tender for direct communication with pilots in the sky, Love's concern mounted. I got the distinct impression that I would be the one responsible for calling in the cab rank of typhoons overhead. The thought was not reassuring. Love knew very little about the radio setup, and he had never before acted as a ground-to-air tactical officer. Then, to his acute relief, he learned that an expert, squadron leader Max Sutherland, would join him the following day to handle the communications for the initial breakout. Thereafter, Love would be in charge. Love began to wonder whether he should have volunteered in the first place. He had only taken the job because I thought it might be a nice change of pace. A change of a different sort bothered the commander of the Irish Guards. During the capture of the bridgehead over the Esco Canal, Joe Vandeleur had lost a close and distinguished friend. His broadcasting van, with its huge trumpet-like loudspeaker on the roof, had been destroyed by a German shell. All through training back in England and in the great advance from Normandy, Joe had used the van to broadcast to his troops, and after each session, being a lover of classical music, he had always put on a record or two, selections that didn't always please the guardsmen. The van had been blown to pieces, and shards of the classical records, along with Vandeleur's favorite popular tune, had showered down over the countryside. Joe was saddened by his loss, not so his Irish guardsmen. They thought the drive to Arnhem would be arduous enough without having to listen to Joe's loudspeaker blaring out his current theme song, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. Meanwhile, in England, the paratroopers and glider-borne infantry of the 1st Allied Airborne Army were even now in marshalling areas, ready for the moment of takeoff. Over the previous 48 hours, using maps, photographs, and scale models, officers had briefed and rebriefed their men. The preparations were immense and meticulous. At 24 air bases, 8 British, 16 American, vast fleets of troop-carrying aircraft, tow planes and gliders were checked out, fueled and loaded with equipment ranging from artillery to jeeps. Some 90 miles north of London, Brigadier General James M. Gavin's All-American 82nd Airborne Division was already shut off from the outside world at a cluster of airfields around Grantham in Lincolnshire. So were part of General Roy Urquhart's Red Devils, the British 1st Airborne Division, and Major General Stanislaw Sosobowski's Polish 1st Parachute Brigade. To the south, around Newbury, roughly 80 miles west of London, Major General Maxwell D. Taylor's Screaming Eagles, the 101st Airborne Division, were also sealed in. In the same area, and stretching as far down as Dorsetshire, was the remainder of Urquhart's division. The majority of his units would not move to the airfields until the morning of the 17th, but in hamlets, villages, and bivouac areas close to the departure points, they too made ready. Everywhere now the airborne forces of Market Garden waited out the time until takeoff and the historic invasion of Holland from the sky. Some men felt more concern at being sealed in than about the mission itself. At an airfield near the village of Ramsbury, the security precautions made Corporal Hansford Vest of the 101st Division's 502nd Regiment distinctly uneasy. Aircraft and gliders were parked for miles all over the countryside, and there were guards everywhere. He noted that the airfield was surrounded by a barbed wire fence with British guards on the outside and our own guards on the inside. Vest had the feeling that our freedom was gone. Private James Allardyce of the 508th Regiment in his crowded tent city tried to ignore the barbed wire and guards. 
He checked and rechecked his equipment until it was almost worn out. Allardyce could not shake off the feeling that we were like condemned men waiting to be led off. Other men worried principally about their chances of going on the mission. So many previous operations had been cancelled that one new recruit, 19-year-old Private Melvin Isenikov of the 506th Regiment, he had arrived from the States on June 6th, the day the 101st had jumped into Normandy, still didn't believe they would go when they reached the marshalling area. Isenikov felt he had trained long and hard for this, and I didn't want to be held back. Yet he almost was, trying to light a makeshift oil burner used for heating water, he threw a lighted match into an oil drum. When nothing happened, Isenikov put my head over it to look in, and it exploded. Temporarily blinded, he instantly thought, now I've done it, they won't let me go. However, within a few minutes his eyes stopped burning and he could see again, but he believes he was the only member of the 101st jumping into Holland with no eyebrows. First Sergeant Daniel Zapolsky, 24, of the 502nd, sweated out the jump, hoping the chute was packed right, hoping the field was soft, and hoping I didn't land in a tree. He was eager to go. Although he had not fully recovered from a Normandy leg wound, Zapolsky believed his injury was not serious enough to keep me from doing my normal duty. His battalion commander, the popular Lieutenant Colonel Robert G. Cole, disagreed. He had turned down Zapolsky's pleas. Undeterred, Zapolsky had bypassed Cole and obtained a written release certifying his combat readiness from the regimental surgeon. Though Zapolsky and Cole had fought together in Normandy, the sergeant now got a typical Cole chewing out. He called me a fat-headed Polak, impractical, burdensome, and unreasonable. But he let Zapolsky go. Captain Raymond S. Hall, the 502nd's regimental chaplain, had a somewhat similar problem. He was most anxious to return to action to be with my men, but he too had been wounded in Normandy. Now the doctors would not let him jump. He was finally told that he could go in by glider. The chaplain was horrified. A veteran paratrooper, he considered gliders distinctly unsafe. Fear of death or of failure to perform well disturbed others. Captain Legrand Johnson, 22-year-old company commander, remembering the horrors and narrow escapes during the 101st's night airborne attack preceding the Normandy invasion, was fatalistically resigned. He was convinced that he would not return from this mission. Still, the young officer fully intended to raise as much hell as I could. Johnson was not sure he liked the idea of a daylight drop. It might produce more casualties. On the other hand, this time, we would be able to see the enemy. To hide his nervousness, Johnson made bets with his fellow troopers on who would get the first Dutch beer. One of Johnson's staff sergeants, Charles Doan, was almost numb with worry. He did not know how to compare this daylight jump with Normandy or what to expect. Within forty-eight hours, his numbness forgotten, Staff Sergeant Doan would heroically save the life of the fatalistic Captain Johnson. Technical Sergeant Marshal Copus, 22, had perhaps more reason than most for anxiety. He was one of the pathfinders who would jump first to mark the drop zones for the 101st. In the Normandy drop, Copus recalled, we had forty-five minutes before the main body of troopers began jumping. Now we had only twelve minutes. Copus and his friend, Sergeant John Rudolph Brandt, 29, had one concern in common. Both would have felt better had General Patton's Third Army been on the ground below us rather than the British. We had never fought with the Tommies before. In the Grantham area, Private John Garcia, a veteran of three combat jumps with the 82nd Airborne Division, was stunned. To him, Market Garden was sheer insanity. He thought Ike had transferred to the German side. Now that Operation Market Garden was actually on, Lieutenant Colonel Louis Mendez, battalion commander of the 82nd's 508th Regiment, had no hesitation in speaking out on one particular subject. With the nighttime experiences of his regiment in Normandy still painfully clear in his mind, Colonel Mendez delivered a scathing warning to the pilots who would carry his battalion into action the next day. Gentlemen, Mendez said coldly, my officers know this map of Holland and the drop zones by heart, and we're ready to go. When I brought my battalion to the briefing prior to Normandy, I had the finest combat-ready force of its size that will ever be known. By the time I gathered them together in Normandy, half were gone. 
I charge you, put us down in Holland, or put us down in hell, but put us all down together in one place. Private First Class John Allen, 24, a three-jump veteran and still recovering from wounds sustained in Normandy, was philosophical about the operation. They never got me in a night jump, he solemnly told his buddies, so now they'll be able to see me and get off a good shot. Staff Sergeant Russell O'Neill, with three night combat jumps behind him, was convinced that his Irish luck was about to run out. When he heard the 82nd was to jump in daylight, he composed a letter he never sent. You can hang a gold star in your window tonight, Mother. The Germans have a good chance to hit us before we even land. To lighten the atmosphere, though in doing so he may have made it worse, Private Philip H. Nadler of the 504th Regiment spread a few rumors. The one he liked best was that a large German camp of SS men were bivouacked on one of the 82nd drop zones. Nadler had not been overly impressed by the briefing of the platoon. One of the 504th's objectives was the bridge at Hrava. Gathering the men around him, the briefing lieutenant threw back the cover on a sand table model and said, Men, this is your destination. He rested a pointer on the bridge which bore the single word Hrava, grave. Nadler was the first to comment. Yeah, we know that, Lieutenant, he said, but what country are we dropping on? Major Edward Wellams of the 504th 2nd Battalion thought the name of the bridge was rather ominous, too, despite the fact that the officers who briefed his group suddenly began to change the pronunciation, referring to it as the Gravy Bridge. The briefings caused mixed reactions. Nineteen-year-old Corporal Jack Bomber thought that six or eight weeks would see us home, and then they'd send us on to the Pacific. Private Leo Hart, 21, did not believe they were going at all. He had heard, probably as a result of Private Nadler's rumor, that there were 4,000 SS troops in the general jump area. Major Edwin Burdell, 38, remembers that one private's sole concern was the safety of a live hare that he had won in a local village raffle. The private was fearful that his pet, which was so tame that it followed him everywhere, would not survive the jump, and that if it did, it might still wind up in a stew pot. Near Spanhoe Airfield in the Grantham area, Lieutenant Pat Glover of the British 1st Airborne Division's 4th Parachute Brigade worried about Myrtle, a reddish-brown chicken that had been Glover's special pet since early summer. With parachute wings fastened to an elastic band around her neck, Myrtle, the para-chick, had made six training jumps. At first she rode in a small zippered canvas bag attached to Glover's left shoulder. Later he released her at fifty feet above the ground. By now Myrtle was an expert, and Glover could free her at three hundred feet. With a frenzied flutter of wings and raucous squawking, Myrtle gracelessly floated down to earth. There, Glover recalls, this rather gentle pet would wait patiently on the ground for me to land and collect her. Myrtle the parachick was going to Arnhem. It would be her first combat jump. But Glover did not intend to tempt fate. He planned to keep Myrtle in her bag until he hit the ground in Holland. Lance Corporal Sidney Nunn, 23, of the 1st Air Landing Brigade, based in the south near Kievel, was only too glad to get away from his pet. He thought the camp was a nightmare. Nunn couldn't wait to get to Arnhem or any place else, so long as it was far enough away from the persistent mole who kept burrowing into his mattress. For the men of the British 1st Airborne Division, now standing by in bases stretching from the Midlands south to Dorsetshire, the prevailing mood was one of relief that at last they were going into action. Besides, briefing officers stressed the fact that Market Garden could shorten the war. For the British, fighting since 1939, the news was heady. Sergeant Ron Kent of the 21st Independent Parachute Company heard that the success of the operation might even give us Berlin, and that ground opposition in Arnhem would consist mainly of Hitler youth and old men on bicycles. Sergeant Walter Inglis of the 1st Parachute Brigade was equally confident. The attack, he thought, would be a piece of cake. All the Red Devils had to do was hang on to the Arnhem Bridge for 48 hours until 30 core tanks arrived. Then the war would be practically over. Inglis expected to be back home in England in a week. Lance Corporal Gordon Spicer of the 1st Parachute Brigade offhandedly considered the operation a fairly simple affair with a few backstage Germans recoiling in horror at our approach, while Lance Bombardier Percy Parks of the 1st Air Landing Brigade felt after his briefing that 
All we would encounter at Arnhem was a mixed bag of jerry cooks and clerks. The presence of tanks, Parks says, was mentioned only in passing, and we were told our air cover would be so strong that it would darken the sky above us. Confidence was such that medic Geoffrey Stanners expected only a couple of hernia battalions, and signalman Victor Reed was looking forward to seeing German WAFs, who, he thought, would be the only Germans defending Arnhem. Some men who could legitimately remain behind were eager to go. Sergeant Alfred Roulier of the 1st Air Landing Brigade's artillery was one of these. The 31-year-old trooper discovered that he was not slated for the Arnhem operation. Although Roulier had been trained as an artilleryman, he was currently the acting mess sergeant at his battalion headquarters. Because of his culinary expertise, it appeared that he might spend the remainder of the war in the job. Twice, Alf Roulier had appealed to Sergeant Major John Seeley to be included in the attack, but each time he was turned down. For the third time, Alf pressed his case. I know this operation can shorten the war, he told Seeley. I've got a wife and two children, but if this attack will get me home quicker and guarantee them a better future, then I want to go. Seeley pulled a few strings. Alf Roulier's name was added to the list of those who would go to Arnhem, where within the next week the assistant mess sergeant would become something of a legend. In the prevailing high mood before the onset of Market Garden, there were undercurrents of doubt among some officers and enlisted men. They were troubled for a variety of reasons, although most took care to hide their feelings. Corporal Daniel Morgans of the 1st Parachute Brigade considered Market a snorter of an operation. Still, to drop six or seven miles from the objective and then to fight through a city to get there was really asking for trouble. Regimental Sergeant Major J.C. Lord, with a lifetime in the army behind him, thought so too. The plan was a bit dicey, he felt. Nor did Lord give much credence to the talk of an understrength, worn-out enemy. He knew that the German is no fool and a mighty warrior. Still, J.C. Lord, whose demeanor could intimidate even the veterans in his charge— almost in awe some called him Jesus Christ behind his back, did not reveal his uneasiness, because it would have been catastrophic to morale. Captain Eric Mackay, whose engineers were, among other tasks, to race to the main road bridge in Arnhem and remove expected German charges, was suspicious of the entire operation. He thought the division might just as well be dropped a hundred miles away from the objective as eight— the advantage of surprise and a quick lightning stroke would surely be lost. Mackay quietly ordered his men to double the amount of ammunition and grenades each would carry, and personally briefed everyone in the troop on escape techniques. Major Anthony Dean Drummond, 27, second in command of 1st Airborne Division Signals, was particularly concerned about his communications. Apart from the main command units, he was worried about the smaller 22 sets that would be used between Urquhart and the various brigades during the Arnhem attack. The 22s could best transmit and receive within a diameter of 3 to 5 miles. With drop zones 7 to 8 miles from the objective, performance was expected to be erratic. Worse, the sets must also contact General Browning's Airborne Corps headquarters, planned for Nijmegen, from the drop zones approximately 15 miles to the south. Adding to the problem was the terrain. Between the main road bridge at Arnhem and the landing areas was the town itself, plus heavily wooded sections and suburban developments. On the other hand, an independent fact-gathering liaison unit called Phantom, organized to collect and pass on intelligence estimates and immediate reports to each commander in the field, in this case General Browning of Airborne Corps, was not worried about the range of its own 22s. 25-year-old Lieutenant Neville Hay, in charge of the Phantom Team's highly trained specialists, was even a little disdainful of the Royal Corps of Signals, whom his group was inclined to treat as poor cousins. By using a special kind of antenna, Hay and his operators had been able to transmit at distances of over 100 miles on a 22. Even with Hay's success, and although various forms of communications would be used in the event of emergency, Dean Drummond was uneasy. Included in the communications set up were 82 pigeons provided from RAF sources. The lofts for these birds were situated in the London area, meaning that the birds, if they survived the airborne landing and the Germans, would have to fly approximately 240 miles to deliver a message. He mentioned to his superior, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Stevenson, that 
the likelihood of the sets working satisfactorily in the initial phases of the operation is very doubtful. Stevenson agreed. Still, it would hardly matter. In the surprise assault, troops were expected to close up on the Arnhem Bridge very quickly. Therefore, it was believed that units would not be out of touch with headquarters for more than one or two hours, by which time, Dean Drummond heard, things would have sorted themselves out, and Urquhart's command post would be with the 1st Parachute Brigade on the bridge itself. Although not entirely reassured, Dean Drummond recalled that, like almost everyone else, I was swept along with the prevailing attitude, don't be negative, and for God's sake, don't rock the boat, let's get on with the attack. Now the final word depended not on men, but on the weather. From Supreme Command headquarters down, senior officers anxiously awaited meteorological reports. Given less than seven days to meet Montgomery's deadline, Market Garden was as ready as it would ever be, but a minimum forecast of three full days of fair weather was needed. In the early evening of September 16th, the weather experts issued their findings. Apart from some early morning fog, the weather for the next three days would be fair, with little cloud and virtually no winds. At 1st Allied Airborne Army Headquarters, Lieutenant General Brereton quickly made his decision. The coded teleprinter message that went out to his commanders at 7.45 p.m. read, Confirm market Sunday 17th. Acknowledge. In his diary, Brereton recorded, At last we are going into action. He thought he would sleep well this night, for as he told his staff, Now that I've made the decision, I've quit worrying. In crowded hangars, cities of tents and Nissan huts, the waiting men were given the news. On a large mirror over the fireplace in the sergeant's mess of the British 1st Airborne Division signals near Grantham, someone chalked up, Fourteen hours to go, no cancellation. Sergeant Horace Hocker Spivey noted that as each hour passed, the number was re-chalked. To Spivey, tired of being briefed for operations that never came off, the ever-diminishing number on the mirror was the best proof yet that this time we were definitely going. On all their bases, the men of the 1st Allied Airborne Army made last-minute preparations. They had been fully briefed, their weapons had been checked, and their currency exchanged for Dutch guilders, and there was little now for the isolated troopers to do but wait. Some spent the time writing letters, celebrating their departure the following morning, packing personal belongings, sleeping, or participating in marathon card games ranging from blackjack and poker to bridge. Twenty-year-old Sergeant Francis Moncure of the 1st Parachute Brigade's 2nd Battalion played blackjack hour after hour. To his surprise, he won steadily. Looking at the ever-growing pile of guilders before him, Moncure felt like a millionaire. He expected to have a whale of a time in Arnhem after the battle, which in his opinion would last only forty-eight hours. That would be long enough for the sergeant to settle a score with the Germans. Seventy-two hours earlier, Moncure's brother, a seventeen-year-old RAF flight sergeant, had been killed in an attempt to jump from his disabled bomber at two hundred feet. His parachute had failed to open completely. South of Grantham at a base in Cotsmoor, Sergeant Joe Sunley of the 4th Parachute Brigade was on security patrol, making sure that no paratroopers had slipped off base into the village. Returning to the airdrome, Sunley saw Sergeant Ginger Green, a physical training instructor and a gentle giant of a man, tossing a deflated football up in the air. Green deftly caught the ball and threw it to Sunley. "'What the hell are you doing with this?' Sunley asked. Ginger explained that he was taking the deflated ball to Arnhem, so we can have a little game on the drop zone after we're finished. At Manston, Kent, Staff Sergeant George Bayliss of the Glider Pilot Regiment was also looking forward to some recreation. He had heard that the Dutch liked to dance, so George carefully packed his dancing pumps. Signalman Stanley G. Copley of the 1st Parachute Brigade Signals bought extra film for his camera. As little opposition was expected, he thought it was a perfect chance to get some pictures of the Dutch countryside and towns. One man was taking presents that he had bought in London a few days earlier. When the Netherlands was overrun, 32-year-old Lieutenant Commander Arnoldus Volters of the Dutch Navy had escaped in his minesweeper and sailed to England. Since that time, he had been attached to the Netherlands government in exile, holding a variety of desk jobs dealing with information and intelligence. 
A few days earlier, Volters had been asked to go to Holland as part of the military government and civil affairs team attached to General Urquhart's headquarters. It was proposed that Volters become military commissioner of the Netherlands territories to be liberated by the airborne forces. It was a startling suggestion, going from a desk chair to a glider, he recalled. He was attached to a unit under Colonel Hilary Barlow, second in command of the 1st Air Landing Brigade, who was designated to become the town commandant in Arnhem after its capture. Volters would be his assistant. Now, excited about the prospect of returning to Holland, Volters was struck by the optimism, and I believed everything I was told. I really did not expect the operation to be very difficult. It seemed that the war was virtually over and the attack dead easy. I expected to land on Sunday and be home on Tuesday with my wife and child at Hilversum. For his wife Maria, Volters had bought a watch, and for his daughter, whom he had last seen as a baby four years before, he had a two-foot teddy bear. He hoped nobody would mind if he took it in the glider. Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, 31, who was to lead the battalion assigned to capture the Arnhem Bridge, packed his copper fox-hunting horn with the rest of his battle gear. It had been presented to him by the members of the Royal Exodus Hunt, of which he was master in 1939-40. During training, Frost had used the horn to rally his men. He would do so on this operation. Frost had no qualms about a daylight jump. From the information given at briefings, we were made to feel that the Germans were weak and demoralized, and German troops in the area were of a decidedly low category and badly equipped. Frost did have misgivings about the drop zones. He had been told that the polder on the southern side of the bridge was unsuitable for parachutists and gliders. Why, then, he wondered, were the poles to drop on the southern side of the bridge, if it was so unsuitable? Though he was anxious to get into action, Frost hated to leave for Holland. Secretly, he hoped for a last-minute cancellation or postponement. He had enjoyed the area of Stoke Rochford in Lincolnshire, and wished for perhaps another day or two just doing all the pleasant things I had done in the past. But with these thoughts were others, telling me that we had been here long enough and it was time to get away. Frost slept soundly on September 16th. Although he wasn't naive enough to think the Battle of Arnhem would be much of a lark, he did tell his Batman Wicks to pack his gun, cartridges, golf clubs, and dinner jacket in the staff car that would follow. On the mirror above the fireplace in the sergeant's mess, now empty, there was one last notation, scrawled before men became too busy to bother. It read, Two hours to go. No cancellation. Part 3. The Attack 1. The thunder of the huge formations was ear-splitting. Around British glider bases in Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire, horses and cattle panicked and bolted in the fields. In southern and eastern England, thousands of people watched in amazement. In some villages and towns, road traffic jammed and came to a halt. Passengers in speeding trains crowded one another to stare out of windows. Everywhere people gaped, dumbfounded, at a spectacle no one had ever seen before. The mightiest airborne force in history was off the ground and heading for its targets. By coincidence, on this bright Sunday morning, September 17, 1944, special services were being held all over England to commemorate the valiant few— the handful of RAF pilots who had boldly challenged Hitler's Luftwaffe four years before and fought them to a standstill. As worshippers knelt in prayer, the steady, overpowering drone of propellers completely drowned out some services. In London's great Westminster Cathedral, the soaring organ tones of the solemn Magnificat could not be heard. In twos and threes, people left their pews to join the crowds already gathered in the streets. There Londoners stared upward, overwhelmed by the din as formation after formation of aircraft passed overhead at low altitude. In North London a Salvation Army band overpowered by the noise gave up, but the bass drummer, his eyes on the sky, thumped out a symbolic beat, three dots and a dash, in Morse code, V for victory. To the onlookers, the nature of the attack was clearly revealed by the great streams of planes towing gliders, 
but it would be six more hours before the British people learned that they had witnessed the opening phase of the most momentous airborne offensive ever conceived. A Red Cross worker, Angela Hawkins, may have best summed up the reactions of those who saw the vast armada pass. From the window of a train, she stared up astonished as wave after wave of planes flew over like droves of starlings. She was convinced that, this attack, wherever bound, must surely bring about the end of the war. The men of the first Allied Airborne Army were as unprepared as the civilians on the ground for the awesome spectacle of their own departure. The paratroopers, glider-borne infantry, and pilots who set out for Holland were staggered by the size and majesty of the air fleets. Captain R. E. D. Bestebroetje, a Dutch officer attached to the 82nd Airborne, thought the sight was unbelievable. Every plane the Allies possessed must have been engaged in this single scheme. In fact, some 4,700 aircraft were involved, the greatest number ever used on a single airborne mission. The operation had begun in the pre-dawn hours and continued on throughout the morning. First, more than 1,400 Allied bombers had taken off from British airfields and had pounded German anti-aircraft positions and troop concentrations in the Market Garden area. Then at 9.45 a.m., and for two and one quarter hours more, 2,023 troop-carrying planes, gliders, and their tugs swarmed into the air from 24 U.S. and British bases. Many official accounts give 10.25 a.m. as the time when the first market aircraft left the ground. Perhaps they had in mind the departure of the Pathfinders, who arrived first. From an examination of logbooks and air controllers' time schedules, it is clear that the airlift began at 9.45 a.m. C-47s carrying paratroopers flew in long 45-plane formations. More C-47s and British bombers, Halifaxes, Stirlings, and Albemarles pulled 478 gliders. In seemingly endless sky trains, these huge equipment and troop-carrying gliders bounced behind their tow planes at the end of 300-foot-long ropes. Swaying among the smaller Horsa and Waco gliders were massive slab-sided Hamel cars, each with a cargo capacity of eight tons. They could hold a small tank or two three-ton trucks with artillery or ammunition. Above, below, and on the flanks protecting these huge formations were almost 1,500 Allied fighters and fighter bombers, British Spitfires, rocket-firing typhoons, tempests, and mosquitoes. U.S. Thunderbolts, Lightnings, Mustangs, and low-level dive bombers. There were so many planes in the air that Captain Neil Sweeney of the 101st Airborne Division remembered that it looked like we could get out on the wings and walk all the way to Holland. The British glider forces were the first to take off. Farther north on the Market Garden Corridor than the Americans, and with different requirements, General Urquhart needed the maximum in men, equipment, and artillery, especially anti-tank guns in the first lift, to capture and hold his objectives until the land forces could link up. Therefore the bulk of his division was glider-borne. 320 gliders carried the men, transport, and artillery of Brigadier Philip Pipps, Hicks's first air landing brigade. They would reach landing zones west of Arnhem a little after 1 p.m. Thirty minutes later, Brigadier General Lathbury's 1st Parachute Brigade in 145 troop-carrying planes would begin dropping. Because the unwieldy gliders and tugs were slower, 120 miles per hour versus 140 for the paratroop carrier planes, these immense sky trains, or serials as the airborne called them, had to be launched first. From eight bases in Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire, gliders and tugs rolled down runways and rose in the air at a launch rate never before attempted, one combination per minute. Forming up was especially intricate and dangerous. Climbing slowly to altitude, the planes headed west over the Bristol Channel. Then speed synchronized, the tugs and gliders echeloned to the right in pairs, turned back, flew over the takeoff bases, and headed for a marshalling point above the town of Hatfield, north of London. Even as the first British glider serials were forming up above the Bristol Channel, twelve British Stirling bombers and six U.S. C-47s began taking off at 10.25 a.m. for Holland. In them were U.S. and British Pathfinders, 
the men who would land first to mark landing and drop zones for the market forces. Simultaneously, the men of the U.S. 82nd Airborne and the paratroop elements of the British 1st Division took off from bases around Grantham, Lincolnshire, in 625 troop carrier planes and 50 C-47s towing gliders. With astonishing precision, the planes of the 9th Troop Carrier Command left the ground at 5 to 20 second intervals. In wave after wave, they rendezvoused above the town of March, Cambridgeshire, and from there set out in three parallel streams to cross the coast at Alborough. At the same time, from southern airfields around Greenham Common, the 101st Airborne took to the air in 424 C-47s plus 70 gliders and tugs. Forming up, they too passed over the traffic control point at Hatfield and flew east to cross the coast at Bradwell Bay. In immense triple columns, together at least ten miles across and approximately a hundred miles long, the vast armada swept over the English countryside. The 82nd Airborne and British 1st Division, en route to Nijmegen and Arnhem, flew along the northern track. A special serial of 38 gliders carrying General Browning's Corps headquarters bound for Nijmegen traveled with them. On the southern route, passing over Bradwell Bay, the 101st Airborne headed for its drop zone slightly north of Eindhoven. By 11.55 a.m., the entire force, more than 20,000 troops, 511 vehicles, 330 artillery pieces and 590 tons of equipment was off the ground. First Lieutenant James J. Coyle of the 82nd Airborne, looking down on the English countryside from an altitude of only 1,500 feet, saw nuns waving from the courtyard of a convent. He thought, the beautiful day and the nuns made a picture that had the quality of an oil painting. Waving back, he wondered if they could possibly know who we were and where we were going. For the majority of the airborne troops, the mood of the initial part of the journey across England was light-hearted. To Private Roy Edwards of the 1st Parachute Brigade, everything was so serene it was like going on a bus outing to the seaside. Private A. G. Warrender remembers that this was a perfect Sunday, a morning for a walk down a country lane and a pint at the local. The commanding officer of the Glider Pilot Regiment, Colonel George S. Chatterton, piloting the glider carrying General Browning, described the Sunday as an extremely fine day. It did not seem possible that we were taking off for one of the greatest battles in history. Chatterton was struck by Browning's entourage and equipment. With the general were his Batman, headquarters medical officer, cook, as well as his tent and personal jeep. Browning sat on an empty Worthington beer crate between the pilot and co-pilot, and Chatterton noted that he was immaculately dressed in a Barathea battle dress with a highly polished Sam Brown belt, knife-edge creased trousers, leather holster gleaming like glass, a swagger stick, and spotless grey kid gloves. The general, says Chatterton, was in tremendous form, because he realized he had reached one of the climaxes of his career. There was an air of immense gaiety. In another glider serial, the quiet Scot with the most difficult market garden assignment, the 1st Airborne Division's General Roy Urquhart, thought it was difficult not to feel excited that we were off at last. Yet the popular officer's mind, as always, was on his men and the job that lay ahead. Like Browning, he had an entourage. Now, looking down the length of the horse glider which was carrying his aide Roberts, Batman Hancock, the Reverend G. A. Pear, Padre of the Glider Pilot Regiment, a signaller, two military police, their motorcycles, and the general's jeep, Urquhart felt a pang of conscience. He thought of his paratroopers laden down with packs, guns, and equipment, crowded into heavy transport planes. Urquhart carried only a small shoulder pack, two hand grenades, a map case, and a notebook. He was bothered by his own comfort. Almost up to the moment of takeoff, Urquhart had been called on to make difficult decisions. Some hours before leaving, his chief of staff, Colonel Charles McKenzie, had received a telephone call from a senior American Air Force officer. Was the mental asylum at Wolfhazer to be bombed? The American, Mackenzie had reported, wanted a personal assurance from Urquhart that there were Germans in it and not lunatics, otherwise the Americans could not accept responsibility. 
The asylum was dangerously close to the division's assembly point, and Urquhart's staff believed it to be held by the Germans. Mackenzie had accepted responsibility. On your head be it, the American had replied. Urquhart had approved his chief of staff's action. I meant to be as prepared as possible, and that's all there was to it, he remembered. As Mackenzie was about to leave for his own glider, Urquhart had taken him privately aside. Look, Charles, he had told Mackenzie, if anything happens to me, the succession of command should be as follows, first Lathbury, then Hicks and Hackett, in that order. Urquhart's choice was based on experience. Everyone knew that Lathbury was my deputy, he later recalled. Hackett was senior in rank to Hicks, but he was much younger, and I was quite convinced that Hicks had more experience in handling infantry. My decision was no reflection on Hackett's ability to command. Perhaps, Urquhart reflected, he should have informed each of his brigadiers of his decision earlier, but he had frankly considered the whole question quite academic. The chance of the division losing both Urquhart and Lathbury was remote. Now, all decisions made, Urquhart idly watched, squadrons of fighters flashing past the glider trains. This was his first operational trip in a glider, and earlier he had taken a couple of air sickness pills. His throat was dry, and he had difficulty swallowing. He was conscious, too, that Hancock, my Batman, was watching me, a look of concern on his face. Like everyone else, he expected me to be airsick. Urquhart did not oblige. We were in a huge stream of aircraft, and I concentrated on impressions. We were committed. We had made a good plan. I still wished we could have gotten closer to the bridge, but I did not brood on it. In spite of the operational efficiency displayed in launching the giant armada, mishaps occurred almost immediately. Just before takeoff, the port wing of one glider was chewed off by the propeller of a Sterling bomber. No one was hurt. As the glider carrying Lieutenant Alan Harvey Cox of the Air Landing Brigade lumbered into the air, it ran into trouble. Low clouds obstructed the glider pilot's view, and he was unable to line up with the tail of his tug. The glider went in one direction, the plane in another, the tow rope threatening to loop the glider's wing and overturn it. Unable to realign with his tug, the glider pilot grabbed for the red-topped release lever and cast off. Cox's glider landed without damage in a hayfield at Sanford-on-Thames. A more bizarre incident occurred in a C-47 carrying the men of the 82nd Airborne, who sat facing each other on opposite sides of the plane. Five minutes after takeoff, Corporal Jack Bomber saw the cargo hatch directly behind the men facing me spring open. The force of air almost sucked the men through the hatchway into space. As they desperately hung on, recalls Bomber, the pilot did a beautiful tail flip and the hatch slammed shut. Lance Corporal Sidney Nunn, who was so anxious to leave his base near Kievel and the activities of the mole in his mattress, now felt lucky to be alive. After more than an hour of uneventful flight, his glider ran into cloud. Emerging from the cloud bank, the glider pilot saw that the tow rope had twisted itself around the port wing. Over the intercom to his tug, none heard the glider pilot say, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble. The next instant he cast off. We seemed to come to a dead stop in the air, none remembers. Then the glider's nose dropped, and we careened earthward with the tow rope streaming alongside like a broken kite string. Nunn sat petrified, listening to the wind screaming along the fuselage, hoping that the chains holding a jeep in the glider would take the strain. Then he heard the pilot warn them to, "'Brace up, blokes, here we come!' The glider hit the ground, bounced, hit once more, and came slowly to a stop." In the sudden silence, none heard the pilot ask, "'Are you blokes all right?' Everyone was, and the men were returned to Kievel to fly out in the second lift on September 18th. Others were not so fortunate. Tragedy struck one glider serial over Wiltshire. RAF Sergeant Walter Simpson, sitting in the plexiglass turret of a Sterling bomber, was watching the horser glider trailing along behind. Suddenly, the glider just seemed to part in the middle. It looked as if the back end just dropped off the front. Horrified, Simpson shouted to the captain, My God, the glider's coming apart! The tow rope broke, and the front of the glider sank like a rock falling to earth. The sterling left formation gradually lost height and turned back to locate the wreckage. The front half was spotted in a field. The tail was nowhere to be seen. 
Marking the spot, the crew returned to Kievel and drove by jeep to the crash location. There Simpson saw what appeared like a matchbox that had been stepped on. The bodies of the men had remained inside. Simpson had no way of estimating how many dead there were. It was just a mass of arms, legs, and bodies. By the time the last serials reached the English coast, the northern streams passing over the checkpoint at Alborough, the southern columns flying over Bradwell Bay, thirty troop and equipment-carrying gliders were down. Tug engine failure, broken tow ropes, and in places heavy clouds had caused the abortions. Although by military standards the operation had begun with eminent success, casualties were light and many of the men and most of the downed cargo would be flown in on later lifts, the losses were sure to hurt. On this vital day, when every man, vehicle, and piece of equipment was important to General Urquhart, twenty-three of his glider loads were already lost. Not until the Arnhem Force reached its drop and landing zones would commanders discover just how crucial these losses would be. Now, as the long sky trains swarmed out over the English Channel and the land fell behind, a new kind of expectancy began to permeate the Armada. The Sunday outing mood was fast disappearing. As American serials passed over the seaside resort of Margate, Private Melvin Iskanev of the 101st Airborne saw the white cliffs of Dover off to the right. From the distance, they looked like the wintry hillsides of the Adirondacks near his home in Upper New York State. Corporal D. Thomas of the 1st British Airborne, staring out through an open plain door until his country's coastline disappeared, felt his eyes fill with tears. From the marshalling points at March and Hatfield, the airborne columns had been aided by various navigational devices, radar beacons, special hooded lights, and radio direction finding signals. Now beacons on ships in the North Sea began to guide the planes. Additionally, strings of launches, seventeen along the northern route, ten below the southern flight path, stretched away across the water. To Flight Sergeant William Thompson, at the controls of a plane towing a four-ton horser glider, there wasn't much navigating to do. The launches below us were set out like stepping stones across the channel. But these fast naval vessels were much more than directional aids. They were part of a vast air-sea rescue operation, and they were already busy. In the thirty-minute trip across the North Sea, men saw gliders bobbing on the grey waters as low-flying amphibious planes circled to mark their positions until rescue launches could reach the spot. Lieutenant Neville Hay of the Phantom Fact-Gathering Liaison Unit watched with complete detachment two downed gliders and another ditching. He tapped his corporal on the shoulder. "'Have a look down there, Hobkirk,' Hay shouted. The corporal glanced down, and as Hay remembers— I could almost see him turn green. Hay hurriedly reassured the man. There's nothing to worry about. Look at the boats already picking them up. Staff Sergeant Joseph Kitchener, piloting a glider, was equally impressed by the speed of the air-sea rescue launch that came alongside a floating glider he had spotted. They picked up the men so fast I don't even think they got their feet wet, he recalls. Men in a glider piloted by Staff Sergeant Cyril Lyne were less fortunate, but lucky to be alive. In an aerial train of swaying black horses, Line observed one combination drop slowly out of position. Mesmerized, he watched the horser cut loose and descend almost leisurely toward the sea. A ring of white foam appeared as it hit the water. He wondered who the poor devils were. At that moment, the starboard propellers on the Sterling pulling his glider slowed and stopped. As the plane's speed was reduced, Lyne found himself in the embarrassing position of overtaking my own tug. He immediately released the tow line, and his co-pilot called out, "'Stand by for ditching!' From behind, in the cabin, they could hear rifle butts crashing against the side of the glider's plywood fuselage as the frantic passengers tried to open up an escape route. Rapidly losing altitude, Line looked back and was horrified to see that the desperate troopers had cut through the top of the glider and the sides were just beginning to go. Line screamed out, Stop that! Strap yourselves in! Then with a heavy thud, the glider hit the water. When Line surfaced, he saw the wreckage floating some thirty feet away. There was no sign whatever of the cabin, but every one of his passengers was accounted for. Within minutes, all were picked up. In all, eight gliders ditched safely during this first lift. 
Once they were on the water, the Air Sea Rescue Service, in a spectacular performance, saved nearly all crews and passengers. Once again, however, it was Urquhart's force that was whittled down. Of the eight gliders, five were Arnhem-bound. Apart from some long-range inaccurate shelling of a downed glider, there was no serious enemy opposition during the Channel crossing. The 101st Airborne Division, following the southern route which would bring it over Allied-held Belgium, was experiencing an almost perfect flight. But as the Dutch coastline appeared in the distance, the 82nd and the British troopers in the northern columns began to see the ominous telltale grey and black puffs of flak, German anti-aircraft fire. As they flew on at an altitude of only 1,500 feet, enemy guns firing from the outer Dutch isles of Valcheren, North Beverland, and Scalven were clearly visible. So were flak ships and barges around the mouth of the Skelder. Escorting fighters began peeling out of formation, engaging the gun positions. In the planes, men could hear spent shrapnel scraping against the metal sides of the C-47s. Veteran paratrooper Private Leo Hart of the 82nd heard a rookie aboard his plane ask, Are these bucket seats bulletproof? Hart just glowered at him. The light metal seats wouldn't have offered protection against a well-thrown stone. Private Harold Brockley in another C-47 remembers one replacement wondering, Hey, what are all those little black and grey puffs below? Before anyone could answer, a piece of shrapnel came through the bottom of the ship and pinged harmlessly against a mess kit. Veteran troopers hid their fears in different ways. When Staff Sergeant Paul Noonan saw the familiar golf balls of red tracer bullets weaving up towards us, he pretended to doze off. Tracers barely missed Private Kenneth Truax's plane. No one said anything, he recalls. There was only a weak smile or two. Sergeant Bill Tucker, who had gone through anti-aircraft fire in Normandy, was haunted by a horrible fear of getting hit from underneath. He felt less naked, sitting on three Air Force flak jackets, and Private Rudolf Koss remembers that he felt like sitting on my helmet, but I knew I would need it on my head. One man was more concerned with the danger within than that without. Co-pilot Sergeant Bill Oakes, struggling to hold his horse glider steady in the air, looked back to see how his passengers were faring. To his horror, three troopers were calmly sitting on the floor, brewing up a mess tin of tea over a small cooker. Five others were standing around with their mugs, waiting to be served. Oakes was galvanized into action. He handed the controls over to the pilot and hurried aft, expecting the glider's plywood floor to catch fire at any minute. Or worse still, the mortar bombs in the trailer we were carrying could explode. The heat from that little field stove was terrific. He was livid with anger. We're just having a little brew up, one of the troopers told him soothingly. Oakes hurried back to the cockpit and reported the matter to the pilot, Staff Sergeant Bert Watkins. The pilot smiled. Tell him not to forget us when the tea's ready, he said. Oakes sank into his seat and buried his head in his hands. Although the escort fighters silenced most of the coastal flak positions, some planes were damaged, and one tug, its glider, and a troop carrier C-47 were shot down over Scalvan Island. The tug crash-landed and its crew was killed. The glider, an 82nd Airborne Waco, broke up in mid-air and may have been seen by Major Dennis Munford flying in a British column nearby. He watched aghast as the Waco disintegrated and men and equipment spilt out of it like toys from a Christmas cracker. Others saw the troop carrier go down. Equipment bundles attached beneath the C-47 were set on fire by tracer bullets. Yellow and red streamers of flame appeared in the black smoke, recalls Captain Arthur Ferguson, who was flying in a nearby plane. Within minutes the C-47 was blazing. First Lieutenant Virgil Carmichael, standing in the door of his plane, watched as paratroopers jumped from the stricken aircraft. As our men were using camouflaged chutes, I was able to count them as they left and saw that all had escaped safely. The pilot, although the aircraft was engulfed in flames, somehow kept the plane steady until the paratroopers jumped. Then Carmichael saw one more figure leave. The Air Corps used white parachutes, so I figured he had to be the crew chief. He was the last man out. Almost immediately the blazing plane nose-dived and at full throttle ploughed into a flooded area of Scalvan Island below. 
Carmichael remembers that, on impact, a white chute billowed out in front of the plane, probably ejected by the force of the crash. To First Lieutenant James Magellus, the sight of the downed C-47 had a terrible effect. As jumpmaster in his plane, he had previously told his men that he would give the command to stand up and hook up five minutes before reaching the drop zone. Now he immediately gave the order. In many other planes, jumpmasters reacted as Magellus had and gave similar commands. To them, the battle was already joined, and in fact, the drop and landing zones for the airborne men were now only thirty to forty minutes away. 2. Incredibly, despite the night's widespread bombing, and now the aerial attacks against Arnhem, Nijmegen, and Eindhoven, the Germans failed to realize what was happening. Throughout the chain of command, attention was focused on a single threat, the renewal of the British Second Army's offensive from its bridgehead over the Meuse-Esco Canal. Commanders and troops, myself and my staff in particular, were so overtaxed and under such severe strain in the face of our difficulties that we thought only in terms of ground operations, recalls Colonel General Kurt Student. Germany's illustrious airborne expert was at his headquarters in a cottage near Wucht, approximately twenty-one miles northwest of Eindhoven, working on red tape, a mountain of papers that followed me even into the battlefield. Student walked out onto a balcony, watched the bombers for a few moments, then, unconcerned, returned to his paperwork. Lieutenant Colonel Walter Harzer, commanding officer of the 9th SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen, had by now transferred as much equipment as he intended to his rival, General Heinz Harmel of the 10th SS Panzer Division Frunsberg. Harmel, on Bittrich's orders and without Model's knowledge, was by now in Berlin. The last flat cars containing Hartz's disabled armored personnel carriers were ready to leave on a 2 p.m. train for Germany. Having been bombed repeatedly from Normandy onward, Hartzer paid little attention to planes. He saw nothing unusual about the huge bomber formations over Holland. He and his veteran tankers knew it was routine to see bombers traveling east to Germany and returning several times a day. My men and I were numb from constant shelling and bombing. With Major Egon Schalke, the Ninth Panzer's chief medical officer, Hartzer set out from his headquarters at Bakebergen for the Hundelo Barracks, about eight miles north of Arnhem. In a ceremony before the 600-man reconnaissance battalion of the division, he would decorate its commander, Captain Paul Gravener, with the Knight's Cross. Afterward there would be champagne and a special luncheon. At two SS Panzer Corps headquarters at Dutigam, Lieutenant General Wilhelm Bittrich was equally unconcerned about the air attacks. To him, it was routine fare. Field Marshal Walter Model in his headquarters at the Tafelberg Hotel in Osterbeek had been watching the bomber formations for some time. The view at headquarters was unanimous. The squadrons of flying fortresses were returning from their nightly bombing of Germany, and as usual other streams of fortresses in the never-ending bombing of Germany were en route east heading for other targets. As for the local bombing, it was not uncommon for bombers to jettison any unused bombs over the Ruhr, and often as a result into Holland itself. Model and his chief of staff, Lieutenant General Hans Krebs, believed the bombardment and low-level strafing were softening up operations, a prelude to the opening of the British ground offensive. One officer was mildly concerned by the increased aerial activity over Holland. At the headquarters of OB West in Arenberg near Koblenz, approximately 120 miles away, Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, although he still believed that airborne forces would be used only in an attack against the Ruhr, wanted more information. In Annex 2227 of the morning report for September 17th, his operations chief recorded that von Rundstedt had asked Model to investigate the possibility that a combined sea and airborne invasion was underway against northern Holland. The notation read, The general situation and notable increase of enemy reconnaissance activities has caused the Commander-in-Chief West to again examine the possibilities of ship assault and air landing operations. Results of the survey are to be reported to OKW, Hitler. The message reached Modell's headquarters at about the time the first planes of the Armada crossed the coast.
Over Arnhem at 11.30 a.m., columns of black smoke rose in the sky as fires burned throughout the city in the aftermath of a three-hour near-saturation bombing. In Wolfhäser, Osterbeek, Nijmegen, and Eindhoven, whole buildings were leveled, streets were cratered and littered with debris and glass, and casualties were mounting minute by minute. Even now, low-level fighters were strafing machine gun and anti-aircraft positions all over the area. The mood of the Dutch, huddling in churches, homes, cellars, and shelters, or with foolhardy courage cycling the streets or staring from rooftops, alternated between terror and exultation. No one knew what to believe or what would happen next. To the south, 83 miles from Nijmegen, Maastricht, the first Dutch city to be liberated, had been entered by the U.S. First Army on September 14th. Many Dutch expected American infantry to arrive at any moment in their own towns and villages. Radio Orange, broadcasting from London, fed this impression in a flurry of bulletins. The time is nearly here. What we have been waiting for is about to happen at last. Owing to the rapid advance of the Allied armies, it is possible that the troops will not carry Dutch money yet. If our allies offer French or Belgian notes, cooperate and accept this money in payment. Farmers should finish off and deliver their harvest. Prince Bernhardt, in a radio message, urged the Dutch not to show joy by offering flowers or fruit when Allied troops liberate Netherlands' territory. In the past, the enemy has concealed explosives among offerings presented to the liberators. Uppermost in the minds of most Dutchmen was the certainty that these intensive bombings were the prelude to Allied invasion, the opening of the ground offensive. Like their German conquerors, the Dutch had no inkling of the impending airborne attack. Jan and Bertha Voskeil, taking shelter in the home of Voskeil's father-in-law in Osterbeek, thought the bombers in their area were aiming for Model's headquarters in the Tafelberg Hotel. The bright day, Voskyle remembers, was perfect bombing weather, yet he found it hard to reconcile the war that was coming with the smell of ripe beetroots and sight of hundreds of sunflowers, their stems bent under the weight of their great heads. It did not seem possible that men were dying and buildings burning. Voskyle felt strangely calm. From his father-in-law's front veranda he watched fighters flashing overhead and was sure they were strafing the hotel. Suddenly a German soldier appeared in the garden without helmet or rifle, and dressed only in a shirt and trousers. Politely he asked Voskyl, "'May I take shelter here?' Voskyl stared at the man. "'Why?' he asked. "'You have your trenches.' The German smiled. "'I know,' he answered, "'but they are full.' The soldier came up on the porch. "'It is a very heavy bombing,' he told Voskyl, "'but I don't think Osterbeek is the target. "'They seem to be concentrating more to the east and west of the village.' "'From inside the house Voskyl heard voices. "'A friend of the family had just arrived from the Wolfhäser area. "'It had been heavily hit, she told them, and many people were dead. "'I am afraid,' she said tremblingly. "'It is our last supper.' "'Voskyl looked at the German.' Perhaps they're bombing the Tafelberg because of Modal, he said mildly. The German's face was impassive. No, he told Voskyl, I don't think so. No bombs fell there. Later, after the soldier had gone, Voskyl went out to survey the damage. Rumors abounded. He heard that Arnhem had been heavily hit, and that Wolfhäser was almost leveled. Surely, he thought, the Allies were now under march and would arrive at any hour. He was both elated and saddened. Caen, in Normandy, he remembered, had been reduced to rubble during the invasion. He was convinced that Osterbeek, where he and his family had found shelter, would become a ruined village. Around Wolfhäser, German ammunition caches in the woods were exploding, and the famed mental institute had received direct hits. Four pavilions surrounding the administration building were leveled, forty-five patients were dead, the toll would increase to over eighty, and countless more were wounded. Sixty terrified inmates, mostly women, were wandering about in the adjoining woods. The electricity had failed, and Dr. Marius van Beek, the deputy medical superintendent, could not summon help. Impatiently, he awaited the arrival of doctors from Osterbeek and Arnhem, who he knew would surely hear the news and come. He needed to set up two operating theatres with surgical teams as quickly as possible. One of the inmates, Hendrik Weiburg, was in reality a member of the underground, hiding out in the asylum. 
The Germans, he recalls, were not actually inside the Institute at the moment, although they did have positions nearby and artillery and ammunition stored in the woods. During the bombings when the dump was hit, Weiburg, on the veranda of one building, was knocked to the floor. There was a huge explosion, he remembers, and shells from the dump began whizzing into the hospital, killing and injuring many. Weiburg hastily scrambled to his feet and helped nurses at the height of the strafing attacks to lay out white sheets forming a huge cross on the grass. The entire area had been so badly hit that it looked to him as if the place would soon be filled to the rafters with the dead and dying. In Arnhem, fire brigades fought desperately to bring the spreading flames under control. Dirk Hiddink, in charge of a fifteen-man outdated firefighting unit, his men pushed two carts, one loaded with coiled hoses, the other with ladders, was ordered to the German-occupied Willem's barracks, which had received direct hits from low-flying mosquitoes. Although the barracks were blazing, Hiddink's instructions from the Arnhem Fire Brigade headquarters were unusual. Let them burn down, he was told, but protect the surrounding houses. When his unit arrived, Hiddink saw that it would have been impossible to save the barracks in any case. The fires were too far advanced. From his father's apartment at Willem's Plain 28, Gerhardus Hispers saw everything around him engulfed in flames. Not only the barracks, but the nearby high school and the royal restaurant opposite were burning. The heat was so intense that Hispers remembers, the glass in our window suddenly became wavy and then melted completely. The family evacuated the building immediately, scrambling over bricks and lumber into the square. Hispers saw Germans stumbling from the blasted rubble of the barracks with blood pouring from their noses and ears. Streetcar driver Hendrik Carroll reached the Willems Plain unintentionally. With the electric power cut by the bombing, Carroll's pale yellow streetcar coasted down a slight incline to reach a stop at the square. There he found a jumble of other streetcars which, like his own, had coasted into the square and were unable to leave. Through the smoke, clouds, and debris, Carroll saw waiters from the Royal Restaurant make their escape from the burning building. Abandoning the few diners who were heading for the doors, the waiters jumped right through the windows. At the municipal gasworks just southeast of the Great Arnhem Bridge, technician Nicolas Unk admired the skill of the bombardiers. Looking across the Rhine, he saw that twelve anti-aircraft positions had been knocked out. Only one gun was left, but its barrels were twisted and bent. Now that the city was without electricity, Unk was faced with his own problems. The technicians could no longer make gas. After the fuel remaining in the three huge gasometers was exhausted, there would be no more. Aside from coal and firewood, Arnhem was now without electricity, heating, or cooking fuels. Thousands of people remained cloistered in their churches. In the huge Dutch Reformed Grote Kerk church alone, there were twelve hundred people, Sexton Jan Meinhardt remembers. Even though we had clearly heard the bombs exploding outside, he says, the Reverend Johann Heritzen had calmly continued his sermon. When the power was cut off, the organ stopped. Some one of the congregation came forward and began pumping the bellows manually. Then, against a background of sirens, explosions, and thundering planes, the organ pealed out, and the entire congregation stood up to sing the Wilhelmus, the Dutch national anthem. In the nearby Calvinist church near the Arnhem Railroad Station, Heisbert Newman of the Resistance listened to a sermon delivered by Domine Boat. Newman felt that even the intense bombing would not deter the Germans from carrying out their threat to execute civilian hostages sometime during the day in reprisal for the Resistance's attack on the viaduct. His conscience bothered him as he listened to Domine Boat's sermon on the responsibility for your acts toward God and your fellow man, and he decided that once the service had ended he would give himself up to the Germans. Leaving the church, Newman made his way through the littered streets to a telephone. There he called Peter Kreif and told the regional commander his decision. Kreif was blunt and to the point. Rejected, he told Newman. Carry on with your work. But Kreif's was not to be the final decision. Market Garden would save the hostages. In Nijmegen, eleven miles to the south, bombers had hit German anti-aircraft positions with such accuracy that only one was still firing. The great towering PGEM power station supplying electricity for the entire province of Gelderland had received only superficial damage, but high-tension wires were severed, cutting off power throughout the area. 
A rayon factory near the PGEM station was badly damaged and ablaze. Houses in many parts of the city had received direct hits. Bombs had fallen on a girls' school and a large Catholic social center. Across the Val in the village of Lent, a factory was destroyed and ammunition dumps exploded. In the city's air raid command post, the staff worked by candlelight. The air raid workers were more and more puzzled by the stream of reports piling in. Working at his desk in semi-darkness, Albertus Uyen registered the incoming reports and found himself growing more confused by the moment. The widespread bombings gave no clear picture of what was happening, except that all German positions on Nijmegen's perimeter had been attacked. The principal approaches to the city, Wahlbruch, St. Anna Strat, and Grosbeek were now blocked off. It almost seemed that an effort had been made to isolate the city. As in Arnhem, most people in Nijmegen sought shelter from the fighters continually strafing the streets, but Elias Broekkamp, whose house was not far from the Val Bridge, had climbed to the roof for a better look. To Broekkamp's astonishment, so had the personnel of the German town major's office, five houses from Broekkamp's. The Germans, Broekkamp remembers, looked very anxious. I looked obviously full of delight. I even remarked that the weather was lovely. Nurse Johanna Bremann watched Germans panic during the strafing. From a second-floor window of an apartment building south of the Val Bridge, Nurse Bremann looked down at wounded German soldiers helping each other along. Some were limping quite badly, and I could see many with bandages. Their tunics were open, and most had not even bothered to put their helmets on. On their heels came German infantrymen. As they headed towards the bridge, they fired into the windows whenever they saw Dutch peering out. When the Germans reached the bridge approaches, they began digging foxholes. They dug everywhere, Miss Bremen remembers, next to the street leading up to the bridge, in grassy areas nearby and beneath trees. I was sure the invasion was coming, and I remember thinking, what a beautiful view of the battle we shall have from here. I had a feeling of expectancy. Nurse Bremen's expectations did not include her marriage some months later to Master Sergeant Charles Mason of the 82nd, who would land in Glider 13 near the Grosbeek Heights, two miles southwest of her apartment. Some towns and villages on the edges of the major market garden objectives suffered damage as severe as the principal targets, and had little if any rescue services. Close by the hamlet of Zeilst, approximately five miles west of Eindhoven, Gerardus de Witt had taken shelter in a beet field during the bombings. There had been no air raid alarm. He had seen planes high in the sky, and suddenly bombs rained down. De Witt, on a visit to his brother in the village of Veldhoven, four miles south, had turned around, pulled off the road, and dived into a ditch adjoining the field. Now he was frantic to get back to his wife and their eleven children. Although planes were strafing, De Witt decided to risk the trip. Raising his head to look across the field, he saw that even the leaves were scorched. Leaving his cycle behind, he climbed out of the ditch and ran across the open field. As he neared the village, he noted that bombs presumably intended for the Velschap airfield outside Eindhoven had fallen instead directly on Little Zeilst. De Witt could see nothing but ruins. Several houses were burning, others had collapsed and people stood about dazed and crying. One of de Witt's acquaintances, Mrs. Van Helmont, a widow, spotted him and begged him to come with her to cover a dead boy with a sheet. Tearfully, she explained that she could not do it herself. The child had been decapitated, but de Witt recognized the body as a neighbor's son. Quickly, he covered the corpse. I didn't look at anything more, he remembers. I just tried to get home as quickly as possible. As he neared his own house, a neighbor who lived opposite tried to detain him. "'I'm bleeding to death,' the man called out. "'I've been hit by a bomb splinter.' At that moment de Witt saw his wife Adriana standing in the street, crying. She ran to him. "'I thought you'd never get here,' she told him. "'Come quickly. Our tiny has been hit.' De Witt went past his injured neighbor. "'I never thought of anything but my son.' When I got to him, I saw that the whole of his right side was open, and his right leg was cut almost through. He was still fully conscious and asked for water. I saw that his right arm was missing. He asked me about his arm, and to comfort him I said, You're lying on it. As de Witt knelt by the boy, a doctor arrived. 
He told me not to hope any more, DeWitt remembers, because our son was going to die. Cradling the boy, DeWitt set out for the Duke Georges cigar factory, where a Red Cross post had been set up. Before he reached the factory, his fourteen-year-old son died in his arms. In all the terror, confusion, and hope, few of the Dutch saw the vanguard of the Allied Airborne Army. At approximately 12.40 p.m., twelve British Stirling bombers swept in over the Arnhem area. At 12.47, four U.S. C-47s appeared over the heaths north of Eindhoven, while two others flew across the open field southwest of Nijmegen, close to the town of Overasselt. In the plains were British and American pathfinders. Returning to his farm bordering Rencombe Heath less than a mile from Wolfhazer, Jan Pennings saw planes coming from the west flying low. He thought they had returned to bomb the railway line. He watched them warily, ready to dive for cover if bombs dropped. As the planes came over Rencombe Heath, the astounded Pennings saw bundles dropped and then parachutists coming out. I knew that in Normandy the Allies had used parachutists, and I was sure this was the beginning of our invasion. Minutes later, cycling up to his farm, Jan shouted to his wife, Come out! We're free! Then the first paratroopers he had ever seen walked into the farmyard. Dazed and awed, Pennings shook their hands. Within half an hour, they told him, hundreds more of us will arrive. Chauffeur Jan Palin, too, saw the Pathfinders land on Rencombe Heath. He recalls that they came down almost silently. They were well disciplined and immediately began to peg out the heath. Like other pathfinders north of the railway line, they were marking out the landing and dropping zones. Fifteen miles south, near the town of Overasselt, nineteen-year-old Theodorus Rulofs, in hiding from the Germans, was suddenly liberated by 82nd Airborne Pathfinders, who landed in the vicinity of the family farm. The Americans, he remembers, were scouts, and my big fear was that this small group of braves could easily be done away with. The Pathfinders wasted little time. Discovering that the young Dutchman spoke English, they quickly enlisted Rulofs to help as guide and interpreter. Confirming positions on their maps and directing them to the designated landing sites, Rulofs watched with fascination as the troopers marked the area with colored strips and smoke stoves. Within three minutes a yellow-paneled O and violet smoke clearly outlined the area. The four C-47s carrying the 101st Pathfinders to zones north of Eindhoven ran into heavy anti-aircraft fire. One plane load was shot down in flames. There were only four survivors. The other three planes continued on, and the Pathfinders dropped accurately on the 101st's two zones. By 12.54 p.m., dropping and landing zones throughout the entire Market Garden area were located and marked. Incredibly, the Germans still had not raised an alarm. At Hundelo Barracks, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Harzer, commander of the Hohenstaufen Division, toasted newly decorated Captain Paul Grebner. A few minutes before, Harzer had seen a few parachutes fall to the west of Arnhem. He was not surprised. He thought they were bailed-out bomber crews. In Osterbeek at the Tafelberg Hotel, Field Marshal Modell was having a pre-luncheon aperitif, a glass of chilled Moselle, with his Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Hans Krebs, the Operations Officer, Colonel Hans von Tempelhoff, and the Headquarters Adjutant, Colonel Leodegard Freiberg. As Administration's Officer, Lieutenant Gustav Zedelhauser remembers, whenever he was at the headquarters, the Field Marshal was punctual to a fault— we always sat down to luncheon at precisely 1,300 hours. That time was H hour for the market forces. 3. Now in tight formations, the great procession of C-47s carrying the 101st Airborne thundered across Allied-held Belgium. Some 25 miles beyond Brussels, the serials swung north heading for the Dutch border, then men in the plains looked down and for the first time saw their earthbound counterpart, the garden forces whose ground attack was to be synchronized with the air assault. It was a spectacular, unforgettable sight. The vast panoply of General Horrocks's Thirty Corps spread out over every field, trail, and road. Massed columns of tanks, half-tracks, armored cars, and personnel carriers, and line after line of guns stood poised for the breakout. 
On tank antennas, pennants fluttered in the wind, and thousands of Britishers standing on vehicles and crowding the fields waved up to the men of the airborne. Orange smoke billowing into the air marked the British front line. Beyond was the enemy. Skimming the ground, fighter bombers led the way to the drop zones, attempting to clear everything ahead of the formations. Even though the intense bombing that preceded the airborne assault had leveled many anti-aircraft batteries, camouflaged netting suddenly swung back to reveal hidden enemy positions. Some men remember seeing the tops of haystacks open to disclose nests of 88 and 20 mm guns. Despite the thoroughness of the fighter plane attacks, it was impossible to silence all enemy opposition. Just seven minutes away from their drop zones north of Eindhoven, the men of the 101st ran into intense flak. PFC John Sippler was dozing when he was suddenly awakened by the sharp crack of anti-aircraft guns and shrapnel ripped through our plane. Like everyone else, Sippler was so weighted down by equipment that he could hardly move. Besides his rifle, knapsack, raincoat, and blanket, he had ammunition belts draping his shoulders, pockets full of hand grenades, rations, and his main parachute plus reserve. In addition, in his plane, each man carried a landmine. As he recalls, a C-47 on our left flank burst into flames, then another, and I thought, my God, we are next. How will I ever get out of this plane? His C-47 was shuddering, and everyone seemed to be yelling at the same time, Let's get out! We've been hit! The jumpmaster gave the order to stand up and hook up. Then he calmly began an equipment check. Sipola could hear the men as they called out, One okay! Two okay! Three okay! It seemed hours before Sipola, the last man of the stick, was able to shout, Twenty-one okay! Then the green light went on, and in a rush the men were out and falling, parachutes blossoming above them. Looking up to check his canopy, Sipola saw that the C-47 he had just left was blazing. As he watched, the plane went down in flames. Despite the bursting shells that engulfed the planes, the formations did not waver. The pilots of the Nine Troop Carrier Command held to their courses without deviating. Second Lieutenant Robert O'Connell remembers that his formation flew so tight, I thought our pilot was going to stick his wing into the ear of the pilot flying on our left. O'Connell's plane was on fire, the red pre-jump warning light was on, and so much smoke was fogging the aisle that I could not see back to the end of my stick. Men were coughing and yelling to get out. O'Connell braced himself against the door to keep them in. The pilots flew on steadily without taking evasive action, and O'Connell saw that the formation was gradually losing altitude and slowing down preparatory to the jump. O'Connell hoped that, if the pilot thought the ship was going down, he would give us the green in time for the troops to get out. Calmly, the pilot held his flaming plane on course until he was right over the drop zone. Then the green light went on, and O'Connell and his men jumped safely. O'Connell learned later that the plane crash-landed, but the crew survived. In total disregard for their own safety, troop carrier pilots brought their planes through the flak and over the drop zones. Don't worry about me, Second Lieutenant Herbert E. Shulman, the pilot of one burning C-47, radioed his flight commander. I'm going to drop these troops right on the DZ. He did. Paratroopers left the plane safely. Moments later it crashed in flames. Staff Sergeant Charles A. Mitchell watched in horror as the plane to his left streamed flame from its port engine. As the pilot held it steady on course, Mitchell saw the entire stick of paratroopers jump right through the fire. Tragedies did not end there. PFC Paul Johnson was forward next to the pilot's cabin when his plane was hit dead center and both fuel tanks caught fire. Of the sixteen paratroopers, pilot and co-pilot, only Johnson and two other troopers got out. They had to climb over the dead in the plane to make their jumps. Each survivor was badly burned, and Johnson's hair was completely seared away. The three came down in a German tank bivouac area. For half an hour they fought off the enemy from a ditch. Then, all three injured, they were overwhelmed and taken prisoner. Just as the green light went on in another plane, the lead paratrooper standing in the door was killed. He fell back on Corporal John Altamare. His body was quickly moved aside, and the rest of the group jumped. 
and as another stick of troopers floated to the ground, a C-47 out of control hit two of them, its propellers chopping them to pieces. Typically, the Americans found humor even in the terrifying approach to the drop zones. Just after Captain Cecil Lee stood to hook up, his plane was hit. Shrapnel ripped a hole through the seat he had just vacated. Nearby, a trooper shouted disgustedly, "'Now they give us a latrine!' In another plane, Second Lieutenant Anthony Borelli was sure he was paralyzed. The red light went on and everyone hooked up, except Borelli, who couldn't move. An officer for only two weeks and on his first combat mission, Borelli, who was number one in the stick, was conscious of all eyes on him. To his embarrassment, he discovered he had hooked his belt to the seat. Private Robert Boyce made the trip despite the good intentions of the division dentist who had marked him L.O.B., left out of battle because of his dental problems. With the intervention of his company commander, Boyce, a Normandy veteran, was permitted to go. Besides a bad tooth, he had other worries. Several new paratroop innovations, leg packs for machine guns, quick-release harness on some chutes, and combat instead of jump boots, made him and many other men nervous. In particular, the troopers were concerned that their shroud lines might catch on the buckles of their new combat boots. As his plane flew low in its approach, Boyce saw Dutch civilians below holding up two fingers in the V for victory salute. That was all Boyce needed. Hey, look, he called to the others. They're giving us two to one we don't make it. The odds against their ever reaching their drop zone seemed at least that high to many. Colonel Robert F. Sink, commander of the 506th Regiment, saw a tremendous volume of flak coming up to greet us. As he was looking out the door, the plane shuddered violently, and Sink saw a part of the wing tear and dangle. He turned to the men in his stick and said, "'Well, there goes the wing,' to Sink's relief. "'Nobody seemed to think much about it. They figured by this time we were practically in.' In plane number two, Sink's executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Chase, saw that their left wing was afire. Captain Thomas Mulvey remembers that Chase stared at it for a minute and then remarked mildly, I guess they're catching up on us. We'd better go. As the green light went on in both planes, the men jumped safely. The plane in which Chase was traveling burned on the ground. Sink's plane, with its damaged wing, is thought to have made the journey back to England safely. Similar intense flak engulfed the serials of the 502nd Regiment, and planes of two groups almost collided. One serial, slightly off course, strayed into the path of a second group, causing the latter to climb for altitude and its troopers to make a higher jump than had been planned. In the lead plane of one of the serials was the division commander, General Maxwell D. Taylor, and the 502nd's 1st Battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Cassidy. Standing in the doorway, Cassidy saw one of the planes in the group burst into flames. He counted only seven parachutes. Then fire broke out in another C-47 just off to the left. All the paratroopers jumped from it. Mesmerized by the blazing plane, Cassidy failed to notice that the green light was on. General Taylor, standing behind him, said quietly, "'Cassidy, the light's on.' Automatically, Cassidy answered, "'Yes, sir, I know it,' and jumped." Taylor was right behind him. To General Taylor, the 101st jump was unusually successful, almost like an exercise. In the initial planning, Taylor's staff had anticipated casualties as high as 30 percent. Of the 6,695 paratroopers who enplaned in England, 6,669 actually jumped. Despite the intense flak, the bravery of the C-47 and fighter pilots gave the 101st an almost perfect jump. Although some units were dropped from one to three miles north of the drop zones, they landed so close together that assembly was quick. Only two planes failed to reach the drop zone, and the 9 Troop Carrier Command took the brunt of all casualties by their heroic determination to get the troopers to their targets. Of the 424 C-47s carrying the 101st, Every fourth plane was damaged, and sixteen went down, killing their crews. Glider losses were heavy, too. Later, as these serials began to come in, only fifty-three of the original seventy would arrive without mishap on the landing zone near Son. Still, despite abortions, enemy flak, and crash landings, the gliders would eventually deliver nearly eighty percent of the men and seventy-five percent of the jeeps and trailers they carried. 
Because Market Garden was considered an all-British operation, few American correspondents were accredited to cover the attack. None was at Arnhem. One of the Americans attached to the 101st was a United Press reporter named Walter Cronkite, who landed by glider. Cronkite recalls that, I thought the wheels of the glider were for landing. Imagine my surprise when we skidded along the ground and the wheels came up through the floor. I got another shock. Our helmets, which we all swore were hooked, came flying off on impact and seemed more dangerous than the incoming shells. After landing, I grabbed the first helmet I saw, my trusty musette bag with the Olivetti typewriter inside, and began crawling toward the canal, which was the rendezvous point. When I looked back, I found a half-dozen guys crawling after me. It seems that I had grabbed the wrong helmet. The one I wore had two neat stripes down the back indicating that I was a lieutenant. Now Taylor's screaming eagles began to move on their objectives, the bridges and crossings over the vital fifteen-mile stretch of corridor ahead of the British ground forces. 4. Colonel General Kurt Student and his Chief of Staff Colonel Reinhardt stood on the balcony of the General's cottage near Wucht and simply stared, stunned like fools. Student remembers clearly that Everywhere we looked, we saw chains of planes, fighters, troop carriers, and cargo planes flying over us. We climbed onto the roof of the house to get a better idea of just where these units were going. Streams of planes seemed to be heading in the direction of Hrava and Nijmegen, and only a few miles to the south near Eindhoven and Son, he could clearly see troop carriers, one after the other, coming in and dropping paratroopers and equipment. Some aircraft flew so low that Student and Reinhardt instinctively ducked. On the grounds of the headquarters, our clerks, quartermasters, drivers, and signalmen were out in the open, firing with all sorts of weapons. As usual, there was no sign of our own fighter planes. Student was completely baffled. I could not tell what was happening or where these airborne units were going. In these moments, I never once thought of the danger of our own position. But Student, the paratroop expert, was filled with admiration and envy. This mighty spectacle deeply impressed me. I thought with reflection and longing of our own airborne operations, and I just said to Reinhardt, Oh, if ever I'd had such means at my disposal, just once to have this many planes. Reinhardt's feelings were very much in the present. Herr General, he told Student, we've got to do something. They left the roof and went back to Student's office. Only the previous evening, Student in his daily report had warned, heavy columns of traffic south of the Maas-Skelder Canal indicate an impending attack. The problem was, had it already begun? If so, then these airborne units were after the bridges around Eindhoven, Hrava, and Nijmegen. All the spans were prepared for demolition and protected by special engineer parties and security detachments. A bridge commander had been assigned to each crossing with strict orders to destroy the bridge in case of attack. The obvious move for the Allies, it occurred to Student, was to use airborne troops in this situation to seize the bridges before we could destroy them. At this time, Student did not even think of the importance of the lower Rhine bridge at Arnhem. Get me modal, he told Reinhardt. Reinhardt picked up the phone to discover that the telephone lines were out. The headquarters was already cut off. In Osterbeek, some thirty-seven miles away at the Tafelberg Hotel, Lieutenant Gustav Zedelhauser, Modal's administration officer, was angry. "'Are you hung over from last night?' he shouted into a field phone. Unteroffizier Juppinger, one of the two hundred and fifty-man company which under Zedelhauser was assigned to protect Modal, repeated what he had said. At Wolfhäser, "'Gliders are landing in our laps,' he insisted. Zedelhauser slammed down the phone and rushed into the operations office, where he reported the message to a startled lieutenant colonel. Together they hurried to the dining room, where Modal and his chief of staff, General Krebs, were at lunch. "'I've just had news that gliders are landing at Wolfhäser, the colonel said. The operations officer, Colonel Tempelhoff, stared. The monocle fell out of Krebs's eye. "'Well, now we're for it,' Tempelhoff said." Modal jumped to his feet and issued a flurry of orders to evacuate the headquarters. As he headed out of the dining room to collect his own belongings, he shouted back over his shoulder, They're after me and this headquarters! Moments later, carrying only a small case, Modal rushed through the Tafelberg's entrance. 
On the sidewalk he dropped the case which flew open, spilling his linens and toilet articles. Krebs followed Modal outside in such haste that Zadelhauser saw he had even forgotten his cap, pistol, and belt. Tempelhoff had not even had time to remove the war maps in the operations office. Colonel Freiberg, the headquarters adjutant, was equally rushed. As he passed Zadelhauser, he shouted, "'Don't forget my cigars!' At his car, Modal told his driver, Frombeck, "'Quick! Duticum! Bittrich's headquarters!' Zedelhauser waited until the car drove off and then returned to the hotel. In the operations office he saw the war maps, showing positions all the way from Holland to Switzerland, still on a table. He rolled them up and took them with him. Then he ordered the Hartenstein Hotel and the Tafelberg immediately evacuated. All transport, he said, every car, truck, and motorbike is to leave here immediately. The last report he received before leaving for Duticum was that the British were less than two miles away. In all the confusion, he completely forgot Freiberg's cigars. 5. Surrounded by ground haze and the smoke and fire of burning buildings, the mighty British glider fleet was landing. Already the areas marked by orange and crimson nylon strips were beginning to look like vast aircraft parking lots. Blue smoke eddied up from the two landing zones, Ryer's Camp Farm to the north and Renkham Heath to the southwest, near Wolfhazer. From these zones, in chain after chain, tugs and gliders stretched back almost twenty miles to their approach point near the town of Sartogenbos, southwest of Nijmegen. Swarms of fighters protected these ponderous columns. Traffic was so dense that pilots were reminded of the rush-hour congestion around London's busy Piccadilly Circus. The serials, each group separated from the next by a four-minute interval, flew slowly over the flat, water-veined Dutch countryside. The landmarks pilots had been briefed to recognize now began to pass beneath them, the great wide rivers Maas and Waal, and up ahead the lower Rhine. Then, as each formation began its descent, men saw Arnhem off to the right, and their vital objectives, the rail and highway bridges. Incredibly, despite the RAF prediction of intense anti-aircraft fire, the immense glider cavalcade encountered virtually no resistance. The pre-assault bombings had been far more effective around Arnhem than in the Eindhoven area. Not a single tug or glider was shot down in making the approach. With clock-like precision, the skilled pilots of the RAF and the glider pilot regiment came over the zones. As gliders cast off, their tugs made climbing turns to free airspace for the combinations coming up behind. These intricate maneuvers and the heavy traffic were causing problems of their own. Sergeant Pilot Brian Tomlin remembers chaotic congestion over the landing zones. There were gliders, tugs, ropes, and all sorts of things in the sky, he recalls. You had to be on the lookout all the time. Staff Sergeant Victor Miller, piloting a horser, recalls coming in over the lower Rhine and finding it unbelievably calm. Beyond, he suddenly spotted his landing zone with its triangular-shaped woods and little farm nestling in the far corner. Seconds later, Miller heard the voice of his Sterling Tug's navigator, OK, Number Two, when you're ready. Miller acknowledged. Good luck, Number Two, the navigator told him. Miller immediately cast off. His tug disappeared, the tow rope flapping in its wake. It would be dropped, Miller knew, on the enemy as a parting gift before the Sterling turned onto its homeward course. The glider's airspeed fell off and the field loomed nearer. Miller called for half flaps and his co-pilot, Sergeant Tom Hollingsworth, instantly pushed a lever. For a moment the glider bucked as the great flaps descending from underneath each wing braked against our speed. The landing zone, Miller estimated, was now less than a mile away. I reminded Tom to look out for gliders on his side. One slid across and above us less than fifty yards away, and to Miller's amazement, swung in on the same course. Another glider seemed to be drifting into us from starboard. I don't think the pilot even saw us. He was so intent on getting down in the field. To avoid collision, Miller deliberately dived under the incoming glider. A great black shape flashed over our cockpit, too close for my liking. I was concentrating so hard to set down in one piece that I never wondered if the enemy was firing at us, not that we could have done much about it. Miller continued his descent with treetops leaping toward our floorboards and past the wings. As the ground rushed up, another glider came alongside. 
I pulled back on the wheel, leveled, we hit once, bounced about three feet, and came down to stay. Tom had slammed on the brakes and we careened across the ploughed field. Then the wheels sank into soft soil and we ground to a halt fifty yards short of a heavy-looking line of trees. In the silence, after the continuous deafening roar of the slipstream, Miller heard the distant crackle of small arms fire. But my one thought was to get out of the glider before another crashed or landed on us. I was the last man out. I didn't even pause, but jumped straight through the ramp door and hit the ground of Holland, four feet below, rather hard. The glider in which signalman Graham Marples was riding circled and came back over its landing zone because of the congestion. But by then we had run out of wind, Marples remembers. I saw trees coming through the glider floor. They just ripped the floor to pieces, and the next thing I knew we nosed over and came down. I could hear everything breaking like dry twigs snapping. We landed squarely on our nose, but no one was hurt except for a few scratches and bruises. Later the pilot told Marples he had pulled up to avoid collision with another glider. Many gliders, having surmounted all the problems of the long trip, touched down to disaster. Staff Sergeant George Davis stood near his empty hawser and watched other gliders come in. One of the first to land, Davis had brought in thirty-two men of the first air landing brigade. He saw two gliders, almost side by side, bump across the landing zone and into the trees. The wings of both were sheared off. Seconds later, another hawser rumbled in. Its speed was such that Davis knew it would never be able to stop in time. The glider ploughed into the trees. No one got out. With his co-pilot, Staff Sergeant Williams, Davis ran to the glider and looked into the plexiglass-covered cockpit. Everyone inside was dead. A 75mm howitzer had broken from its chain mooring, crushing the gun crew and decapitating the pilot and co-pilot. Lieutenant Michael Dauncey had just landed his glider, carrying a jeep, trailer, and six gunners from an artillery battery, when he saw a huge eight-ton Hamel car touch down. The field was soft, he recalls, and I saw the nose of the Hamel car digging up earth in front of it. Weight and ground speed drove it deeper until the huge tail rose up in the air and the Hamel car flipped over on its back. Dauncey knew it was useless to try to dig them out. A horse's flat on top, but a Hamilcar's got a hump where the pilots sit, and we knew the pilots were finished. Making his approach in another Hamilcar, Staff Sergeant Gordon Jenks saw the same crash and immediately deduced that the ground ahead was too soft. Instantly he decided against landing in the field. I reckoned if we went into a dive right then, he remembers, we would have enough speed for me to hold her off the deck until we had cleared the fence and got safely into the next field. Jenks pushed the control column forward, dived, then leveled out a few feet above the ground. Easing the huge aircraft gently over the fence, Jenks put her down in the far field as lightly as a feather. All over the landing zones now the tails of gliders were being unbolted and swung back, and artillery pieces, equipment, stores, jeeps, and trailers were being unloaded. The men in Lance Corporal Henry Brooks' glider, like many others, found that the unloading maneuver was fine in theory, but more difficult in practice. There were eight pins with a protective wire holding the glider tail on, Brooke explained. Back in England, in practice exercises, you could always get the tail off and jeep and trailer out in two minutes flat. In action, it was different. We cut the wire and got the pins out, but the tail wouldn't budge. Brooke and the other troopers finally chopped it off. Lance Bombardier J.W. Crook was similarly frustrated, but a nearby jeep came to the aid of his men, and with its hawser yanked off the tail. All over the two zones men were beginning to salvage cargo from wrecked gliders. The crash of two giant Hamilcars was a serious loss. They contained a pair of seventeen-pound artillery pieces, plus three-ton trucks and ammunition trailers. But all of the fifteen seventy-five millimeter pack howitzers of the 1st Air Landing Light Regiment artillery arrived safely. Most men who came in by glider recall a strange, almost eerie silence immediately after landing. Then, from the assembly point, men heard the skirl of bagpipes playing blue bonnets. At about the same time, soldiers on the edge of Renkham Heath saw Dutch civilians wandering aimlessly through the woods or hiding in fright. Lieutenant Neville Hay of the Phantom Unit remembers that it was a sobering sight. Some were in white hospital gowns and seemed to be herded along by attendants. 
Men and women capered about, waving, laughing, and jabbering. They were obviously quite mad. Glider pilot Victor Miller was startled by voices in the woods. Then groups of weird white-clothed men and women filed past. It was only later that the troopers learned the strangely behaved civilians were inmates from the bombed Wolfhazer Psychiatric Institute. General Urquhart had landed at Renkham Heath. He, too, was struck by the stillness. It was, he recalls, incredibly quiet, unreal. While his chief of staff, Colonel Charles Mackenzie, set up the division's tactical headquarters at the edge of the woods, Urquhart headed for the parachute dropping zones four hundred yards away. It was nearly time for Brigadier Lathbury's first parachute brigade to arrive. From the distance came the drone of approaching aircraft. The bustle and activity all over the glider zones paused as men looked up to see the long lines of C-47s. Small arms and anti-aircraft fire during the paratroop drop was as limited and spasmodic as during the glider landings. At exactly 1.53 p.m. and for the next 15 minutes, the sky was filled with brilliant-colored parachutes as the 1st Brigade began jumping. Some 650 parapacks with bright yellow, red, and brown chutes, carrying guns, ammunition, and equipment, fell rapidly through the streams of troopers. Other supply chutes pushed out of the planes before the men jumped, floated down with a variety of cargo, including miniature foldable motorcycles. Many already overburdened paratroopers also jumped with large kit bags. In theory, these were to be lowered by a cord just before the men touched ground. Some of the packs broke away from troopers and smashed on the zones. Several contained precious radio sets. British Private Harry Wright jumped from an American C-47. As he fell through the air, he lost both his helmet and kit bag. He hit the ground very hard. Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant Robertson came running up. Wright's forehead was streaming blood. "'Were you hit by flak?' Robertson asked. Wright slowly shook his head. "'No, Sarge,' he said. "'It was that bloody yank. We were going too fast when we jumped.' Robertson applied a dressing, and then, to Wright's surprise, offered the injured man a pork pie from his haversack. "'I nearly died right then of the shock,' Wright recalls. First, Robertson was a Scot, and then, as a quartermaster, he never offered anyone anything.' Odd things seemed to be happening all over the drop zones. The first person Sergeant Norman Swift saw when he landed was Sergeant Major Les Ellis, who was passing by holding a dead partridge. The amazed Swift asked where the bird had come from. I landed on it, Ellis explained. Who knows, it'll be a bit of all right later on in case we're hungry. Sapper Ronald Emery had just slipped out of his chute when an elderly Dutch lady scuttled across the field, grabbed it up, and raced away, leaving the startled Emery staring after her. In another part of the field, Corporal Geoffrey Stanners, loaded down with equipment, landed on the top of a glider wing. Like a trampoline, the wing sprang up, flipping Stanners back into the air. He landed with both feet on the ground. Dazed after a hard fall, Lieutenant Robin Vlasto lay still for a few moments trying to orient himself. He was conscious of an incredible number of bodies and containers coming down all around me, and planes continued to pour out paratroopers. Vlasto decided to get off the drop zone quickly. As he struggled to get out of his harness, he heard a weird sound. Looking around, he saw Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, the 2nd Battalion's commander, walking past, blowing his copper hunting horn. Frost was also observed by Private James W. Sims. Sims had already gone through quite a day, even before he landed. Having always flown with the RAF, whose attitude Sims recalls was, "'Don't worry, lads, whatever it's like, we'll get you through,' Sims received quite a shock on seeing his American pilot. He was a lieutenant colonel with one of those soft hats. His flying jacket was hanging open, and he was smoking a big cigar. Our lieutenant saluted him quite smartly and asked if the men should move up to the front of the plane on takeoff. The American grinned. Why, hell no, lieutenant, Sims remembers him saying. I'll get this goddamn crate off the ground if I have to drag its ass halfway down the runway. Sims's officer was too startled to speak. Now, although he was fond of his colonel, Sims, watching Frost go by, had reached the limit of his patience. Surrounded by his equipment, he sat on the ground and muttered, There goes old Johnny Frost, a forty-five in one hand and that bloody horn in the other. 
All over the drop and landing zones where 5,191 men of the division had arrived safely, units were assembling, forming up, and moving out. General Urquhart couldn't have been more pleased. Everything appeared to be going splendidly. The same thought occurred to Sergeant Major John C. Lord. The veteran paratrooper recalls that this was one of the best exercises I'd ever been on. Everyone was calm and businesslike. But the reservations he had had before takeoff still bothered Lord. As he looked about, seeing the men assembling rapidly with no enemy to contend with, he remembers thinking, It's all too good to be true. Others had the same thought. As one group prepared to move off, Lieutenant Peter Stainforth heard Lieutenant Dennis Simpson say quietly, Everything is going too well for my liking. The man with the most urgent task on landing was 43-year-old Major Freddie Goff of the 1st Airborne Division Reconnaissance Unit. Leading a four-troop squadron in heavily armed jeeps, Goff was to make a dash for the bridge before Colonel John Frost's marching battalion reached it. Goff and his men parachuted in and then sought their ground transport, which was being flown in by glider. Quickly Goff located his second-in-command, Captain David Alsop, on the landing zone and received some bad news. The entire transport for one of the four units, approximately twenty-two vehicles, had failed to arrive, Alsop reported. Thirty-six of the three hundred and twenty gliders scheduled for Arnhem had been lost, and with them were lost the jeeps of Goff's A Troop. Nevertheless, both Goff and Alsop believed that there were enough vehicles to race for the Arnhem Bridge. Goff gave the order to move out. With his force whittled down, everything now depended on the reaction of the Germans. 6. In all the panic and confusion, the first German senior officer to raise the alert was General Wilhelm Bittrich, commander of the 2 SS Panzer Corps. At 1.30 p.m., Bittrich received his first report from the Luftwaffe communications net that airborne troops were landing in the Arnhem vicinity. A second report arriving minutes later gave the assault area as Arnhem and Nijmegen. Bittrich could not raise anybody at Field Marshal Model's headquarters at the Tafelberg in Osterbeek, nor was he able to contact either the town commander of Arnhem or General Student at his headquarters in Wucht. Although the situation was obscure, Bittrich immediately thought of General von Zangen's 15th Army, most of which had escaped across the mouth of the Skelde and into Holland. My first thought was that this airborne attack was designed to contain von Zangen's army and prevent it from joining with the remainder of our forces. Then, probably, the objective would be a drive by the British army across the Rhine and into Germany. If his reasoning was correct, Bittrich believed that the key to such an operation would be the Arnhem-Nijmegen bridges. Immediately, he alerted the 9th Hohenstaufen and the 10th Frunsberg SS Panzer Divisions. Lieutenant Colonel Walter Harzer, commander of the Hohenstaufen, attending the luncheon following the decoration of Captain Paul Grebner, was in the middle of my soup when Bittrich's call reached him. Tersely, Bittrich explained the situation and ordered Harzer to reconnoiter in the direction of Arnhem and Nijmegen. The Hohenstaufen was to move out immediately, hold the Arnhem area, and destroy airborne troops west of Arnhem near Osterbeek. Bittrich warned Harzer that quick action is imperative. The taking and securing of the Arnhem Bridge is of decisive importance. At the same time, Bittrich ordered the Frunsberg Division, whose commander, General Harmel, was in Berlin, to move toward Nijmegen to take, hold, and defend the city's bridges. Harzer was now faced with the problem of unloading the last Hohenstaufen units due to leave by train for Germany in less than an hour, including the disabled tanks, half-tracks, and armored personnel carriers he had been determined to keep from Harmel. Harzer looked at Gravener. Now what are we going to do, he asked. The vehicles are dismantled and on the train. Of these, forty vehicles belong to Gravener's reconnaissance battalion. How soon can you have the tracks and guns put back, Harzer demanded. Gravener immediately called his engineers. We'll be ready to move within three to five hours, he told Harzer. Get it done in three, Harzer snapped as he headed for his headquarters. Although he had guessed right for the wrong reasons, General Bittrich had set in motion the panzer divisions that Montgomery's intelligence officers had totally dismissed. The officer who had been ordered out of Osterbeek to make way for Field Marshal Model's headquarters found himself and his men based almost on the British landing zones. 
SS Major Sepp Kraft, commander of the Panzer Grenadier Training and Reserve Battalion, was sick to my stomach with fright. His latest headquarters in the Wolfhazer Hotel was less than one mile from Renkum Heath. Bivouacked nearby were two of his companies, a third was in reserve in Arnhem. From the hotel, Kraft could see the heath, jammed with gliders and troops, some only a few hundred yards away. He had always believed that it took hours for airborne troops to organize, but as he watched, the English were assembling everywhere and moving off ready to fight. He could not understand why such a force would land in this area. The only military objective I could think of with any importance was the Arnhem Bridge. The terrified commander knew of no German infantry close by other than his own understrength battalion. Until help could arrive, Kraft decided that it was up to me to stop them from getting to the bridge, if that's where they were going. His companies were positioned in a rough triangle, its base, the Wolfhazer Road, almost bordering Renkum Heath. North of Kraft's headquarters was the main Ader Arnhem Road and the Amsterdam Utrecht Arnhem Railway Line. To the south, the Utrecht Road ran via Renkum and Osterbeek into Arnhem. Because he lacked the strength to maintain a line from one road to the other, Kraft decided to hold positions roughly from the railroad on the north to the Utrecht Arnhem Road to the south. Hurriedly, he ordered his reserve company out of Arnhem to join the rest of the battalion at Wolfhazer. Machine gun platoons were dispatched to hold each end of his line while the remainder of his troops fanned out in the woods. Although lacking men, Kraft had a new experimental weapon at his disposal, a multi-barreled rocket-propelled launcher capable of throwing oversized mortar shells. This weapon should not be confused with the smaller German mortar-thrower, Nebelwerfer. Kraft maintains that there were only four of these experimental launchers in existence. I have not been able to check this fact, but I can find no record of a similar weapon on the Western Front. There is no doubt that it was used with devastating effect against the British. Countless witnesses described the scream and impact of the oversized mortars, but inexplicably there is no discussion of the weapon in any of the British after-action reports. Several of these units had been left with him for training purposes. Now he planned to use them to confuse the British and give an impression of greater strength. At the same time, he ordered 25-man attack groups to make sharp forays which might throw the paratroops off balance. As Kraft was issuing his directions, a staff car roared up to his headquarters and Major General Kusin, Arnhem's town commander, hurried inside. Kusin had driven out of Arnhem at breakneck speed to see at first hand what was happening. On the way, he had met Field Marshal Modal heading east toward Duticum. Stopping briefly on the road, Modal had instructed Kusin to raise the alert and to inform Berlin of the developments. Now, looking across the heath, Kusin was flabbergasted at the sight of the vast British drop. Almost desperately, he told Kraft that somehow he would get reinforcements to the area by 6 p.m., as Kusin started out to make the drive back to Arnhem, Kraft warned him not to take the Utrecht-Arnhem road. Already he had received a report that British troopers were moving along it. Take the side roads, Kraft told Kusin. The main road may already be blocked. Kusin was grim-faced. I'll get through all right, he answered. Kraft watched as the staff car raced off toward the highway. He was convinced that Kusin's replacements would never reach him, and that it was only a matter of time before his small force would be overpowered. Even as he positioned his troops along the Wolfhazer Road, Kraft sent his driver, Private Wilhelm Rau, to collect his personal possessions. "'Pack them in the car and head for Germany,' Kraft told Rau. "'I don't expect to get out of this alive.'" At Bad Sarno, near Berlin, the commander of the 10th Frunzberg Division, General Heinz Harmel, conferred with the chief of Waffen-SS operations, Major General Hans Jutner, and outlined the plight of Bittrich's understrength II Panzer Corps. If the corps was to continue as an effective combat unit, Harmel insisted, Bittrich's urgent request for men, armor, vehicles, and guns must be honored. Jutner promised to do what he could, but he warned that, at this moment, the strength of every combat unit is depleted. Everyone wanted priorities, and Jutner could not promise any immediate help. As the two men talked, Jutner's aide entered the office with a radio message. Jutner read it and wordlessly passed it to Harmel. The message read, Airborne attack, Arnhem. Return immediately, Bittrich. Harmel rushed out of the office and got into his car. Arnhem was an eleven-and-a-half-hour drive from Batsano.
To his driver, Corporal Sepp Hinterholzer, Hamel said, Back to Arnhem, and drive like the devil. 7. Major Anthony Dean Drummond, 2nd in command of the British 1st Airborne Division signals, could not understand what was wrong. At one moment his radio sets were getting perfect reception from Brigadier Lathbury's brigade as it headed for its objectives, including the Arnhem Bridge. But now, as Lathbury's battalions moved closer to Arnhem, radio signals were fading by the minute. From Dean Drummond's signalmen came a constant stream of reports that disturbed and puzzled him. They were unable to contact some jeep-borne sets at all, and the signals they received from others were so weak as to be barely audible. Yet the various battalions of Lathbury's brigade and Major Freddy Goff's reconnaissance units could scarcely be more than two to three miles away. Of particular concern to Dean Drummond was Lathbury's messages. They were vital to General Urquhart in his direction of the battle. Dean Drummond decided to send out a jeep with a radio and operator to pick up Lathbury's signals and relay them back to division. He instructed the team to set up at a point midway between division and Lathbury's mobile communications. A short time later, Dean Drummond heard signals from the relay team. The range of their set seemed drastically reduced. At minimum, the 22s should have operated efficiently at least up to five miles, and the signal was faint. Either the set was not functioning properly, he reasoned, or the operator was poorly located to send. Even as he listened, the signal faded completely. Dean Drummond was unable to raise anybody, nor could a special team of American communications operators with two radio jeeps. Hastily assembled and rushed to British Airborne Division headquarters only a few hours before takeoff on the 17th, the Americans were to operate ground-to-air very high-frequency sets to call in fighters for close support. In the first few hours of the battle, these radio jeeps might have made all the difference. Instead, they were found to be useless. Neither jeep's set had been adjusted to the frequencies necessary to call in planes. At this moment, with the battle barely begun, British radio communications had totally broken down. In Christopher Hibbert's The Battle of Arnhem, dealing specifically with the British at Arnhem and equally critical of British communications, he claims that American air support parties were insufficiently trained. The disastrous consequence was that not until the last day of the operation was any effective close air support given to the airborne troops. There appears to be no information on who erred in the allocation of the frequencies, nor are the names of the Americans known. The two teams who found themselves in the middle of the battle with the means of perhaps changing the entire course of history on that vital day have never been found. Yet these two combat units are the only American ones known to have been in the Arnhem battle. 8. As if on signal, German guns opened up as the planes carrying the 82nd Airborne Division made their approach to the drop zones. Looking down, Brigadier General James M. Gavin saw ground fire spurting from a line of trenches paralleling the Marsval Canal. In wooded areas, enemy batteries that had remained silent and hidden until now also began to fire. Watching, Gavin wondered if his battle plan for the 82nd, which had been based on a calculated risk, might founder. Charged with holding the middle sector of the Market Garden Corridor, the division had widespread objectives, running ten miles south to north and twelve miles west to east. Besides the drop of one paratroop company near the western end of the Hrava Bridge, which was to be seized by a surprise coup de main assault, Gavin had chosen three drop areas and one large landing zone. The latter would accommodate his fifty Waco gliders and the thirty-eight horses and Wacos of General Frederick Browning's British First Airborne Corps headquarters. But Gavin had ordered only one drop zone north of Overasselt to be marked by pathfinders. The other three, lying close to the Grusbeck Ridge and the German border, were deliberately left unmarked. Gavin's paratroopers and gliders would land without identifying beacons or smoke in order to confuse the enemy as to their touchdown areas. Some thirteen minutes after the 82nd was down, Browning's corps headquarters would land. Because Gavin's primary concern was that enemy tanks might suddenly emerge from the Reichswald along the German border east of his largest glider and drop zone, he had given two unusual orders. 
To protect both his division and Browning's headquarters, he had instructed paratroopers to jump close to any anti-aircraft batteries they were able to spot from the air and render them useless as quickly as possible, and for the first time in airborne history he was parachuting in a complete battalion of field artillery, dropping it onto the large zone directly facing the forest and approximately one and one-half miles from the German border itself. Now, looking at the intense anti-aircraft fire and thinking of the possibility of enemy tanks in the Reichswald, Gavin knew that while he had planned for nearly all eventualities, the men of the 82nd faced a tough task. Gavin's Normandy veterans had never forgotten the slaughter of their own in saint mer Eglise. Dropped by accident on that village, men had been machine-gunned by the Germans as they came down. Many were killed as they hung helpless in their parachutes from telephone lines and trees around the village square. Not until saint mer Eglise was finally secured by Lieutenant Colonel Ben Vandervoort were the dead troopers cut down and buried. Now, as the 82nd prepared to jump over Holland, some men called out to troopers still hooked up behind them, Remember saint mer Eglise! Although it was a risky procedure, many troopers jumped with their guns blazing. Captain Briand Baudin, coming down over his drop zone near the Grusbeek Ridge, saw that he was descending directly over a German anti-aircraft emplacement with guns aiming at him. Baudin began firing with his Colt 45. Suddenly I realized, Baudin remembers, how futile it was aiming my little pea-shooter while oscillating in the air above large-caliber guns. Landing close to the flak site, Baudin took the entire crew prisoner. He thinks the Germans were so startled they couldn't fire a single shot. First Lieutenant James J. Coyle thought he was heading for a landing on a German tent hospital. Suddenly enemy troops poured out of the tent and began running for 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns around the perimeter. He too worked his 45 from its holster, but his parachute began to oscillate and Coyle drifted away from the tent. One of the Germans started to run in Coyle's direction. I couldn't get off a shot at the kraut, Coyle recalls. One second I'd be pointing the pistol at the ground, the next I'd be aiming at the sky. I did have enough sense left to put the Colt back into the holster so I wouldn't drop it or shoot myself when I hit. On the ground, even before he tried to get out of his harness, Coyle drew his pistol once more. The kraut was now only a few feet away, but he was acting as though he didn't know I existed. Suddenly I realized that he wasn't running toward me, he was just running away. As the German hurried past Coyle, he threw away his gun and helmet, and Coyle could see he was only a kid about eighteen years old. I just couldn't shoot an unarmed man. The last I saw of the boy, he was running for the German border. When tracer bullets began ripping through his canopy, Private Edwin C. Raub became so enraged that he deliberately side-slipped his chute so as to land next to the anti-aircraft gun. Without removing his harness and dragging his parachute behind him, Raub rushed the Germans with his Tommy gun. He killed one, captured the others, and then, with plastic explosives, destroyed the flak gun barrels. Although enemy opposition to the 505th and 508th regiments in the Grusbeek area was officially considered negligible, a considerable amount of anti-aircraft and small arms fire came from the woods surrounding the zones. Without waiting to assemble, 82nd troopers, individually and in small groups, swarmed over these pockets of resistance, quickly subduing them and taking prisoners. Simultaneously, fighter planes skimmed over the treetops, machine-gunning the enemy emplacements. The Germans scored heavily against these low-level attacks. Within a matter of minutes, three fighters were hit and crashed near the woods. Staff Sergeant Michael Vuletic saw one of them. It cartwheeled across the drop zone, and when it finally stopped, only the plane's fuselage was intact. Moments later, the pilot emerged unscathed and stopped by the wreckage to light a cigarette. Vuletic remembers that the downed flyer remained with the company as an infantryman. From the ground, Staff Sergeant James Jones saw a P-47 aflame at about 1,500 feet. He expected the pilot to bail out, but the plane came down, skidded across the drop zone, and broke apart. The tail snapped off, the motor rolled away, and the cockpit came to rest on the field. Jones was sure the pilot was dead, but as he watched, the canopy slid back, and a little tow-headed guy with no hat on and a forty-five under his arm ran toward us. Jones remembers asking, "'Man, why in the devil didn't you jump?' The pilot grinned. "'Hell, I was afraid to,' he told Jones. 
Just after landing and assembling his gear, Staff Sergeant Russell O'Neill watched a P-51 fighter dive and strafe a hidden German position near his field. After the plane had made two passes over the machine-gun nest, it was hit, but the pilot was able to circle and make a safe belly landing. According to O'Neill, this guy jumped out and ran up to me shouting, Give me a gun, quick! I know right where that Kraut SOB is and I'm gonna get him! As O'Neill stared after him, the pilot grabbed a gun and raced off toward the woods. Within 18 minutes, 4,511 men of the 82nd's 505th and 508th regiments, along with engineers and 70 tons of equipment, were down on or near their drop zones straddling the town of Grusbeck on the eastern side of the wooded heights. As the men assembled, cleared the zones, and struck out for objectives, special pathfinder teams marked the areas for the artillery drop, the 82nd's glider force, and the British Corps headquarters. So far, General Gavin's calculated risk was succeeding. Yet, although radio contact between the regiments was established almost immediately, it was still too early for Gavin, who had jumped with the 505th, to learn what was occurring eight miles west, where the 504th Regiment had dropped north of Overasselt. Nor did he know whether the special assault against the Hrava Bridge was proceeding according to plan. Like the rest of the division's planes, the 137 C-47s carrying Colonel Reuben H. Tucker's 504th Regiment ran into spasmodic anti-aircraft fire as they neared the Overasselt drop zone. As in the other areas, pilots held their courses, and at 1.15 p.m. some 2,016 men began to jump. Eleven planes swung slightly west and headed for a small drop site near the vital nine-span, 1,500-foot-long bridge over the Maas River near Hrava. These C-47s carried Company E of Major Edward Wellam's 2nd Battalion to the most crucial of the 82nd's immediate objectives. Their job was to rush the bridges from the western approach. The remainder of Wellam's battalion would strike out from over Asselt and head for the eastern side. If the Hrava Bridge was not taken quickly and intact, the tight market garden schedule could not be maintained. Loss of the bridge might mean failure for the entire operation. As E Company's planes headed for the western assault site, platoon leader Lieutenant John S. Thompson could clearly see the Maas River, the town of Hrava, the mass jump of the 504th to his right near over Asselt, and then, coming up, the ditch-lined fields where the company was to drop. As Thompson watched, other men from the company were already out of their planes and falling toward the Hrava bridge zone. But in the lieutenant's C-47, the green light had not yet flashed on. When it did, Thompson saw that they were directly over some buildings. He waited for a few seconds, saw fields beyond, and jumped with his platoon. By a fortuitous error, he and his men came down only some five or six hundred yards from the southwestern edge of the bridge. Thompson could hear erratic firing from the direction of Hrava itself, but around the bridge everything seemed quiet. He did not know whether he should wait until the remainder of the company came up or attack with the sixteen men in his platoon. Since this was our primary mission, I decided to attack, Thompson says. Sending Corporal Hugh H. Perry back to the company commander, Thompson gave him a laconic message to deliver. We are proceeding toward the bridge. Firing from the town and nearby buildings was now more intense, and Thompson led the platoon to cover in nearby drainage ditches. Working their way toward the bridge, men waded in water up to their necks. They began to receive fire from a flak tower close to the bridge, and Thompson noticed enemy soldiers with bags in their arms running to and from a building near the crossing. He thought it must be a maintenance or power plant. Fearful that the Germans were carrying demolition charges to the bridge in preparation for destroying it, Thompson quickly deployed his men, encircled the building, and opened fire. We raked the area with machine guns, overran the power plant, found four dead Germans and one wounded, Thompson recalls. Apparently they had been carrying their personal equipment and blankets. Suddenly two trucks came racing down the highway from Hrava, heading toward the bridge. One of Thompson's men killed a driver whose truck careened off the road as its load of German soldiers scrambled to get out. The second vehicle stopped immediately, and the soldiers in it jumped to the ground. Thompson's men opened up, but the Germans showed no desire to fight. Without returning fire, they ran away. Fire was still coming from the flak tower, but by now it was passing over the heads of the platoon. 
The gunners were unable to depress the 20 mm flak gun sufficiently to get us, Thompson remembers. The platoon's bazooka man, Private Robert McGraw, crawled forward and at a range of about 75 yards fired three rounds, two of them into the top of the tower, and the gun ceased firing. Although a twin 20 mm gun in a tower across the river near the far end of the bridge was firing, Thompson and his men nonetheless destroyed electrical equipment and cables that they suspected were hooked up to demolitions. The platoon then set up a roadblock and placed landmines across the highway at the southwestern approach to the bridge. In the flak tower they had knocked out, they found the gunner dead, but his 20 mm weapon undamaged. Thompson's men promptly began firing it at the flak tower across the river. The platoon, he knew, would soon be reinforced by the rest of E Company coming up behind, and shortly after by Major Wellams's battalion even now rushing from over Asselt to grab the northeastern end of the bridge. But as far as Lieutenant Thompson was concerned, the prime objective was already taken. The 80 seconds after-action report and that of the 504th Commander, Colonel Tucker, state the bridge was taken at 2.30 p.m., but Major Wellens's account states that because the bridge was still under harassing fire, the first men to actually cross from the northeastern end went over at 3.35 p.m. Still, the E Company platoon under Lieutenant Thompson held the bridge and prevented its demolition from 1.45 p.m. until it was described as secure at 5 p.m. By now, the remaining battalions of Tucker's 504th Regiment were moving eastward like spokes on a wheel for the three road crossings and the railroad bridge over the Marsval Canal. Rushing toward the bridge also were units of the 505th and 508th Regiments, bent on seizing the crossings from the opposite ends. Now all these objectives were essential to the Market Garden advance. In the surprise of the assault and the ensuing confusion, Gavin hoped to seize them all, but one, in addition to the all-important Hrava Bridge, would suffice. To keep the enemy off balance, defend his positions, protect General Browning's corps headquarters, and aid his paratroopers as they moved on their objectives, Gavin was depending heavily on his howitzers, and now the guns of the 376th Parachute Field Artillery were coming in. Small artillery units had been dropped in previous operations, but they had been badly scattered and slow to assemble and fire. The unit of 544 men now approaching was hand-picked, every soldier a veteran paratrooper. Among the 48 planes carrying the battalion was the artillery, 12 75mm howitzers, each broken down into seven pieces. The howitzers would be dropped first, followed by some 700 rounds of ammunition. Lining up, the C-47s came in, and in quick succession the guns rolled out. Ammunition and men followed, all making a near-perfect landing. One accident caused scarcely a pause. Lieutenant Colonel Wilbur Griffith, commanding the 376th, broke his ankle on the jump, but his men quickly liberated a Dutch wheelbarrow in which to carry him. I shall never forget the colonel being trundled from place to place, Major Augustine Hart recalls, and barking out orders for everybody to get assembled at top speed. When the job was complete, Griffith was wheeled over to General Gavin. There he reported, Guns in position, sir, and ready to fire on call. In just over an hour, in the most successful drop of its kind ever made, the entire battalion was assembled and ten of its howitzers were already firing. Fourteen minutes after the 82nd's field artillery landed, Waco gliders carrying an airborne anti-tank battalion, engineers, elements of division headquarters, guns, ammunition, trailers, and jeeps began to come in. Of the original fifty gliders leaving England, all but four reached Holland. Not all, however, touched down on their landing zone. Some gliders ended up a mile or two away. One, co-piloted by Captain Anthony Jodrewski, cut loose late from its tug, and Jodrewski saw with horror that we were heading straight for Germany on a one-glider invasion. The pilot made a 180-degree turn and began to look for a place to land. As they came in, Jodrewski remembers, we lost one wing on a haystack, the other on a fence, and ended up with the glider nose in the ground. Seeing earth up to my knees, I wasn't sure if my feet were still a part of me. Then we heard the unwelcome sound of an 88, and in nothing flat we had the jeep out and were racing back toward our own area. They were luckier than Captain John Connolly, whose pilot was killed during the approach. 
Connolly, who had never flown a glider before, took the controls and landed the Waco just inside the German border, six to seven miles away, near the town of Wieler. Only Connolly and one other man escaped capture. They were to hide out until darkness and finally reached their units by mid-morning of September 18th. Yet in all, the 82nd Airborne had successfully brought in 7,467 paratroopers and glider-borne men. The last elements to touch down in the area were 35 horses and Wacos carrying General Frederick Browning's Corps headquarters. Three gliders had been lost en route to the drop zone, two before reaching the continent. The third, south of Wucht, had crash-landed in the vicinity of General Student's headquarters. Browning's headquarters landed almost on the German frontier. There was little flack, if any, and almost no enemy opposition, Browning's chief of staff, Brigadier Gordon Walsh, remembers. We sat down about a hundred yards west of the Reichswald forest, and my glider was roughly fifty yards away from Browning's. Colonel George S. Chatterton, commanding the Glider Pilot Regiment, was at the controls of Browning's hawser. After clipping off a front wheel on an electric cable, Chatterton slid into a cabbage patch. We got out, Chatterton recalls, and Browning, looking around, said, By God, we're here, George. Nearby, Brigadier Walsh saw Browning run across the landing zone toward the Reichswald. When he returned a few minutes later, he explained to Walsh, I wanted to be the first British officer to pee in Germany. While Browning's jeep was being unloaded, a few German shells exploded nearby. Colonel Chatterton promptly threw himself into the closest ditch. I shall never forget Browning standing above me, looking like some sort of explorer, and asking, George, whatever in the world are you doing down there? Chatterton was frank. I'm bloody well hiding, sir, he said. Well, you can bloody well stop hiding, Browning told him. It's time we were going. From a pocket in his tunic, Browning took out a parcel wrapped in tissue paper. Handing it to Chatterton, he said, Put it on my jeep. Chatterton unfolded the tissue and saw that it contained a pennant bearing a light blue pegasus against a maroon background, the insignia of the British Airborne. With the pennant fluttering from the jeep's fender, the commander of the market forces drove away. Some accounts have stated that Browning's pennant was made by his wife, the novelist Daphne du Maurier. I am sorry, she writes, to disappoint the myth-makers, but anyone who has seen my attempts to thread a needle would know this was beyond me. It is a delightful thought, however, and would have greatly amused my husband. Actually, the pennant was made by Hobson and Sons Limited London, under the supervision of Miss Claire Miller who also, at Browning's direction, hand-sewed tiny compasses into five hundred shirt collars and belts just prior to Market Garden. At Renkham Heath, west of Arnhem, Lieutenant Neville Hay, the highly trained specialist in charge of the fact-gathering liaison unit Phantom, was totally baffled. His team of experts had assembled their radio set with its special antenna and expected immediate contact with General Browning's Corps headquarters. Hay's first priority on landing was to get through to Corps and give his position. Earlier he had learned that division communications had broken down. While he might have anticipated that problems would arise among the less experienced Royal Signal Corps operators, he was not prepared to believe that the difficulties he was having stemmed from his own men. We were set up on the landing zone, and although it was screened by pine woods, we had got through in considerably worse country than this, he remembers. We kept trying and getting absolutely nothing. Until he could discover where the trouble lay, there was no way of informing General Browning of the progress of General Urquhart's division, or of relaying Browning's orders to the British First Airborne. Ironically, the Dutch telephone system was in full operation, including a special network owned and operated by the PGEM power station authorities at Nijmegen and connected with the entire province. Had he known, all Hay had to do, with the aid of the Dutch resistance, was to pick up a telephone. Fifteen miles away there was already anxiety at General Browning's headquarters, now set up on the edge of the Grusbeek Ridge. Both of the 82nd Airborne's large communication sets had been damaged on landing. Browning's had come through safely, and one of these was allocated to the 82nd, ensuring immediate communication with General Gavin. The Corps Communications Section had also made radio contact with General Dempsey's British Second Army and Airborne Corps rear headquarters in England, and Browning had radio contact with the 101st. 
but the signal section was unable to raise Urquhart's division. Brigadier Walsh believes that Corps signals was to blame. Before the operation was planned, we asked for a proper headquarters signals section, he says. We were frightfully cognizant that our sets were inadequate and our headquarters signals staff weak and inexperienced. While Browning could direct and influence the movements of the 82nd, the 101st, and Horrocks's 30 Corps, at this vital junction the all-important battle at Arnhem was beyond his control. As Walsh says, we had absolutely no idea what was happening in Arnhem. A kind of creeping paralysis was already beginning to affect Montgomery's plan, but at this early stage no one knew it. Throughout the entire Market Garden area, some 20,000 Allied soldiers were in Holland, heading out to secure the bridges and hold open the corridor for the massive garden units whose lead tanks were expected to link up with 101st paratroopers by nightfall. 9. From the flat roof of a large factory near the Meurs-Esco Canal, General Brian Horrocks, commander of the British 30 Corps, watched the last of the huge airborne glider formations pass over his waiting tanks. He had been on the roof since 11 a.m., and as he put it, I had plenty of time to think. The sight of the vast armada was comforting, but I was under no illusion that this was going to be an easy battle, Horrocks remembers. Meticulously, he had covered every possible contingency, even to ordering his men to take as much food, gas, and ammunition as they could carry, since we were likely to be out in the blue on our own. There was one worry the general could not eliminate, but he had not discussed it with anyone. He did not like a Sunday attack. No assault or attack in which I had taken part during the war which started on a Sunday had ever been completely successful. Bringing up his binoculars, he studied the white ribbon of road stretching away north toward Valkenswart and Eindhoven. Satisfied that the airborne assault had now begun, Horrocks gave the order for the garden forces to attack. At precisely 2.15 p.m., with a thunderous roar, some 350 guns opened fire. The bombardment was devastating. Ton after ton of explosives flayed the enemy positions up ahead. The hurricane of fire, ranging five miles in depth and concentrated over a one-mile front, caused the earth to shake beneath the tanks of the Irish guards as they lumbered up to the start line. Behind the lead squadrons, hundreds of tanks and armoured vehicles began to move slowly out of their parking positions, ready to fall into line as the first tanks moved off and up above a cab rank of rocket-firing typhoon fighters circled endlessly, waiting on call for the commander of the Irish Guards Group, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Vandeleur, to direct them to targets up ahead. At 2.35 p.m., standing in the turret of the lead tank of No. 3 Squadron, Lieutenant Keith Heathcote shouted into the microphone, Driver, advance! Slowly the tanks rumbled out of the bridgehead and moved up the road at eight miles an hour. Now the curtain of artillery fire lifted to creep ahead of the armor at exactly the same speed. Tankers could see shells bursting barely one hundred yards in front of them. As the squadrons moved forward engulfed in the dust of the barrage, men could not tell at times whether the tanks were safely back of their own fire. Behind the lead squadrons came the scout cars of Lieutenant Colonel Joe Vandeleur and his cousin Giles. Standing in his car, Vandeleur could see, both in front of and behind him, infantry riding on the tanks, each tank marked with yellow streamers to identify it to the typhoons above. The din was unimaginable, Vandeleur remembers, but everything was going according to plan. By now the lead tanks had burst out of the bridgehead and were across the Dutch frontier. Captain Mick O'Cock, commanding No. 3 Squadron, radioed back, Advance going well, leading squadron has got through. Then in seconds the picture changed. As Vandeleur recalls, the Germans really began to paste us. Ensconced in well-hidden fortified positions on both sides of the road, German gunners had not only survived the tremendous barrage, but had waited until it passed over them. Holding their fire, the Germans let the first few tanks go through. Then, within two minutes, three tanks of the lead squadron and six of the next were knocked out of action. Burning and disabled, they littered a half-mile of road.
We had just crossed the border when we were ambushed, Lieutenant Cyril Russell recalls. Suddenly the tanks in front either slewed across the road or burned where they stood. The awful realization dawned on me that the next one to go was the one I was sitting on. We jumped into the ditches by the roadside. As Russell went forward to see how the remainder of his platoon was faring, a machine gun opened up. He was hit in the arm and fell back into the ditch. For Russell, the war was over. Lance Corporal James Doggart's tank was hit. I don't remember seeing or hearing the explosion, he says. I was suddenly flat on my back in a ditch with the tank leaning over me. I had a Bren gun across my chest, and next to me was a young lad with his arm nearly severed. Nearby another of our men was dead. The tank was on fire, and I don't recall seeing any of the crew get out. Lieutenant Barry Quinan in the last tank of the lead squadron remembers that his Sherman swung left into a ditch, and Quinan thought the driver was trying to bypass the burning tanks ahead, but the tank had been hit by a shell which killed both the driver and co-driver. The Sherman began to burn, and Quinan's gunner, trying to scramble out of the hatch, half lifted me out of the turret before I realized we were brewing up. As the two men climbed out of the tank, Quinan saw others coming up behind. One after the other, the tanks were hit. I actually saw the commander of one tank trying to shield his face from a sheet of flame that engulfed the entire machine. The breakout had been stopped before it had really begun, and nine disabled tanks now blocked the road. Squadrons coming up could not advance. Even if they could bypass the burning hulks, hidden German gunners would pick them off. To get the advance rolling again, Vandeleur called in the rocket-firing typhoons, and aided by purple smoke shells fired from the tanks to indicate suspected German positions, the fighters screamed down. It was the first time I had ever seen typhoons in action, Vandeleur recalls, and I was amazed at the guts of those pilots. They came in one at a time, head to tail, flying right through our own barrage. One disintegrated right above me. It was incredible. Guns firing, the roar of planes, the shouts and curses of the men. In the middle of it all, Division asked how the battle was going. My second-in-command just held up the microphone and said, Listen. As the planes swooped down on their targets, Vandalier sent forward an armored bulldozer to push the burning tanks off the road. The bedlam of the battle now raged over several miles of highway, stretching back as far as Vandalier's own car and the RAF communications tender, which called the typhoons down on demand. Flight Lieutenant Donald Love, the fighter reconnaissance pilot attached to the communications unit, was now convinced that he should never have volunteered for the job. While squadron leader Max Sutherland directed the typhoons, Love got out to see what was happening. Black smoke billowed up from the road ahead, and an anti-tank gun carrier almost in front of the communications tender was afire. As Love watched, a Bren gun carrier came back along the road carrying wounded. One man's shoulder was blown off, and his clothes were burned and charred. I was sure we were surrounded, says Love. I was horrified, and I kept wondering why hadn't I stayed with the Air Force where I belonged. The waiting tankers farther back in the halted columns felt, as Captain Roland Langton describes it, a strange sense of powerlessness. We could go neither forward nor backward. Langton watched infantry moving up to clean out the woods on either side of the road with two Bren gun carriers out in front. Langton thought the soldiers might be an advance party of the 43rd Infantry Division. Suddenly I saw both carriers catapulted into the air, Langton remembers. They had run over enemy landmines. When the smoke cleared, Langton saw bodies in the trees. I don't know how many. It was impossible to tell. There were pieces of men hanging from every limb. With the typhoons firing only yards away from them, the British infantrymen grimly began to dig out the Germans from their hidden trenches. Lance Corporal Doggart had escaped from the ditch where he landed when his tank was hit. He raced across the road and jumped into an empty enemy slit trench. At the same moment, two Germans, one a young fellow without a jacket, the other a tough-looking bastard of about thirty, jumped in after me from the opposite direction, Doggart says. Without hesitating, Doggart kicked the older German in the face. The younger man, immediately cowed, surrendered. Covering both with his rifle, Doggart sent them marching back along the road, with streams of other Germans all running with their hands behind their heads. Those that were too slow got a fast kick in the backside.
from the woods in ditches around haystacks and along the roadway now being slowly cleared of the disabled tanks came the stutter of sten guns as the infantry mopped up the guardsmen showed no quarter particularly towards snipers men remember that prisoners were made to double time down the road and when they slowed they were promptly prodded with bayonets one prisoner in the now growing lines tried to break away but there was more than a company of infantry in the vicinity and several men recall that in the words of one he was dead the second the thought entered his mind joe vandalier watched the prisoners being marched past his scout car as one german came along vandalier caught a sudden movement the bastard had taken a grenade he had concealed and lobbed it into one of our gun carriers it went off with a tremendous explosion, and I saw one of my sergeants lying in the road with his leg blown off. The German was cut down on all sides by machine guns. At his command post, General Horrocks received word that the road was gradually being cleared, and that the infantry, although suffering heavy casualties, had routed the Germans on the flanks. As he later put it, the mix were getting tired of being shot at, and as so often happens with these great fighters, they suddenly lost their tempers. Perhaps no one was more enraged than Captain Eamon Fitzgerald, the 2nd Battalion's intelligence officer, who interrogated the captured crew of an anti-tank gun. According to Lieutenant Colonel Giles Vandalier, Fitzgerald had an interesting way of extracting information. A huge giant of a man, he spoke German well, but with an atrocious accent. His normal custom was to produce his pistol, poke it into the German's belly, and, standing as close as possible, shout questions in the man's face. The results, Vandalier always thought, were positively splendid. Within a few minutes after interrogating this crew, our tanks were picking off the German camouflaged anti-tank positions with creditable accuracy, and the road was being sufficiently cleared to allow us to continue the advance. Many Irish guardsmen believe Sergeant Bertie Cowan turned the tide of the battle. Commanding a 17-pounder Sherman, Cowan had spotted a German anti-tank position and demolished it with a single shot. During the fight, Major Edward G. Tyler in command of the squadron was astonished to see that a German was standing on Cowan's tank directing operations. He saw the tank cross the road and open fire. Then, busy himself, Tyler forgot the incident. Later, Tyler learned that Cowan had knocked out three German guns. When I could take a moment, I went to congratulate him, Tyler says. Cowan told me that Jerry on his tank had been a crew chief in the first position he had overrun, who had surrendered. He had been interrogated by Captain Fitzgerald, and then returned to Cowan, where he had proven most cooperative. The Irish guards were on the way again, but constant fighting continued. The German crust was far tougher than anyone had anticipated. Among the prisoners were men of renowned parachute battalions, and, to the complete surprise of the British, veteran infantrymen from the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, elements of the combat groups General Wilhelm Bittrich had sent to bolster Student's 1st Parachute Army. To compound the surprise, some prisoners were discovered to belong to General von Zangen's 15th Army. As the Irish Guard's war diary notes, our intelligence spent the day in a state of indignant surprise. One German regiment after another appeared which had no right to be there. General Horrocks had expected that his lead tanks would drive the thirteen miles to Eindhoven within two to three hours. Precious time had been lost, and the Irish guards would cover only seven miles, reaching Valkenspart by nightfall. Market Garden was already ominously behind schedule. In order to be as mobile as possible, General Maxwell D. Taylor's gliders had brought in mostly jeeps, no artillery. The fact that the British were late in reaching Eindhoven was a blow. Taylor had hoped for the support of the tankers' guns along the fifteen-mile stretch of corridor the Screaming Eagles must control. Taylor's Dutch liaison officers discovered the true situation, that the 101st would have to operate independently for longer than planned, almost immediately. With the aid of the resistance, they simply used the telephone to learn what was happening with the British. With lightning speed, Taylor's paratroopers took Vagel, the northernmost objective along the corridor, and its four crossings, the rail and highway bridges over the River R and the Willems Canal. Heavy fighting would ensue. Nevertheless, these four objectives were seized within two hours. 
farther south, midway between Vagel and Son, the town of St. Udenrode and its highway crossing over the Dommel River were captured with relative ease. According to official Dutch telephone logbooks, Johanna Lathauers, a loyal operator with the state telephone exchange, heard, An unmistakable American voice came on the Oud 1, St. Udenrode, line at 14.25 hours, asking for Valkenswart, a connection that lasted 40 minutes. By Allied clocks, it was actually 15.25 hours. There was a one-hour difference between German and British times. The Americans quickly learned that the spearhead of the Garden forces had not as yet even reached Valkenswart. It now seemed unlikely that Horrocks's tanks, already delayed, would reach Eindhoven at the southern end of the corridor before nightfall, and that would be too late to help the Americans seize and control their widespread targets. The men of the 101st had achieved spectacular success. Now they ran into problems. The most pressing of Taylor's objectives was the highway bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal at Son, approximately five miles north of Eindhoven. As a contingency plan in case this main traffic artery was blown, Taylor had decided to seize a bridge over the canal at best, four miles to the west. Because the bridge was considered secondary, only a single company of the 502nd Regiment was detailed to best, and it was thought that only a few Germans would be in the area. Taylor's intelligence was unaware that Colonel General Student's headquarters lay only ten miles northwest of the 101st drop zones, and that recent arrivals of von Zangen's 15th Army were quartered at nearby Tilburg. Among these forces were Major General Walter Popper's battered 59th Infantry Division, plus a considerable amount of artillery. Almost immediately upon approaching the bridge, H Company radioed that it had run into enemy roadblocks and was meeting strong resistance. The message signaled the beginning of a bloody battle that would last throughout the night and most of the following two days. What had begun as a single company operation eventually involved more than an entire regiment. But already the heroic men of H Company, though taking heavy casualties, were blunting the first unexpectedly strong German blows. While H Company was setting out for the bridge at best, Colonel Robert F. Sink's 506th Regiment was going for the main highway bridge at Son. There was almost no opposition until troops reached the northern outskirts of the village. Then they were fired on by a German 88 artillery piece. In less than ten minutes the advance party destroyed the gun emplacement with a bazooka and killed its crew. Fighting through the streets, the Americans were a bare fifty yards from the canal itself when the bridge was blown up, debris falling all around the paratroopers. For Colonel Sink, who was to take Eindhoven and its crossings by 8 p.m., the loss of the bridge was a bitter blow. Reacting quickly and still under fire, three men, Major James Laprade, 2nd Lieutenant Milford F. Weller, and Sergeant John Dunning, dived into the canal and swam to the far side. Other members of the battalion followed their lead or went across in rowboats. On the southern bank, they subdued the German opposition and set up a bridgehead. The central column of the bridge was still intact, and 101st engineers immediately began the construction of a temporary crossing. Help came from an unexpected source. Dutch civilians reported that a considerable amount of black market lumber was being stored by a contractor in a nearby garage. Within one and a half hours, the engineers, utilizing the bridge's center trestle and the liberated lumber, spanned the canal. As Colonel Sink recalled, the bridge was unsatisfactory from every point of view, except that it did enable me to put the rest of the regiment across, single file. Until bridging equipment could be brought up, the market garden corridor at Son was reduced to a single wooden footpath. 10. Field Marshal Modal was still shaken when he reached General Bittrich's headquarters at Duticum. Normally it would have taken him no longer than half an hour to cover the distance, but today, because he had made numerous stops along the way to alert area commanders to the airborne assault, the trip had lasted well over an hour. Although the Field Marshal seemed calm, Bittrich remembers, his first words to me were, They almost got me. They were after the headquarters. Imagine, they almost got me. Bittrich immediately brought Modal up to date on the latest information received by two SS Panzer Corps. 
No clear picture of the Allied intent was emerging as yet, but Bittrich told Modell his own theory that the assault was aimed at containing the 15th Army, while the British 2nd Army drove for the Ruhr. That would require the Allies to capture the Nijmegen and Arnhem bridges. Modell disagreed completely. The Arnhem bridge was not the objective, he said. These airborne troops would swerve and march northeast for the Ruhr. The situation, Modell believed, was still too obscure for any final conclusions. He was puzzled as to why airborne forces had landed in the Nijmegen area. Nevertheless, he approved the measures Bittrich had already taken. Bittrich still pressed the subject of the bridges. Herr Field Marshal, I strongly urge that the bridges at Nijmegen and Arnhem be immediately destroyed, he said. Modell looked at him in amazement. They will not be destroyed, he told Bittrich firmly. No matter what the English plan, these bridges can be defended. No, absolutely not. The bridges are not to be blown. Then, dismissing the subject, Modell said, I'm looking for a new headquarters, Bittrich. Before Bittrich could answer, Modell said again musingly, You know, they almost got me. At his headquarters at Wucht, Colonel General Kurt Student faced a dilemma. His first parachute army had been split in two by the airborne assault. Without telephone communications and now solely dependent on radio, he was unable to direct his divided army. For the moment, units were fighting on their own without any cohesive direction. Then, by a momentous and fantastic stroke of luck, an undamaged briefcase found in a downed Waco glider near his headquarters was rushed to him. It was incredible, Student says. In the case was the complete enemy attack order for the operation. Student and his staff officers pored over the captured plans. They showed us everything, the dropping zones, the corridor, the objectives, even the names of the divisions involved, everything. Immediately we could see the strategic implications. They had to grab the bridges before we could destroy them. All I could think of was, this is retribution, retribution, history is repeating itself. During our airborne operation in Holland in 1940, one of my officers, against strict orders, had taken into battle papers that detailed our entire attack, and these had fallen into enemy hands. Now the wheel had turned full circle. I knew exactly what I had to do. Modell as yet did not. Student had never felt so frustrated. Because of his communications breakdown, it would be nearly ten hours before he could place the secret of Market Garden in Modell's possession. The secret was that the Arnhem Bridge was of crucial importance. The captured plans clearly showed that it was Montgomery's route into the Ruhr. In the legend of Arnhem, the story of the captured documents, like that of the spy Lindemans, is always included. Some accounts claim that the Market Garden plan was found on the body of a dead American captain. I interviewed Student and examined all his documents. At no point does he confirm that the briefcase was carried by a captain— nor is there any such mention in official British and American records. Perhaps since Student says that the plans came from a Waco freight glider, it was generally assumed that only American personnel were aboard. However, part of General Browning's Corps headquarters flew to Holland in Wacos, and one of these did crash land near Student's headquarters. In any case, whether the personnel were British or American, I think it highly unlikely that the entire Market Garden operational plan could have been in the possession of a captain. First, great care was taken in the distribution of the plan, and second, each copy was both numbered and restricted solely to officers of staff rank. This was the kind of battle that Modell liked best, one that demanded improvisation, daring, and above all, speed. From Bittrich's headquarters, Modell telephoned O.B. West, von Rundstedt. With characteristic abruptness, he described the situation and asked for immediate reinforcements. The only way this airborne assault can be defeated is to strike hard within the first 24 hours, he told von Rundstedt. Modell asked for anti-aircraft units, self-propelled guns, tanks and infantry, and he wanted them on the move to Arnhem by nightfall. Von Rundstedt told him that such reinforcements as were available would be on the way. Turning to Bittrich, Modell said triumphantly, Now we'll get reinforcements. Modell had decided to operate from Duticum, but although he was apparently recovered from the shock of his hasty departure from Osterbeek, this time he was taking no chances of being caught unawares. 
he refused accommodations at the castle, he would direct the battle from the gardener's cottage on the grounds. Bittrich's early foresight was already having its effect. Sections of Harzer's Hohenstaufen division were heading swiftly toward the battle zone. Hamel's Frunzberg division, Hamel himself was expected back from Germany during the night, were on the move too. Bittrich had ordered Harzer to set up his headquarters in a high school in the northern Arnhem suburbs overlooking the city, and that transfer was underway. But Harzer was chafing with impatience. The armored vehicles that had been scheduled to leave for Germany in the early afternoon were still being refitted with tracks and guns. Harzer had already moved the units closest to the British landing and drop zones into blocking positions at points west of Arnhem. For the moment he had only a few armored cars, several self-propelled guns, a few tanks, and some infantry. Still, Harzer hoped that by employing hit-and-run tactics, he could halt and confuse British troops until the bulk of his division was again battle-ready. Curiously, Harzer did not even know that Major Zepp Kraft's SS Panzer Grenadier Training and Reserve Battalion was in the area, and at the moment the only unit in the path of the British airborne forces. Harzer concentrated his own strength on the two major highways running into Arnhem, the Ada Arnhem Road and the Utrecht Arnhem Road. Certain that the paratroopers must use these main arteries, he placed his units in a semicircular screen across the two highways. By oversight, or perhaps because he lacked sufficient forces at the moment, Harzer failed to position any groups along a quiet secondary road running parallel to the northern bank of the Rhine. It was the single unprotected route the British could take to the Arnhem Bridge. 11. In their camouflage battle smocks and distinctive crash helmets, laden with weapons and ammunition, the men of Brigadier Lathbury's 1st Parachute Brigade were on the way to Arnhem. Interspersed among the columns of marching troopers were jeeps pulling artillery pieces and four-wheeled carts loaded with guns and stores. As General Roy Urquhart watched them pass, he remembered a compliment paid him some months before by General Horrocks. "'Your men are killers,' Horrocks had said admiringly. At the time, Urquhart had considered the remark an overstatement. On this Sunday, he was not so sure. As the 1st Brigade had moved off, Urquhart had felt a surge of pride. The plan called for the three battalions of Lathbury's brigade to converge on Arnhem, each from a different direction. Lieutenant Colonel John Frost's 2nd Battalion was given the prime objective. Marching along a secondary road running close to the north bank of the Rhine, Frost's men were to capture the main highway bridge. En route they were to take the railway and pontoon bridges west of the great highway crossing. The 3rd Battalion, under Lt. Col. J. A. C. Fitch, would move along the Utrecht-Arnhem Road and approach the bridge from the north, reinforcing Frost. Once these two battalions had been successfully launched, Lt. Col. D. Dobie's 1st Battalion was to advance along the main Ada-Arnhem Highway, the most northerly route, and occupy the high ground north of the city. Lathbury had given each route a code name. Dobie's farthest north was designated Leopard. Fitch's in the middle was Tiger, and Frost's, the most crucial route, was Lion. Speeding ahead of the entire brigade, the jeeps of Major Freddy Goff's reconnaissance squadron were expected to reach the bridge, seize it in a coup de main, and hold until Frost arrived. So far, Urquhart thought, the initial phase was going well. He was not unduly alarmed by the breakdown of communications within the division at this time. He had experienced temporary signals disruption often in the North African desert campaigns. Since he could not raise Brigadier Hicks's first air landing brigade, whose job it was to hold the landing and drop zones for the airlifts on the following two days, Urquhart drove to Hicks's headquarters. The air landing brigade, he learned, was in position, and Hicks was for the moment away directing the disposition of his battalions. However, at Hicks's headquarters, Urquhart received news that one vital part of the plan to take the Arnhem Bridge had gone wrong. He was told, erroneously, that most of Major Freddy Goff's reconnaissance vehicles had been lost in glider crashes. No one at Hicks's headquarters knew where Goff had gone. Without waiting for Hicks to return, Urquhart drove back to his own headquarters. He had to find Goff quickly and devise some alternative plan, but his greatest concern now was to warn Lathbury, and in particular Frost, that the 2nd Battalion was on its own. 
Frost would have to take the main Arnhem Bridge without the aid of Goff's planned surprise attack. At Division, further bad news awaited Urquhart. Not only was there no word of Goff, Urquhart recalls, but apart from some short-range radio signals, headquarters communications had completely failed. The 1st Parachute Brigade, and indeed the outside world, could not be contacted. Colonel Charles Mackenzie, Urquhart's chief of staff, watched the general pace up and down, restive and anxious for news. Urquhart ordered his signals officer, Major Anthony Dean Drummond, to investigate the communications foul-up, see what had happened to the radio equipment, and then set it right. Messengers were also sent out in search of Goff. As time passed without any new information, the worried Urquhart decided to wait no longer. Normally he would have directed the battle from division headquarters, but now, as each moment passed without communications, he was beginning to feel that this battle was anything but normal. Turning to Mackenzie, he said, I think I'll go and have a look myself, Charles. Mackenzie did not try to stop him. At the time, Mackenzie recalls, since we were getting practically no information, it didn't seem a particularly bad thing to do. Taking only his driver and a signalman in his jeep, Urquhart set out after Lathbury. The time was 4.30 p.m. Moving along the northern Leopard route, the Ada Arnhem Road, Major Freddy Goff of the 1st Air Landing Reconnaissance Unit was making good time. Although the vehicles of A Troop had failed to arrive, Goff had started off from the landing zone with the rest of the squadrons at 3.30 p.m., he was confident that he had sufficient jeeps for the coup de main attempt on the bridge. In fact, he remembered, I left several jeeps behind on the landing zone in reserve. We had more than enough to get to Arnhem. Goff had even detached twelve men from his unit to make their way south to join the 2nd Battalion, moving on the Lion route to the bridge. He was unaware that the loss of A Troop's jeeps had raised a flurry of rumors and misinformation. Some accounts of the Arnhem battle claim that Goff's unit could not operate because so many of his vehicles failed to arrive by glider. The failure, if it can be called that, Goff says, was not due to a lack of jeeps, but to the fact that no one had warned us that the 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions were in the area. From the beginning, Goff had had reservations about his RECO unit's role in the Arnhem plan. Instead of a coup de main, Goff had urged that a screen of reconnaissance jeeps be sent ahead of each of the three battalions. In that way, he says, we would have quickly discovered the best and easiest way to reach the bridge. Failing that, he had asked that a troop of light tanks be brought in by glider to escort the coup de main force. Both requests had been turned down. Yet Goff had remained optimistic. I wasn't the least bit concerned. There was supposed to be only a few old grey Germans in Arnhem and some ancient tanks and guns. I expected it to be a pushover. Now, as they moved swiftly along Leopard, the lead jeeps of the unit were suddenly ambushed by German armoured cars and 20mm guns. Goff's second-in-command, Captain David Alsop, happened to note the time. It was exactly 4 p.m. Goff pulled out to drive to the head of the column and investigate. Just as I was on the point of going forward, I got a message saying that Urquhart wanted to see me immediately. I didn't know what the hell to do, Goff says. I was under Lathbury, and I thought I should at least tell him I was going, but I had no idea where he was. The unit was now in a heavy firefight and pinned down in defensive positions near the railroad tracks on the outskirts of Wolfhazer. I reckoned they would be all right for a time, so I turned around and headed back to division headquarters on the landing zone. That was at 4.30. At the precise moment that General Urquhart set out to find Lathbury, Goff was speeding back to division to report to Urquhart. All along the three strategic lines of march, the men of the 1st Parachute Brigade were encountering jubilant, hysterical throngs of Dutch. Many civilians from farms and outlying hamlets had followed the paratroopers from the time they left the landing zones, and as the crowds grew, the welcome seemed almost to overwhelm the march itself. Captain Eric Mackay, travelling the southernmost Lion route with Colonel Frost's 2nd Battalion, was disturbed by the holiday atmosphere. We were hampered by Dutch civilians, he says, waving, cheering, and clapping their hands. They offered us apples, pears, something to drink, but they interfered with our progress and filled me with dread that they would give our positions away. 
Lieutenant Robin Vlasto remembers that the first part of our march was in the nature of a victory parade, and the civilians were quite delirious with joy. It all seemed so unbelievable that we almost expected to see Horrocks's thirty corps tanks coming out of Arnhem to meet us. People lined the road, and great trays of beer, milk, and fruit were offered. We had the greatest difficulty forcing the men to keep alive to the possibility of a German attack. Young Anya van Manen, whose father was a doctor in Osterbeek, recalls receiving an exuberant call from the Tromp family in Hailsham, just south of the British landing zone on Renkham Heath. We are free, free, the Tromps told her. The Tommies dropped behind our house and they are on their way to Osterbeek. They are so nice. We are smoking players and eating chocolate. Anya put the phone down, crazy with joy. We all jumped and danced around. This is it, an invasion, lovely. Seventeen-year-old Anya could hardly wait for her father to come home. Dr. Van Manen was delivering a baby at a patient's home, and Anya thought it very annoying, particularly now, because the husband of the woman was a Dutch Nazi. Mrs. Ida Klaus, the wife of an Osterbeek dentist and a friend of the Van Manens, also heard that the airborne troops were on their way. She worked feverishly hunting through boxes and sewing scraps to find every bit of orange cloth she possessed. When the British got to Osterbeek, she intended to rush outside with her three small children and greet the deliverers with small handmade orange flags. Jan Voskeil, hiding out in the home of his wife's parents in Osterbeek, was torn between his own desire to head up the Utrecht road to greet the paratroopers and the need to prevent his father-in-law from coming with him. The elder man was adamant, I'm seventy-eight years old and I've never been in a war before and I want to see it. Voskeil's father-in-law was finally persuaded to stay in the garden, and Voskeil, joining streams of other civilians heading out to meet the British, was turned back by a policeman on the outskirts of Osterbeek. It's too dangerous, the officer told the crowds. Go back. Voskeil walked slowly home. There he ran into the same German soldier who had asked for shelter when the bombing had begun during the morning. Now the soldier was in full uniform with camouflage jacket, helmet, and rifle. He offered Voskile some chocolates and cigarettes. I am going away now, he said. The Tommies will come. Voskile smiled. Now you will go back to Germany, he said. The soldier studied Voskile for several seconds. Then he shook his head slowly. No, sir, he told Voskile. We will fight. The Dutchman watched the German walk away. It begins now, Voskile thought. But what can I do? Impatiently he paced the yard. There was nothing to do but wait. Unhampered by police restraints or warnings to stay indoors, Dutch farmers and their families lined each route of march in throngs. Sergeant Major Harry Callahan on the middle Tiger route remembers a farm woman breaking through the crowds and running toward him with a pitcher of milk. He thanked her, and the woman smiled and said, "'Good, Tommy, good!' But like Eric Mackay on the lower road, Callahan, a Dunkirk veteran, was bothered by the number of civilians surrounding the troops. They ran along beside us wearing armbands, aprons, and little pieces of ribbon, all orange, he remembers. Children with little snippets of orange cloth pinned to their skirts or blouses skipped along, shrieking with delight. Most of the men were reaching in their packs to hand them chocolate. It was such a different atmosphere that the men were behaving as if they were on an exercise. I began to be concerned about snipers. As Callahan had feared, the victory parade came to a sudden halt. It all happened so quickly, he says. One moment we were marching steadily toward Arnhem, the next we were scattered in the ditches. Snipers had opened fire, and three dead airborne soldiers lay across the road. The veteran sergeant major wasted no time. He had spotted a burst of flame from trees about fifty yards ahead. As the Dutch scattered, Callahan took a party of twelve men forward. He stopped short of one tree and looked up. Something flashed. Raising his Sten gun, he fired directly into the tree. A Schmeisser automatic pistol clattered to the ground, and as Callahan sighted up along the trunk of the tree, he saw a German dangling limply from a rope. Now, too, on the middle route, other men from Lieutenant Colonel Fitch's 3rd Battalion were suddenly engaged in an unexpected encounter. Private Frederick Bennett had just passed around some apples to other troopers when a German staff car came speeding down the road. Bennett opened up with his Sten gun. The car screeched to a stop and tried to back up, but it was too late. 
Everyone near Bennett began firing, and the car came to an abrupt halt riddled with bullets. As the troopers cautiously approached, they saw that the driver was hanging halfway out of the car. The body of a senior German officer had been thrown partly out another door. To Bennett, he looked like some high-ranking Jerry officer, and indeed he was. Major General Kusin, the Arnhem Town Commander, had disregarded the warning of SS Major Zepp Kraft to avoid the main Utrecht Arnhem Road. Kusin, on Modal's orders issued as the Field Marshal fled east that morning, had informed Hitler's headquarters of the landings and of Modal's narrow escape. The Allied assault had caused Hitler hysterical concern. If such a mess happens here, he conjectured, here I sit with my own supreme command, Goering, Himmler, Ribbentrop. Well, then, this is a most worthwhile catch. That's obvious. I would not hesitate to risk two parachute divisions here if with one blow I could get my hands on the whole German command. Many men recall that the first serious German opposition began after the first hour of March, around 4.30 p.m., then two of the three battalions, Dobies on the northern route and Fitches in the centre, were unexpectedly engaged in fierce enemy hit-and-run attacks. Major Goff's reconnaissance unit, now commanded by Captain Alsop, was desperately trying to find a way to outflank the German forces and clear a path for Dobies' first battalion, but according to Alsop, each movement we made was blunted by an enemy force in front of us. Trooper William Chandler of the reconnaissance unit remembers that as his sea troop explored the terrain, German bullets came so close and so thick that they almost stung as they went by. As the battalion approached Wolfhäser, it was almost completely stopped. We halted, Private Walter Baldock recalls. Then we started off again. Then we halted and dug in. Next we moved on again, changing direction. Our progress was dictated by the success of the lead companies. Mortar bombs and bullets harassed us all the way. Beside a hedge, Baldock saw a sergeant he knew lying seriously wounded. Farther ahead, he came upon the smouldering body of a lieutenant. He had been hit by a phosphorus bomb. To another soldier, Private Roy Edwards, it just seemed we kept making a detour of the countryside and getting into running battles all afternoon. The paratroopers were stunned by the ferociousness of the unanticipated enemy attacks. Private Andrew Milbourne on the northern route heard firing in the distance off to the south and was momentarily glad that the 1st Battalion had been given the assignment to hold the high ground north of Arnhem. Then, nearing Wolfhäser, Milbourne realized that the column had swung south off the main road. He saw the railway station and close to it a tank. His first reaction was one of elation. My God, he thought, Monty was right, the second arm is here already. Then, as the turret swung slowly around, Milbourne saw that a black cross was painted on the tank. Suddenly he seemed to see Germans everywhere. He dived into a ditch, and raising his head cautiously, began looking for a good spot to position his vicar's machine gun. Sergeant Reginald Isherwood saw the same tank. A jeep towing a light artillery piece drove up and started to turn around in order to engage it. One of their sergeants yelled, We'd better fire before they do, otherwise we've had it, Isherwood recalls. The gun was swung around like lightning, but as our man yelled fire, I heard the German commander do the same. The Jerrys must have got their shell off one-tenth of a second sooner than us. The tank scored a direct hit, the jeep exploded, and the gun crew were killed. In the mounting confusion and the intense fire from all sides, it was now clear to Colonel Doby that the opposition in front of him was heavier than anyone had expected, nor did he believe it was still possible to occupy the high ground north of Arnhem. He was unable to raise Brigadier Lathbury by radio, and his casualties were mounting by the minute. Doby decided to sideslip the battalion still farther south and attempt to join up with Frost going for the main Arnhem Bridge. The breakdown of communications and subsequent lack of direction was making it impossible for battalion commanders to know with any clarity what was happening now. In the unfamiliar countryside, with maps that often proved highly inaccurate, companies and platoons were frequently out of touch with one another. At a crossroads near the stretch of highway where men of Colonel Fitch's 3rd Battalion had killed General Kusin, the British caught the full brunt of SS Major Craft's rocket-propelled mortars and machine guns. The marching columns broke as men scattered into the woods. The screeching mortars exploding in air bursts above their heads hurled deadly fragments in every direction. 
Signalman Stanley Hayes remembers the intense enemy harassment vividly. He sprinted for some woods and dropped a spare radio transmitter. Bending to recover it, he was struck in the ankle. Hayes managed to crawl into the woods. As he sank down in the underbrush, he realized that the man alongside him was German. He was young and as frightened as I was, Hayes said, but he used my field dressing on my ankle. A short time later we both were wounded again by the mortar fire, and we just lay there waiting for someone to pick us up. Hayes and the young German would remain together until well after dark, when British stretcher-bearers found and evacuated them. Like the first battalion, the third, too, was pinned down. After two hours on the road, both battalions had covered a bare two and a half miles. Now Colonel Fitch reached the same conclusion as Dobie on the upper road. He, too, would have to find an alternate route to the Arnhem Bridge. Time was precious, and the bridge was still a good four miles away. In the woods around Wolfhazer, SS Major Tsepp Kraft was convinced he was surrounded. He estimated that the British outnumbered his understrength battalion by twenty to one. But although he considered his defense insane, he could hardly believe the success of his blocking action. The rocket-propelled mortars had created havoc among the British, and his men now reported that paratroopers moving along the Utrecht Arnhem Road were halted in some places, and at others appeared to be abandoning the main road entirely. Kraft still believed that his was the only German unit in the area, and he had no illusions about stopping the British for long. He was running out of mortar ammunition and suffering heavy casualties, and one of his lieutenants had deserted. Still, Kraft was ebullient about the courageous impetuosity of my young lads. The ambitious Kraft, who would later write a fulsome, self-serving report to Himmler on his grenadier training and reserve battalion's actions, had no idea that his young lads were now being bolstered by the tanks, artillery, and armored cars of Lieutenant Colonel Walter Hartz's Hohenstaufen Division, only a mile or two east of Kraft's own headquarters. Major Freddy Goff was totally baffled. Urquhart's message summoning him back to division had carried no hint of what the general had in mind. When he left the leopard route of the 1st Battalion, Goff brought back with him four escort jeeps and troops of his reconnaissance unit. Now at division headquarters, Urquhart's chief of staff, Colonel Charles Mackenzie, could not enlighten him either. The general, Mackenzie said, had gone off in search of Brigadier Lathbury, whose headquarters was following Colonel Frost's battalion along the Southern Lion route. Taking his escort, Goff set out once more. Surely someplace along the route he would find either one officer or the other. 12. General Urquhart's jeep sped down the Utrecht Arnhem Highway and turned south off the main artery onto a side road that led him to Frost's Lion Route. Within a few minutes he caught up with the rear elements of the 2nd Battalion. They were moving single file along both sides of the road. Urquhart could hear firing in the distance, but it seemed to him there was a lack of urgency. Everyone appeared to be moving slowly. Driving swiftly along the cobbled road, Urquhart reached Frost's headquarters company only to discover that Frost was up with the leading units which had run into German opposition. I tried to impart a sense of urgency that I hoped would be conveyed to Frost, Urquhart writes, and told them about the ill fortune of the Reco squadron. Learning that Lathbury had gone up to the middle road to see how the 3rd Battalion was doing, Urquhart retraced his route. Once again, he and Goff would miss each other by minutes. Reaching the rear elements of the 3rd Battalion on the Tiger route, the general was told that Lathbury had gone forward. He followed. At a crossroads on the Utrecht Arnhem Road, Urquhart found the brigadier. The area was under devastating mortar fire. Some of these bombs were falling with unsettling accuracy on the crossroads, and in the woodland where many of the 3rd Battalion were under cover, Urquhart was later to write. This was the first real evidence to come my way of the speed and determination of the German reaction. Taking cover in a slit trench, Urquhart and Lathbury discussed the situation. Both officers were worried about the slow progress of the brigade, and now the critical lack of communications was paralyzing their own efforts to command. Lathbury was completely out of touch with the 1st Battalion, and had only intermittent communication with Frost. It was apparent that both were able to direct operations only in the area where they physically happened to be. 
For the moment, Lathbury's concern was to get the 3rd Battalion off the crossroads, out of the surrounding woods, and on the move again. Urquhart decided to try to contact Division Headquarters on his Jeep's radio. As he neared the vehicle, he saw it had been struck by a mortar, and his signalman was badly wounded. Although the radio set seemed undamaged, Urquhart could not raise Division. I cursed the appalling communications, Urquhart later wrote. Lathbury dissuaded me from attempting to go back to my own headquarters. The enemy was now thick between us and the landing zones. I decided he was right, and I stayed. But it was at this point that I realized I was losing control of the situation. The men of the 1st and 3rd Battalions were engaging in constant bitter skirmishes. Hardened and desperate Waffen-SS troopers, inferior in numbers but bolstered by half-tracks, artillery, and tanks, were reducing the British advance on the two upper roads to a crawl. In the confusion, men were separated from their officers and from one another as companies scattered into the woods, or fought along side roads and in the back gardens of houses. The Red Devils had recovered from the initial surprise of the German armoured strength, and though taking heavy casualties, individually and in small groups, they were striking back tenaciously. Still, there was little chance that the 1st and 3rd Battalions could reach their Arnhem objectives as planned. Now everything depended upon Colonel John Frost's 2nd Battalion moving steadily along the Lower Rhine Road, the secondary route that the Germans had largely dismissed. Although Frost's battalion had been held up briefly several times by enemy fire, he had refused to allow his men to scatter or deploy. His spearheading A Company, commanded by Major Digby Tatham Water, pressed forward, leaving stragglers to join the companies coming up behind. From prisoners taken by the advance parties, Frost learned that an SS company was believed to be covering the western approaches of Arnhem. Using some captured transport as well as their own jeeps to scout ahead and to the sides, the battalion moved steadily on. A little after 6 p.m., the first of Frost's objectives, the railway bridge over the Lower Rhine slightly southeast of Osterbeek, came into view. According to plan, Major Victor Dover's C Company peeled off and headed for the river. The bridge looked empty and undefended as they approached. Lieutenant Peter Barry, 21, was ordered to take his platoon across. It was quiet when we started out, Barry recalls. As we ran across the fields, I noticed that there were dead cattle everywhere. Barry's platoon was within three hundred yards of the bridge when he saw a German run onto the bridge from the other side. He reached the middle, knelt down, and started doing something. Immediately I told one section to open fire and a second section to rush the bridge. By this time the German had disappeared. Barry recalls that they got onto the bridge and began racing across at full speed. Suddenly there was a tremendous explosion and the bridge went up in our faces. Captain Eric Mackay of the Royal Engineers felt the ground shake under the impact. A yellow-orange flame punched up and then black smoke rose over the bridge. I think the second span from the south bank was blown, Mackay says. On the bridge, under cover of smoke bombs, Lieutenant Barry ordered his men off the wreckage and back to the northern bank. As the platoon began to move, Germans hidden across the river opened fire. Barry was hit in the leg and arm, and two other men were wounded. Watching the troopers return through the smoke and fire, Mackay, who had been uneasy about the operation from the beginning, remembers thinking, Well, there goes number one. Colonel Frost was more philosophical. I knew one of the three bridges was gone, but it was the least important. I didn't realize then what a disadvantage it would be. It was now 6.30 p.m., and there were two more bridges to go. 13. It had taken the Hohenstaufen Division engineers five hours to reassemble all the tanks, half-tracks, and armored personnel carriers that Harzer had planned to send back to Germany. Newly decorated Captain Paul Gravener, his 40-vehicle reconnaissance battalion ready, now set out from Hundelow Barracks north of Arnhem and drove quickly south. Harzer had instructed him to make a sweep of the area between Arnhem and Nijmegen to assess the strength of the Allied airborne troops in that area. Gravener raced swiftly through Arnhem and by radio informed Hohenstaufen headquarters that the city seemed almost deserted. There was no sign of enemy troops. A little before 7 p.m., Grabner's unit crossed over the Great Arnhem Highway Bridge. A mile past the southern end, Grabner stopped his car to report, 
No enemy, no paratroopers. Mile after mile, his light-armored cars slowly patrolling both sides of the highway, Gravener's radio messages conveyed the same information. At Nijmegen itself, the news was unchanged. On orders of Hohenstaufen headquarters, Gravener was then instructed to further patrol the outskirts of Nijmegen and then return to headquarters. Gravener's unit and the forward elements of Frost's 2nd Battalion had missed each other by approximately an hour. Even as Gravener had driven out of Arnhem, Frost's men were in the city itself and were stealthily approaching their remaining objectives. Inexplicably, despite General Bittrich's explicit instructions, Hartzer had completely failed to safeguard the Arnhem Bridge. 14. It was growing dark as Colonel Frost quickened the battalion's pace toward the next objective, the pontoon crossing less than a mile west of the Arnhem Bridge. Major Digby Tatham Waters' A Company, still in the lead, was again momentarily held up on the high ground at the western outskirts of Arnhem. Enemy armored cars and machine guns had forced the company off the road and into the back gardens of nearby houses. Coming up behind, Frost found ten Germans guarded by a lone A Company man, and as he was later to write, surmised that Digby's back garden maneuver had been completely successful and that the company had rushed on again. Frost returned to the battalion. In the dusk, bursts of fire sporadically swept the road, but as the men moved along, they passed damaged vehicles and a number of dead and wounded Germans, clear evidence, Frost thought, of Digby's quite satisfactory progress. Moving rapidly through the streets of Arnhem, the battalion reached the pontoon bridge and halted, faced with their second setback. The center section of the bridge had been removed, and it was useless. As Captain Mackay stood looking at the dismantled crossing, he decided that it was typical of the whole cocked-up operation. My one thought was, now we've got to get that other bloody bridge. He stared off in the distance. Barely a mile away, the great concrete and steel span was silhouetted against the last light. On the 3rd Battalion's Tiger route, moving haltingly toward Arnhem, General Urquhart knew with certainty that he was stranded. In the growing darkness, with enemy forays constantly harassing the march, there was no possibility of his returning to division headquarters. His mood was bleak. I wished with every step that I knew what was going on elsewhere. Just before nightfall, Urquhart learned that the third's leading companies had reached the outskirts of Osterbeek, near some place called the Hartenstein Hotel. We were making little progress. Urquhart was later to write, and Lathbury, after a discussion with Fitch, the battalion commander, called a halt. In a large house set well back from the road, Urquhart and Lathbury prepared to spend the night. The owner of the house, a tall, middle-aged Dutchman, brushed aside the general's apologies for inconveniencing him and his wife, and gave the two officers a downstairs front room overlooking the main road. Urquhart was restless and unable to relax. I kept checking to see if any contact had been made with either Goff or Frost, but there was nothing from my headquarters or from anyone else. The Great Bridge loomed ahead. The concrete ramps alone were immense complexes unto themselves, with roads running beneath them and along the river bank from west to east. On either side the rooftops of houses and factory buildings came up to the level of the ramps. In the twilight, the massive approaches and the high-arched girders spanning the Rhine looked awesome and intimidating. Here, finally, was the main objective, the pivot of Montgomery's audacious plan, and to reach it, Frost's men had fought on the march for nearly seven hours. Now, as lead elements of the 2nd Battalion neared the bridge, Lieutenant Robin Vlasto, in command of one of A Company's platoons, was amazed by its incredible great height. Vlasto noted pillboxes at each end, and even in the general air of desertion they looked threatening. In darkness, A Company quietly took up positions beneath the huge supports at the northern end. From above them came the slow rumble of traffic. Captain Eric Mackay of the Royal Engineers, approaching the bridge through a mosaic of streets, reached a small square leading to the ramp. He remembers that the quietness as we went through the streets was oppressive, and all around us there seemed to be soft movement. Men were beginning to feel the strain, and I wanted to get that bridge as quickly as we could. 
Suddenly the darkness was ripped by German fire from a side street. One of the engineers' explosives trolleys went up in flames and the men were clearly illuminated. Instantly Mackay ordered his men with their equipment across the square. They dashed over, defying the German fire. Within a few minutes, without losing a man, they were at the bridge. Studying the terrain below the northern ramp, Mackay saw four houses on the east side. One of them was a school, and it was on the corner of a crossroads, he remembers. I thought that whoever held these houses held the bridge. Mackay promptly ordered his engineers into the school. Shortly after 8 p.m., Colonel Frost and the battalion headquarters arrived. Frost had sent Major Douglas Crawley's B Company to the high ground above the nearby railway embankment with anti-tank guns to protect the battalion's left flank, freeing A Company to dash for the bridge. Frost recalls that a map I had taken from a German prisoner showed the routes of an enemy armoured car patrol unit, and I realised that the German strength was to my left. C Company under Major Dover was instructed to follow the forward elements into the city and seize the German commandant's headquarters. Now at the bridge, Frost was unable to raise either company by radio. Quickly he dispatched messengers to determine their whereabouts. Deciding not to wait, Frost ordered A Company platoons onto the bridge. As the men began to move across, the Germans came to life. Troopers were raked with fire from the pillbox at the northern end and by a lone armoured car on the southern end of the bridge itself. A platoon aided by Eric Mackay's sappers carrying flamethrowers began to move through the top floors of houses whose roofs and attics were at eye level with the ramp. Simultaneously, Lieutenant Vlasto's platoon worked its way through basements and cellars, going from house to house until it reached Mackay's locations. In position, they attacked the pillbox. As the flamethrowers went into action, Frost recalls that all hell seemed to be let loose. The sky lit up and there was the noise of machine gun fire, a succession of explosions, the crackling of burning ammunition and the thump of a cannon. A wooden building nearby was wreathed in flames and there were screams of agony and fear. Several accounts state that the flamethrower's aim was diverted, and instead of hitting the pillbox, the fiery liquid hit several huts containing explosives. Now, too, Frost could hear the crash of Vlasto's Piat bombs smashing into the pillbox. Suddenly the brief, savage battle was over. The guns in the pillbox fell silent, and through the fires Frost saw German soldiers staggering toward his men. A Company had successfully cleared the north end of the bridge, and it was theirs. But now, hampering fires and exploding ammunition made it suicidal to risk a second rush to grab the southern side. Only half an hour earlier, Frost could have succeeded. But now, on the south bank, a group of SS Panzer Grenadiers had taken up positions. According to Dutch Police Sergeant Johannes van Kijk, the bridge was deserted and without guards when he came on duty at 7.30 that evening. Earlier, according to Van Kijk, when the airborne landings began, the bridge garrison of 25 World War I veterans deserted their post. Frost attempted to contact Major Crawley once more. He wanted to locate boats or barges in which Crawley's company could cross the river and attack the Germans on the southern side. Again, radio communications were out. Worse, messengers could not even find the company, and they reported there were no boats to be seen. As for C Company, the patrols sent out to contact them were pinned down and heavily engaged near the German commandant's headquarters. Grimly, Frost's men looked across the Arnhem Bridge. How strong were the Germans holding the southern end? Even now, A Company believed there was a chance of seizing the southern end by a surprise attack across the river if only the men and boats could be found. But that opportunity had passed. In one of the great ironies of the Arnhem battle, the Lower Rhine could have been crossed within the first hour of landing, exactly seven miles west at the village of Heveadorp, through which Frost's battalion had marched en route to their objectives. A large cable ferry, capable of carrying automobiles and passengers, had operated back and forth all day on its normal passage across the Lower Rhine, between Heveadorp on the north bank and Driel on the south. Frost knew nothing about the ferry, nor was it ever listed as one of Urquhart's objectives. In the meticulous planning of Market Garden, an important key to the taking of the Arnhem Bridge, the ferry at Driel, had been totally overlooked. 
In the official orders issued to Urquhart, no reference to the Driel Ferry as an objective seems to exist. RAF reconnaissance photographs used at briefings show it clearly, and one must assume that at some stage of the planning it was discussed. However, General Urquhart, when I interviewed him on the subject, told me, I can't recall that the ferry ever came up. When Urquhart finally learned of the ferry's existence, it was too late to be of any use. Says Urquhart, by that time I did not have enough men to put across the river. In oral orders, however, the engineers were warned that the seizure of all ferries, barges, and tugs becomes of paramount importance to assist the subsequent advance of thirty corps. Obviously, however, in the last-minute stages of the planning, these orders apparently carried lower priority, for they were never formally issued. No one told us about the ferry at Driel, Colonel Frost told the author, and it could have made all the difference. Major Freddie Goff had finally overtaken Lathbury's brigade headquarters, following Frost's battalion on the Lion route. Quickly he sought out Major Tony Hibbert, the second in command. "'Where's the general and the brigadier?' Goff asked. Hibbert didn't know. "'They're together someplace,' he told Goff, "'but they've both gone off.' Goff was now totally confused. "'I didn't know what to do,' he recalls. "'I tried to contact Division without success, "'so I just decided to keep on going after Frost.' Leaving Hibbert, Goff set out once more. It was dark when Goff and his troopers drove into Arnhem and found Frost and his men holding positions near the northern end of the bridge. Immediately Goff asked where Urquhart was. Like Hibbert, Frost had no idea. He assumed Urquhart was back with division. Once more Goff tried his radio. Now adding to his anxiety was the absence of any news of his own reconnaissance forces near Wolfhazer but again he could make no contact with anyone. Ordering his tired men to a building close by the bridge, Goff climbed to the roof just in time to see the whole southern end of the bridge go up in flames as Frost's men made their first attempt to seize the far end. I heard this tremendous explosion, and the whole end of the bridge seemed to be on fire. I remember somebody saying, We've come all this way just to have the damn bridge burned down. Goff himself was momentarily alarmed. Then, through the smoke, he saw that only the pillbox and some ammunition shacks were destroyed. Concerned and weary, Goff turned in for a few hours' rest. He had travelled route after route all day in search of Urquhart. Now at the bridge, at least one problem was solved. He was where he had set out to be, and there he would stay. There was little more that Lieutenant Colonel Frost could do this night, except to guard the northern end of the bridge from enemy attacks on the southern side. He still had no contact with his missing companies, and now, in a house on a corner overlooking the bridge, Frost set up battalion headquarters. Lance Corporal Harold Back of the 2nd Battalion's cipher section remembers that from the front window of the house, the headquarters personnel could look out on the ramp. The side window of the room gave us a direct view of the bridge itself, says Back. Our signalers stuck their antennas through the roof and moved their sets constantly, but they couldn't make contact with anybody. Shortly after, brigade headquarters arrived and set up in the attic of a house near Frost's. After conferring with his officers, Frost thought it was now obvious that the 1st and 3rd battalions had either been held up on the Tiger and Leopard routes, or were fighting north of the bridge somewhere in Arnhem. Without communications, it was impossible to tell what had happened. But if the two battalions did not reach Arnhem during the hours of darkness, the Germans would have the precious time necessary to close the area between Frost's men and the rest of the division. Additionally, Frost was worried that the Great Bridge might still be blown. In the opinion of the engineers, the heat from fires had already destroyed any fuses laid from the bridge to the town, and all visible cables had already been cut by sappers. Still no one knew exactly where other cables might be hidden, and as Frost recalls, the fires prevented even one man from being able to get onto the bridge to remove any charges that might still be there. But the northern end of the Arnhem Bridge was in Frost's hands, and he and his courageous men had no intention of giving it up. Although he worried about his missing companies and the rest of the division, he did not show his concern. Visiting various sections now billeted in several houses near the ramp, he found his men in great heart, as they had every reason to be. As Private James Sims recalls, We felt quite pleased with ourselves, with the Colonel making jokes and inquiring about our comfort. 
At battalion headquarters, Frost himself now settled down for the first time during the day. Sipping from a large mug of tea, he thought that all in all the situation was not too bad. We had come eight miles through close, difficult country to capture our objective within seven hours of landing in Holland, a very fine feat of arms indeed. Although restless, Frost, like his men, was optimistic. He now had a force numbering about five hundred men of various units, and he had every faith that his own missing companies would reach him at the bridge. In any case, he would only have to hold at most for another forty-eight hours, until the tanks of General Horrocks's thirty corps arrived. Fifteen From Berlin to the Western Front the German High Command was stunned by the sudden Allied attack. Only in Arnhem, where the British 1st Airborne Division had dropped almost on top of General Bittrich's two panzer divisions, was the reaction both fierce and quick. Elsewhere, baffled and confused commanders tried to determine whether the startling events of September 17th were indeed the opening phase of an invasion of the Reich. A ground attack by the British out of Belgium had been anticipated. All available reserves, including General von Zangen's 15th Army, so worn down that men had little else but the rifles they carried, had been thrown into defence positions to hold against that threat. Trenches had been dug and strategic positions built in an all-out effort to force the British to fight for every foot of ground. No one had foreseen that airborne forces would be used simultaneously with the British land advance. Were these airborne attacks the prelude to an invasion of Holland by sea, as Berlin feared? In the hours of darkness, while staff officers tried to analyze the situation, reports of additional airborne attacks further confused the picture. American paratroopers, their strength unknown and their units still unidentified, were in the Eindhoven-Nijmegen area, and the British 1st Airborne Division had clearly landed around Arnhem but now new messages told of paratroopers in the vicinity of Utrecht, and a totally bewildering report claimed that airborne forces had landed in Warsaw, Poland. The RAF did drop dummy paratroops over a wide area around Utrecht, diverting some German troops for days. No troops were dropped on Warsaw, and the report may have been garbled in transmission, or more simply may have been the result of unfounded rumour. At Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt's headquarters in Koblenz, the general reaction was one of astonishment. When we first informed von Rundstedt's headquarters of the airborne attack, Colonel Hans von Tempelhof, Modal's operations chief, told me, O.B. West seemed hardly perturbed. In fact, the reaction was almost callously normal. It quickly changed. The crusty aristocratic von Rundstedt was not so much surprised at the nature of the attack as by the man who he reasoned must be directing it. Montgomery. Initially, von Rundstedt doubted that these sudden and apparently combined land and air operations were the opening of Eisenhower's offensive to invade the Reich. The field marshal had long been certain that Patton and the American Third Army driving toward the Saar posed the real danger. To combat that threat, von Rundstedt had committed his best troops to repulse Patton's racing tanks. Now German's most renowned soldier was caught temporarily off balance. Never had he expected Eisenhower's main offensive to be led by Montgomery, whom he had always considered overly cautious, habit-ridden, and systematic. He was astounded by the boldness of Montgomery's move. The messages pouring in from Modal's headquarters carried a note of hysteria, attesting all the more to the surprise and gravity of the attack. We must reckon with more airborne landings being made at night. The enemy obviously believes his attack to be of major importance, and the British have achieved considerable initial success against Student and pushed forward to Valkensvard. The position here is particularly critical. The lack of fast, strong reserves is increasing our difficulties. The general situation of Army Group B, stretched as it is to the limits, is critical. We require, as fast as possible, panzers, artillery, heavy mobile anti-tank weapons, anti-aircraft units, and it is absolutely essential that we have fighters in the sky day and night. Modal ended with these words, The main concentration of the Allies is on the northern wing of our front. It was one of the few times von Rundstedt had ever respected the opinion of the officer he had caustically referred to as having the makings of a good sergeant-major. 
In that fragment of his message, Model had stripped away von Rundstedt's last doubts about who was responsible for the startling developments. The northern wing of Army Group B was Montgomery. During the night hours, it was impossible to estimate the strength of the Allied airborne forces in Holland, but von Rundstedt was convinced that further landings could be expected. It would now be necessary not only to plug gaps all along the German front, but to find reserves for Model's Army Group B at the same time. Once again, von Rundstedt was forced to gamble. Messages went out from his headquarters transferring units from their positions facing the Americans at Aachen. The moves were risky but essential. These units would have to travel north immediately, and their commitment in the line might take 48 hours at a minimum. Von Rundstedt issued further orders to defense areas along Germany's northwest frontier, calling for all available armor and anti-aircraft units to proceed to the quiet backwater of Holland, where, the field marshal was now convinced, imminent danger to the Third Reich lay. Even as he worked steadily on through the night to shore up his defenses, Germany's Iron Knight pondered the strangeness of the situation. He was still amazed that the officer in charge of this great Allied offensive was Montgomery. It was late evening when the staff car carrying General Wilhelm Bittrich from his headquarters at Dutigham arrived in the darkened streets of Arnhem. Bittrich was determined to see for himself what was happening. As he reconnoitred through the city, fires were still burning and debris littered the streets, the effect of the morning's bombing. Dead soldiers and smouldering vehicles in many areas attested, as Bittrich was later to say, to the turbulent fighting that had taken place. Yet he had no clear picture of what was happening. Returning to his own headquarters, Bittrich learned from reports received from two women telephone operators in the Arnhem Post headquarters, whom he was later to decorate with the Iron Cross, that the great highway bridge had been taken by British paratroopers. Bittrich was infuriated. His specific order to Hartzer to hold the bridge had not been carried out. Now it was crucial that the Nijmegen Bridge over the Vaal River be secured before the Americans in the south could seize it. Bittrich's only chance of success was to crush the Allied assault along the corridor and squeeze the British to a standstill in the Arnhem area. The paratroopers now on the north end of the Arnhem Bridge and the scattered battalions struggling to reach them must be totally destroyed. The top-secret market garden plan that had fallen into Colonel General Kurt Student's possession finally reached Field Marshal Model at his new headquarters. He had abandoned the gardener's cottage on the Duticum Castle grounds and moved about five miles southeast near the small village of Terborg. It had taken Student the best part of ten hours to locate the field marshal and transmit the document by radio. Arriving in three parts and now decoded, Market Garden lay revealed. Model and his staff studied it intently. Before them was Montgomery's entire plan— the names of the airborne divisions employed, the successive air and resupply lifts ranging over a three-day period, the exact location of the landing and drop zones, the crucial bridge objectives, even the flight routes of the aircraft involved. Model, as Hartzer was later to learn from the field marshal himself, called the plan fantastic. It was so fantastic that in these critical hours Model refused to believe it. The plans were too pat, too detailed for credibility. Model suggested to his staff that the very preciseness of the document argued against its authenticity. He stressed again his own firm conviction that the landings west of Arnhem were the spearhead of a large-scale airborne attack toward the Ruhr via Bockholt and Münster some forty miles east. Additional airborne landings should be expected, he warned, and once assembled would undoubtedly swerve north and then east. Model's reasoning was not without validity, as he told his staff, If we are to believe these plans, and are to assume that the Arnhem Bridge is the true objective, why were not troops dropped directly on the bridge? Here they arrive on vast open areas suitable for assembly, and moreover eight miles to the west. Model did not inform General Bittrich of the document. I never realized until after the war, says Bittrich, that the market garden plans had fallen into our hands. I have no idea why Modal did not tell me. In any case, the plans would simply have confirmed my own opinion that the important thing to do was prevent the link-up between the airborne troops and the British Second Army, and for that they certainly needed the bridges. 
O.B. West was not informed of the captured market garden plans either, nor is there any mention in Modell's reports to von Rundstedt of the documents. For some reason, Modell thought so little of the plans that he did not pass them on to higher headquarters. One officer under Bittrich's command did learn of the document. Lieutenant Colonel Hartzer seemed to be the only officer outside the field marshal's staff with whom Modell talked about the plan. Hartzer recalls that Modell was always prepared for the worst, so he did not discount it entirely. As he told me, he had no intention of being caught by the short hairs. Only time would tell the Germans whether the document was in fact genuine. Although the temperamental, erratic field marshal was not fully prepared to accept the evidence before him, most of his staff were impressed. With the market garden plan in their hands, Modell's headquarters alerted all anti-aircraft units already on the move of the drops that the plan said would take place a few hours later. One assumption at least was laid to rest. Lieutenant Gustav Zedelhauser, the General Headquarters Administrative Officer, recalls that on the basis of the captured documents, Modell was now of the opinion that he and his Osterbeek headquarters had not been the objective of the airborne assault after all. 16. At the precise time that Lieutenant Colonel John Frost secured the northern end of the Arnhem Bridge, a cautious approach to another prime objective eleven miles away was only just beginning. The five-span highway bridge over the Vaal River at Nijmegen in the 82nd Airborne Central Sector of the Corridor was the last crossing over which the tanks of General Horrocks's 30 Corps would pass on their drive to Arnhem. With spectacular success, Brigadier General James M. Gavin's 504th paratroopers had grabbed the crucial Hrava Bridge eight miles southwest of Nijmegen, and at about 7.30 p.m., units of the 504th and 505th Regiments secured a crossing over the Maasval Canal at the village of Hermann, less than five miles due east of Hrava. Gavin's hope of capturing all three canal crossings and a railroad bridge was in vain. The bridges were blown or severely damaged by the Germans before the 82nd could grab them. Yet within six hours of landing, Gavin's troopers had forged a route over which the British ground forces would travel. Additionally, patrols of the 505th Regiment, probing the area between the 82nd's drop zones near the Grusbeck Heights and the Reichswald, encountered only light resistance and by nightfall other troopers of the 508th Regiment had secured a three-and-a-half-mile stretch of woods along the Holland-German border north of the Hrusbeek drop zone and running to the southeast outskirts of Nijmegen. Now, with three of the 82nd's four key objectives in hand, everything depended upon the capture of the 1960-foot-long road bridge at Nijmegen. Although General Browning had directed Gavin not to go for the Nijmegen crossing until the high ground around Grusbeek was secured, Gavin was confident that all the 82nd's objectives could be taken on this first day. Evaluating the situation some 24 hours before the jump, Gavin had called in the 508th's commander, Colonel Roy E. Lindquist, and directed him to send one battalion racing for the bridge. In the surprise and confusion of the airborne landings, Gavin reasoned, the gamble was well worth taking. I cautioned Lindquist about the dangers of getting caught in the streets, Gavin remembers, and pointed out that the way to get the bridge was to approach from east of the city without going through built-up areas. Whether by misunderstanding or a desire to clean up his initial assignments, Lindquist's own recollection was that he was not to commit his troopers in an assault on the bridge until the regiment's other objectives had been achieved. To the 1st Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Shields Warren, Jr., Lindquist assigned the task of holding protective positions along the Grusbeck nijmegen Highway, about a mile and a quarter southeast of the city. Warren was to defend the area and link up with the regiment's remaining two battalions to the west and east. Only when these missions were accomplished, Warren recalled, was he to prepare to go into Nijmegen. Thus, instead of driving for the bridge from the flat farming areas to the east, Warren's battalion found itself squarely in the center of those very built-up areas Gavin had sought to avoid. It was nightfall before Warren achieved his other objectives. Now, with precious time lost, lead companies began to move slowly through the quiet, almost deserted streets of Nijmegen. The main objective was to reach the traffic circle leading to the southern approaches of the bridge. There was a diversionary target as well. 
the Dutch underground reported that the detonating mechanism for destroying the Great Crossing was situated in the main post office building. This vital information reached Warren's units only after they had begun moving toward the bridge. A platoon was hurriedly sent to the post office where, after subduing the German guards, engineers cut wires and blew up what they believed to be the detonating controls. Whether this apparatus was in fact actually hooked up to explosives on the bridge, no one would ever know for certain, but now at least electrical circuits and switchboards were destroyed. When the platoon attempted to withdraw to rejoin the main force, they found that the enemy had closed in behind them. They were cut off, and for the next three days would be forced to hold out in the post office until help arrived. Meanwhile, as the remainder of Warren's force approached a park that led toward the bridge, they came suddenly under intense machine gun and armoured car fire. Captain R. E. D. Besterbrocher, the Dutch officer assigned to the 82nd, remembers that Guns suddenly opened up on us, and I could see the flashes of fire from the muzzles. They seemed to be all around us. Before he could raise his carbine to fire, Besterbrocher was hit in the left hand and elbow, and the right index finger. Several days later, Besterbrocher was told by doctors that the finger must be amputated. I told them absolutely not, Besterbrocher says. It was my finger, and I was not going to have it amputated. Besides, it would have ruined my piano playing. He still has the finger. To Corporal James R. Blue, the eerie battle raging in the blacked-out streets was like a nightmare. Right away we were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Blue remembers. He was moving through the streets with Private First Class Ray Johnson, both armed with M1 rifles with fixed bayonets, when they came face to face with SS troops. As Johnson tried to get one of the Germans with his bayonet, Blue went after an officer with a trench knife. Our orders were not to fire. If we came to close combat, we were to use knives and bayonets. But, Blue recalls, that trench knife seemed mighty short, so I used my Tommy gun. That closed that chapter, but almost immediately a self-propelled gun began to fire in our direction, and we moved up to the park and tied in with other platoons. Private James Allardyce remembers hearing a call for medics up front, but... Bullets were whistling down the street, and there was so much confusion in the darkness that men did not know where others were. We set up a perimeter defense around a modern brick schoolhouse. Out front we heard German voices and the moaning and cries of the wounded. We couldn't make it to the bridge. Finally it came through to us that the Jerrys had stopped us. As indeed they had. Captain Paul Gravener's reconnaissance battalion, which had missed frost at the Arnhem Bridge, had arrived in Nijmegen well in advance of the late-starting Americans. By midnight on this first day of the mightiest airborne assault in history, British and American paratroops were on or fighting toward their major objectives. Through long hours of march and savage encounters with an unexpectedly strong and tenacious enemy, they had gained most of the objectives that the planners had expected them to take swiftly and with ease. From the gallant men of Colonel John Frost's 2nd Battalion clinging to the north end of the Arnhem Bridge, all along the corridor south to where Colonel Robert Sink's 101st Troopers struggled to repair the bridge at Son, the mood was one of fierce determination. They must hold open the highway along which the British Second Army tanks and infantry would drive. On this midnight, troopers did not doubt that relief was on the way, or that reinforcements and supplies scheduled to arrive on the 18th would further bolster their position. Despite heavy casualties, confusion and communication setbacks, the men of the Airborne Army were completely optimistic. All in all, it had not been a bad Sunday outing. 17. There was a red glow in the sky over Arnhem as the speeding car bringing Major General Heinz Harmel back from Berlin neared the city. Apprehensive and tired after the long trip, Harmel arrived at the Frunsberg Division headquarters in Ruhrlow, only to find that his command post was now situated in Velp, approximately three miles northeast of Arnhem. There he found his chief of staff, Lieutenant Colonel Parch, looking exhausted. Thank God you're back, Parch said. Quickly he briefed Harmel on the day's events and on the orders received from General Bittrich. I was dumbfounded, Harmel recalls. Everything seemed confused and uncertain. I was very tired, yet the gravity of the situation was such that I called Bittrich and told him I was coming to see him. 
Bittrick had not slept either. As Harmel was shown in, Bittrick began immediately to outline the situation. Angry and frustrated, he bent over his maps. British paratroopers have landed here, west of Arnhem, he told Harmel. We have no idea of their actual strength or intentions. Pointing to Nijmegen and Eindhoven, the corps commander said, American airborne forces have secured lodgments in these two areas. Simultaneously, Montgomery's forces have attacked north from the Mersesco Canal. My belief is that the object is to split our forces. In my opinion, the objectives are the bridges. Once these are secured, Montgomery can drive directly up to the center of Holland and from there into the Ruhr. Bittrich waved his hands. Modal disagrees. He still believes further airborne forces will be dropped north of the Rhine, east and west of Arnhem, and march toward the Ruhr. Hartzer's Hohenstaufen division, Bittrich went on to explain, had been ordered to mop up the British west and north of Arnhem. The armed forces commander in the Netherlands, General Christiansen, had been directed to send in his forces, a mixture of defense and training battalions, under command of Lieutenant General Hans von Tetau. Their mission was to aid the Hohenstaufen division on the flanks in an effort to overrun the British landing and drop zones. The Frunsberg division, Bittrich continued, was charged with all activities to the east of Arnhem and south to Nijmegen. Stabbing the map with his finger, Bittrich told Harmel, the Nijmegen bridge must be held at all costs. Additionally, the Arnhem bridge and the area all the way south to Nijmegen is your responsibility. Bittrich paused and paced the room. Your problems, he told Harmel, have been made more difficult. Hartzer failed to leave armored units at the north end of the Arnhem bridge. The British are now there. As he listened, Harmel realized with growing alarm that with the Arnhem Bridge in British hands, there was no way to get his armor quickly across the Rhine and down to Nijmegen, nor was there another bridge crossing over the river east of the Arnhem Bridge. His entire division would have to be taken over the Rhine at a ferry landing in the village of Panadon, some eight miles southeast of Arnhem. Bittrich, anticipating the problem, had already ordered the ferry operations to begin. It would be a slow, tedious, roundabout way of reaching Nijmegen, and to ferry the division's trucks, armor, and men would take all of Harmel's resources. As he left Bittrich's headquarters, Harmel asked his commander, Why not destroy the Nijmegen bridge before it's too late? Bittrich's tone was ironic. Modal has flatly refused to consider the idea. We may need it to counterattack. Harmel stared in amazement. With what? he asked. In the dark, Harmel set out once again, heading for Panadon. His units were already on the move toward the ferry crossing, and the roads were choked with troops and vehicles. In Panadon itself, Harmel saw the reason for the chaotic conditions he had witnessed on the road. Vehicles congested the streets in one gigantic traffic jam. At the river's edge, makeshift ferries composed of rubber rafts were slowly floating trucks across the river. From his chief of staff, Harmel learned that one battalion had reached the far shore and was already en route to Nijmegen. Some trucks and smaller vehicles were also across, but as yet heavier armored equipment had not even been loaded. In Parch's opinion, Harmel's Frunsberg units might not be in action in the Arnhem-Nijmegen area until September 24th if the slow, cumbersome ferrying could not be speeded up. Harmel knew there was only one solution to the problem. He would have to retake the Arnhem Bridge and open the highway route to Nijmegen. As the first day of Market Garden, September 17th, ended, all the German frustrations now focused on a single obstinate man— Colonel John Frost at the Arnhem Bridge.